Hey, what's up, everybody? All right, so I'm going to be stepping in as guest moderator tonight because as the 2022 debate challenge continues, Donnie just couldn't help himself. He's got to get back in the ring. So tonight we're going to be debating endogenous retroviruses, um, and I'm hoping that everybody here knows what those are. If you don't, uh, these ERVs are just DNA sequences uh, that are present in germlines of non-viral organisms. That's important. So they either resemble a virus or can come from a virus, and they're estimated to be anywhere around 8% of the genomes. The topic is going to have uh, big implications for the ongoing creation evolution debate. So uh, with that out of the way, the debate tonight is whether or not these DNA elements are enough to support theory of evolution, the idea that common descent is true. So he's going to have the, a little bit of bird proof tonight. He's going to take the positive. He's going to try to definitively show that there that is able to explain these ERVs to the same degree that common descent can. So in this case, Donnie's going to have to show that ERVs either do not support common descent at all or that there is another theory, namely creation, that can plausibly account the existence of these ERVs. So <clears throat> get ready. This is going to be a good date. So pretty clinical. These guys are no rookies. They said almost 100 debates. Snake's no stranger. I know a lot of you guys out there know them. So uh, uh, let's give the debaters some grace in the chat. We don't need to be attacking these men personally. There's no need for that as uh, the mob will be, you know, ridding the chat of any relevant babble. So as for the format, we're going to do 12-minute openings for both guys. Um, they're going to have eight minute rebuttals. They're going to do around a 30 minute discussion specific to ERV five minute closings and whatever time is left, we'll, we'll, we'll try to wrap it up around two hours, but, uh, whatever time is left, well, we'll save for Q and a. So with that, I hear Taylor's going to be going first. Is that right guys? All yeah, right. maybe we will, um, we can do, couple intros before the opening statements. If you want, Snake, you can kind of uh, give the audience a little rundown on who you are and your channel. Brandon, I, I think it might have improved, but you were kind of glitching there a little bit for about a minute. Uh, but it looks like it's it, it's improved. Or, or was that just on my end, Snake? Was it, was it uh, glitching for you a little bit too? Yeah, for a second, but it wasn't too bad. Okay. Okay. So... I think we're good. And yeah, Snake, if you wanted to give a, a brief intro, you know, who, who are you? A little bit about your channel, so on and so forth. Yeah, so uh, I uh, am a molecular cellular developmental biology student, and uh, my channel is Snake Was Right, and it's all it's basically about uh, various topics, but the central theme is kind of well, the name is derived from the uh, biblical serpent. But the theme shares uh, a common ancestry, if you will, uh, with that same story, and which is basically that uh, knowledge is worth the cost, or knowledge is always the best, uh, the best way forward. So, um, and knowledge of good and evil is a good thing, I think. So, um, and that kind of applies to a lot of things that I'm thinking about, uh, not just scientific, but uh, moral and political. And I do get, I do take um, inconvenient political stances uh, that don't necessarily align with the stereotype of an atheist. Uh, things like that and such. And um, yeah, but I have a strong background in science. So, and that's what we're going to tackle tonight. Okay, much appreciated there, uh, Taylor. Uh, for me, I'm Donnie, as, as everybody knows, or you may know me as Standing for Truth. Although I uh, started this ministry several years ago, we now have, have a team, uh, Team Standing for Truth. So uh, I'm excited for this. I believe this is uh, formal debate number 98 for myself. I know Snake has had a ton of debates as well. And I specifically like debating these types of topics. You know, the, the more challenging topics, I've had uh, plenty of debates on ERVs, chromosome 2 fusion, Neanderthal phylogenetics, you know, those, those types of topics that deal with uh, arguments from the evolutionist side. 
that they would say essentially preclude biblical ancestry or young earth creation. So I like tackling the tough topics and tonight is endogenous retroviruses. So I very much look forward to this. So that, that that's my intro and uh, I'll hand it over to Brandon and I guess we can kind of get into some openings. Excellent intro. So like I said, we'll start with 12 minute openings and uh, whenever you're ready, Taylor, I'll go ahead and start the clock for you. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, we had a brief explanation of ERVs. They are uh, identifiable by uh, certain gene viral genes that um, are part of them and they insert into the genome. That's how they reproduce. Sometimes they'll insert into the gametes or reproductive cells and thus everything in the surviving lineage of those reproductive cells will have these ERVs. So you can essentially trace who's related from that and um the basic idea is that we share so many retroviruses in uh the exact same locations of the exact same genes which are also in similar locations as uh chimpanzees and other apes um just one viral group, uh, HERVWs, I think, uh, have about 205 out of 211 similarities. Uh, and again, that's just one virus group. There are several of them. Um, and the basic idea is that since there are only so many places for these uh viruses to insert uh first of all the the likelihood that it's going to insert into a gamete is very unlikely in the first place uh and then you have to have the specific species of virus um and specific strain of that species and um inserting in the same location of the same genome in two separate animals uh humans and chimps um, even the, and we do have very similar uh, number of similarities with other apes and monkeys, and those same similarities uh, create nested hierarchies, which uh, look exactly like the same nested hierarchies that are um, produced by other genomic analyses and by anatomical analyses, and so this uh, uh, by on its own indicates. Um, a common ancestry. Um, but as I started off talking about the uh, the likelihoods of these things happening in two separate animals are inconceivably high. And, you know, it could be as high as 5.8 times 10 to the uh, 1,418th. Um, I'm sure that number will be disputed a little bit, but basically the lowest you can get it is still an astronomical number up to like uh, three times 10 to the, in the sixties, which is still, I don't know what that would be. That's like uh, somewhere between like quintillions and Google. Um, Google is like a number with a hundred zeros after it. Um, so it's just an incomprehensibly high number. And the only way that you could get around this uh indicating common ancestry is if god put them there except they are viral infections so this would be look really uh bad for the idea of intelligent design because god's updating the system with a really um inconvenient way to update the system um and a and for some reason He's updating both chimps and humans in the same way, in a really inconvenient way, in a very unlikely way, astronomically unlikely. Um, so there's there's really no way to get around the fact that these are inherited, and the the layout of the suite of viruses, viral uh, remnants, is exactly the same and could not happen unless it was inherited by a common ancestor. And so 
that's that's where we're at. So I will cede the rest of my time to discussion. All right, thanks for that intro, Taylor. Looks like you had about seven minutes to spare, so we can add that to the end. Uh, for now, we'll hand it over to Donnie for his intro. And whenever you're ready, Donnie, start on your uh, on your first word there. Go ahead. Okay, much appreciated. And let me just get my screen shared here. Brandon, I think there were some people in the chat just asking who they tag for questions. So that'll be uh, Brandon at, at Brandon for your questions. <clears throat> okay. So let me get my PowerPoint up here and let me know when. How's that look coming in, Brandon audio, everything looks epic. Okay. <laughs> yes. The epic showdown. Okay, let me get my timer going as well. I was writing things down like crazy there. And time flies by. Okay, so 12 minutes. All right, the epic showdown. Endogenous retroviruses, ancient viral infections, or created units of DNA function. This is my roughly debate number 97. And I look forward to this discussion. So what exactly are... Herbs or endogenous retroviruses. An herb is a stretch of DNA found in your DNA that, according to evolutionary theory, and as uh, Taylor pointed out in his opening statement, got there when one of your ancestors was infected by a retrovirus. What is a retrovirus? A retrovirus is a special type of virus that inserts its genetic material directly into a cell's DNA. Right here, what is an endogenous retrovirus? They are transmitted vertically, right, rather than horizontally through the germline and are thus inherited by a successive generation in a Mendelian manner. Reverse transcriptase. This is important right here to understand when it comes to this topic. Okay, because retroviruses, however, use a slower, stealthier approach. After entering the cell, the retrovirus uses an enzyme called reverse transcriptase to turn its RNA into DNA before making its way to the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, it inserts its DNA into the host's genome. Now, when these retroviral genes make their way into sperm and egg cells, they can become a permanent part of a species genome. Proponents of common descent, like Snake was right here, will frequently claim the existence of these ERV sequences are irrefutable evidence for common ancestry, since they can essentially act as a historical record of infection suffered by our past ancestors. And I've got notes here, Snake pointed out that essentially there is no way, no way around this for the creationist. Uh, essentially, they'll say herbs, the existence of, of these shared herb sequences across various taxa precludes separate ancestry. So uh, this is going to be a fun discussion. Now, these uh, small pieces of DNA found in the genome are recognized by various signatures. These signatures reflect similarities found in exogenous retroviruses. And because we share these herb sequences with the primates, as Taylor went over in his opening statement, we must have inherited, this is their only conclusion, these from a common ancestor in the distant past. Proponents of common descent essentially believe endogenous retroviruses are, uh, endogenous retroviruses are um, inherited, are, are the ancient remnant, here we go, ancient remnants of past viral infections that have integrated into the genomes of living organisms. And that's why in my uh, opening slide, the question is, are these really the ancient uh, remnants of past viral infections or are they created units of DNA function? They assert that these ERV sequences are clearly the remnants of viruses. They don't question it. To them, there is no debate. When we look to the properties of the ERV sequence, we can see that they are found in retroviruses. 
Evolutionists will also point to, and uh, Taylor mentioned this in, in his opening statement as well, they'll point to the nested hierarchy that these sequences fall into. And, and we'll definitely be discussing that uh, specific line of argumentation as well. And again, herbs that are shared across species are evidence for common ancestry to the evolutionists. Now, I do want to go over uh, kind of some of the details and, and some of the basics before I uh, continue into kind of the meat of this of this topic, as it, it is my goal for people to be able to follow tonight's debate and at the end of it all, see exactly why herbs are not really good evidence for common descent. And as a matter of fact, they are amazing evidence for biblical creation, as we are going to see. But more specifically, the design diversity model. Now, when a retrovirus becomes a permanent part of a species DNA, according to the evolutionists, it becomes an endogenous retrovirus. This is important to understand. Scientists call it endogenous because it is inside of us from birth. A retrovirus is not passed, passed on genetically or vertically is referred to as endogenous. If, if it's passed on vertically, it would be referred to as endogenous. But if it's passed on horizontally, we're looking at that which is exogenous, okay? And it is the retrovirus, as I pointed out, that is passed down genetically that we would refer to as endogenous. And that's what we're discussing here, here tonight because the organism will be born with this viral DNA. Now, the human genome contains thousands of herb sequences. As I touched on earlier, these stretches of DNA match sequences found in retroviruses. And to the evolutionists, this is why there is no question, as, as Taylor pointed out in, in his opening statement, that these are indeed the ancient remnants of uh, past viral infections that have been passed down essentially. And uh, the question is though, how do we know for sure genes with similar sequences to virus genes actually came from viruses? And again, to the evolutionists like uh, Taylor here, it's the important properties of the herbs themselves that tell us these DNA elements actually originated from retroviruses. Notice on this specific slide, the structure of herbs match modern retroviruses, for example, HIV. On both ends of the retroviral DNA will be two identical sequences known as LTRs or long terminal repeats. In between the LTRs, we find the GAG the pole, which codes for the reverse transcriptase we were talking about earlier, and the ENV or envelope protein, which codes for the envelope that makes up the body of the virus. These structures are common in herbs and retroviruses. Remember, again, it's important. Herbs are assumed by the evolutionists to be the ancient remnants of past viral infections. Evolutionists consider these to be genetic fossils that point us to common descent. Advocates of common ancestry would say that the chances, and Taylor uh, pointed this out in his opening statement, that the chances of two herbs being inserted at the exact same location in separate organisms are very small. They will argue that the chance of a human and a chimpanzee being infected in the exact same spot by the same specific type of virus is far less than one in 10 million. And to them, as Taylor put it, this is highly unlikely. The more shared herb sequences then that we find, the more unlikely it becomes that these were inserted what? Inserted independently. Okay, so in a nutshell, why do evolutionists believe herbs are a good line of evidence for common descent? One, the sharing of similar herbs at similar locations in different genomes, plus the nested hierarchical distribution of herbs themselves. Two, the properties of the herb itself. We covered that. And three, the examination of shared mutagenic discrepancies between the long terminal repeats of LTRs of shared herbs, essentially the structure itself, okay, uh, that also form a nested pattern of distribution across various organisms. So here's some important questions we have to answer. Why are there herb sequences shared between the genomes of organisms? And two, if viral-like sequences in the genomes are, of organisms are functional, which I am going to argue is the fact today, why do they bear similarity to viral genetic material? So as we know, the entire junk DNA uh, paradigm has been overturned essentially, which is um, 
confirming evidence for the design diversity hypothesis, which suggests that God would have uh, front loaded the original created kinds. This includes Adam and Eve with um, created diversity. OK, created nuclear heterozygosity, essentially, as well as functional DNA elements such as these Zerv sequences, pseudogenes, ALU sequences, so on and so forth. So as you can see here, pseudogenes necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the cell. Line signs, introns allow for alternative splicing. Herbs, herbs are what we're focusing on today. So uh, they function now in antiviral uh, function, tumor suppression, gene regulation. We are going to uh, get into all of that today. Now, the question is, why do Irv sequences resemble viral genetic material? And this is a common response from the evolutionist after we show them just how functional and essential these retroviral-like elements are. And we have an easy answer. Okay, one of the major functional roles of these viral-like elements, these Irv sequences, is that they have a purpose in the innate immune system. They play an antiviral role. There are important DNA elements that work greatly in the immune system of their host. The way they me mechanistically exert their antiviral effect has to do with their sequence similarities to viral material. Without the specific nature of these ERV sequences, they could not do the important job that they do. Thank God they resemble viruses. Thank God they have similar properties to exogenous retroviruses. Their functional roles depend on these similarities. This is not evidence that they are the ancient remnants of viral infections. No, the properties of an e of, of an ERV sequence is necessary in light of their essential roles in aiding in the immune system and fighting off viral infections. In my last two minutes here, I want to go over some of the, the, the more uh, amazing functions found in these types of sequences. It has recently been reported that herbs can act as DNA regulatory elements, as long non-coding RNAs, and as triggers in the innate immune system. Okay, and this isn't just creationists making this up. Notice this from the secular literature, herbs, H-E-R-V-S, human specific herbs, appear to play important roles in physiology, fetal development, and human evolution. Notice this, if the accidental, notice this, the, to the evolutionists, it's all an accident, right? Blind chance. Infection of a mammalian ancestor by an exogenous retrovirus had never occurred. The placenta and the mammals that produce it, including humans, would have never existed. Beneficial role of human endogenous retroviruses. They, uh, it has been suggested as mediators of normal biological processes such as cellular differentiation and regulation of gene expression. And in my last 40 seconds here, I mean, we could, we could go over uh, function after function. Here's, here's the one that I was specifically referring to earlier, how endogenous retroviruses protect us from viral infections. They not only regulate cellular immune activation, but may even directly target invading viral pathogens. And that's exactly why they look the way they do, because this is necessary in light of this one of many, many functional roles, which points us to the design diversity hypothesis. And I'll wrap it up there as I've got one second left, and we will touch on the, some more of that evidence a little bit later. Thanks so much. Excellent intros, gentlemen. I'm sure that's going to raise a lot of questions, uh, if not within the audience alone amongst you guys. So at this point, we can move on to the rebuttal stage. Uh, we're going to do eight minutes apiece for that whenever you're ready, Taylor. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we heard a lot about uh, how ERVs contain beneficial functions and therefore they had to have been designed. Um, but this is not exclusively expected by creationism. So one of the ways that, uh, for example, ERVs can help in cancer suppression is, well, one, it's kind of a double-edged sword because the, they actually can cause cancer. Um, some of them cause cancer and don't help at all. Some of them cause cancer and then help our immune system identify cancer because they're producing viral antibodies, which the body has, um, I mean, depending on the age of the uh, virus of origin, our bodies may have already been 
used to these viruses for thousands, even millions of years. So they're, the antibodies are easily identifiable by the immune system. And so I guess um, to kind of recap, uh, an ERV could interrupt certain uh, genes, which can lead to a higher susceptibility of cancer. But then those cancer cells that are expressing that uh, virus now look like virus-infected cells, and so our immune system can kill it. And so, of course, that can work out accidentally um, pretty easily. It's a it seems pretty obvious how that's kind of a self-canceling property of uh, a, a cancer-causing element that can also tag itself as uh, something other than human. So the immune system often doesn't understand that cancer cells uh, need to be killed uh, because they have the same proteins as all your other cells. So the immune system can't tell the difference. Um, and so if there's some foreign element that is causing the cancer, then it's more likely that your immune system is also going to recognize that foreign element. So it, it it's completely understandable. Um, it's not like a wild, co like convenient coincidence. It's just, it's very obvious that your body would recognize it as a foreign element. Um, so just the mere fact that it has a beneficial function does not really tell us anything about whether it was created or it was infected. Um, but the structure of it can tell us whether it was infected because it, uh, the ERVs contain elements that are completely unnecessary in, uh, from an intelligent design perspective to insert into the genome. So you wouldn't need uh, the pro gag and uh, and the EMV genes uh, because you you could just incorporate those genes into uh, the normal genome and put them in an exon and they would get uh, translated just as our normal proteins do um, and those could trigger viral antibodies. Um, and you also wouldn't need, uh, and from an intelligent design perspective, it's also a terrible design because a lot of these ERVs are interrupting genes, um, which can cause cancer. So, um, so basically the functions that these ERVs take are going to be infection related, immune related, um, and gene regulation related, which is exactly how retroviruses function as they infect us. So none of these beneficial functions are, are unexpected or conflict with the idea that they are historical infections or how biochemistry works in general. Um, viruses and infections aren't inherently bad for you. In fact, you could not survive without uh, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's in the uh, thousands of species that infect your gut that you can't digest without, or that infect your skin that keeps uh, away um, worse uh, infections. Um, and as uh, a parasitic or infectious uh, pathogenic or a pathogen, um, they don't want to kill their host. So the most successful pathogens actually work with the host. Um, same with the symbiotic uh, biological relationships. Um, you can suck the blood out of your host, but if it kills it, you run out of your food supply. If you're hardly noticeable or if you actually provide some kind of benefit, then your host is actually going to want you around. Um, one example is the birds that... Uh, they're not exactly parasitic, but they clean out the teeth of the crocodiles. The crocodiles don't eat the birds that hang out in their mouths because they clean out their teeth. So these kind of relationships can develop naturally. And um, and it's going back to ERVs, it's not very, well, it's not, <laughs> it's close to zero, the probability that, um, in fact, in one of my calculations, 
my calculator literally couldn't calculate that low and just gave me a zero for the like the likelihood. Um, so the idea that God would put these things in our genomes that were um, not in the ideal locations, but they were also in the exact same locations as other species. And the fact that he would use an, like an update to an operating system instead of just put them in our genomes in the first place is really odd um, and doesn't jive with uh, intelligent design at all because, in fact, we can come up with better designs. Um, so the fact that they're in the same locations does indicate that it was um, a historical infection shared by two different uh, species, um, not because of the similar sequence, but because, well, they're identified by the similar sequence. But again, similar species, similar location of a similar gene. Well, exact, almost exactly the same. Um, and it's the fact that uh, this isn't going to happen just by chance. Um, I had another point, but I, I derailed my train of thought. I'll get it in a minute. But the uh, the idea that God would use uh, um, would use ERVs to infect us is even if He's putting them in the correct location or what whatever, even if there's not a better intelligent design, ERVs are one of the worst delivery mechanisms for. Uh, well, we retroviruses are one of the worst delivery mechanisms for updates to genetics um, because they're not necessarily going to get into the gametes. And we even have uh, therapeutics that are based on retroviruses, but the fact that they're so unlikely to get into the reproductive cells is a major problem for uh, this intelligent design uh, method. And I think that should be about eight minutes. You are exactly correct, man. Eight minutes. Pretty good job. A lot of good points there, man. I think you brought a little more heat in the rebuttal than you did in your opening, huh? <laughs> All right, we're going to hand it that over. That was planned. Yeah. What's that? That was part of the plan. There you go. I, I think like we it. all kind of know like the topic, it. so. Turn up the heat on him, man. He needs it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, here we go. Uh, let me start my timer, eight minutes. And the openings were brief overviews, and here we go. Let's get into the fun, because I am pumped. So um, Taylor's arguments here, essentially in the opening statement and the rebuttal itself, boil down uh, to a starting point and basic assumption that these viral-like sequences are really the leftover remnants of, of past viral infections. Just so stories aren't going to show us empirically how non-functional endogenous retroviral-like sequences can go from something that is non-functional to critically functional in determining cell types, aiding in the immune system, embryological development, and so on, okay? Because he pointed out um, that it's, it's it's not just one beneficial function, okay? He, um, what I've written down is, is he said, you know, it, it, a beneficial function, one single beneficial function can certainly come about through co-option or evolution. It, it's not just one. Okay, there are massive amounts of uh, ERV-like sequences that, that are aiding in, in tr transcription in, in so many important functional roles. And something important to note is that retrotransposons, okay, they are uh, mobile genetic elements, and we know that they're often referred to as jumping genes because they can actually move around the genome, jumping from one location to the next in, in the DNA itself. They can literally move from one chromosomal location to another. And the ability of, of a retrotransposon to move around the genome allows for what? It allows for genetic variation when mobilized. So here's another important 
uh, functional role of, of these various classes of retrotransposons. And that's why there's, there's a creationist model called the uh, VIGE hypothesis, which stands for, that acronym stands for uh, Variation Inducing Genetic Elements. And the fact is, and in, in what this model proposes essentially is that a lot of these bad viruses have actually originated uh, in endogenous retroviral sequences within the genome rather than outside. And we can actually make viruses in our genome. This is an important point because in our cells, we make all of the parts that make that viruses make. We have all the ingredients and properties to make viruses. We make protein shells, we make DNA, we make RNA, we have DNA and RNA copying enzymes. It is possible that many viruses came from within the genome rather than outside. And this had to be the case anyways, because a retrovirus requires a host to replicate. So what came first, the virus or the, ho of the host? It makes sense and, and it's, it solves this, this dilemma and paradox that evolutionists face in terms of the origin of, of viruses in general, specifically retroviruses. I'd like to ask Snake, you know, what's your explanation for the origin of, of these retroviruses that require a host in the first place? Okay, so it is possible that many viruses came from within the genome. They were made from cellular parts. As our cells are packaging things in various different ways, a few accidental changes during the packaging process can actually make a bad virus. And it sounds like viruses came from the human genome rather than, than vice versa. So his, uh, his response here in, in my notes where he says that um, a, a lot of these ERV elements are detrimental, cancer-causing, disease-causing, well, that's exactly what we would expect through uh, mutation accumulation, through accidental errors in the genome may result in uh, fully working endogenous retroviral-like sequences, altering to the point where they may cause uh, disease and may cause um, cancers of, of all sorts. But the fact is, one of their main roles is the fact that they play an antiviral role. And because of this, they require what he was saying aren't required, like the gag gene, the pole gene, the ENV, okay, the LTRs. No, these are all functional properties of the overall endogenous retroviral unit, okay? And there's a lot of latent genetic information in our genome. We understand this. And many of these retrotransposons actually have a gene promoter in them. And so, so if, if they're stuck in, let's say, one place in the DNA, and within this place in the gene, they can turn on a gene, okay? They regulate. And if they move, that gene gets turned off. So you, ha you have these signatures of integration, not because they are being integrated from the outside, but because they are actually moving around within the genome itself, okay? So if this mobile element moves, that gene gets turned off. And what this tells us is that as jumping genes are popping in and out into the genome in different places, they can literally turn things on and turn things off. This is evidence for forward thinking, which uh, points us back to a forward thinker. And I wanna share screen and kind of just demonstrate a lot of what I'm saying here in, in the number of papers that, that I have made for everybody. Uh, right here, ERVs are retrotransposons, a type of transposable element that spreads throughout the genome via a copy and paste mechanism. And uh, there's a different class that can do it through a, a cut and paste mechanism, okay? Retrotrans retro transposition. This capacity allows ERVs to make copies of themselves that in turn insert themselves elsewhere in the genome. And that's why you'll often uh, see them being referred to as mobile elements, all right? The ability of transposons to increase genetic diversity. This isn't coming from creationists. Here's an article in, um, you can find it on Nature. Together with the ability of the genome to inhibit most transposable element activity results in a balance that makes transposable elements an important part of evolution and gene regulation in all organisms that carry these sequences. So again, jumping genes. And here's something that's interesting about the function of, of ERVs is that much of the evidence for the function of T's comes from the growing realization that many transposons are highly conserved among distantly related taxonomic groups. So if what we're looking at is high levels of con 
conservation, that would mean they must be there for a reason if they're not being hit with all of these mutations that essentially could be uh, damaging because maybe we're looking at a sequence that's uh, nothing more than genomic leftovers, ge genetic baggage. No, sequence conservation suggests functionality. And um, this is an important point, guys. Herbs frequently have important immune functions and they should not be presumed to be junk DNA. This defeats both the junk DNA or junk herb argument against the design of the genome. It also challenges those who want to use the supposed junk status of herbs as an argument for common ancestry. So the last thing I want is that the LTRs, okay, they're there for a reason. They have the capacity to exert a regulatory influence as both a promoter and enhancer of cellular genes. Uh, we went over the fact that uh, what we could be looking at in terms of bad viruses is uh, viral um viral escapees. And last thing I'll say is, is this argument from co-option, it, it's imagination. Okay, I'm going to end it here with a simple question for Snake, I guess, as, as we move in, into the open discussion uh, after this, he can either choose to answer it first or not. Show me empirical evidence in a lab, a technical paper today. It's not just one or two uh, functional roles in these herb sequences. Show me a non-functional herb uh, sequence going from non-functional to uh, something critically functional in the genome, and that's uh, that's eight minutes, so I'll yield there. Excellent, perfect timing. So uh, now we're gonna go into this 30 minute discussion and I guess we can kind of tail off right where Donnie left it if you want to, Snake, do you wanna address that question? You got anything else you wanna bring up? Well, um, I guess I, I would uh, offer a, like a slight correction. So, um, so the, the gag and the envelope proteins are potentially useful. They're not necessarily useful. Um, uh, but the, the poll section and the long terminal repeats are basically um, just uh, virus specific. And so the, um, the human, the human genome is capable of translating the gag or poll regions, or I'm uh, sorry, the ENV regions um, independently of uh, of uh, the uh, LTRs, long terminal repeats, and the uh, the poll, uh, which is the reverse transcriptase, right? And um, so so there are markers that show that these things are in fact viral, and so um, and are not necessary as intelligent design elements so like do you do you accept that some of these uh ervs are in fact of, of viral origin well some interesting points that you brought up so to, to kind of work um from from the, your first point is that yes when we look to these erv elements and the properties essentially that uh, make up the ERV sequence, right? The structure of it, the LTRs on, on either side, your, your gag, pole, and envelope protein, essentially. Okay. These are uh, characteristics and signatures of exogenous retroviruses. Okay. They have similarities, but um, that's what's so fascinating about the structure of the ERV sequence itself is the fact that one of their their roles, Taylor, is they have the ability to protect against the exogenous retroviruses that supposedly they are the result of, right? You have this uh, viral infection and uh, essentially it gets passed on because it invades uh, the germ cells and it's, it's passed on vertically rather than horizontally. And so it becomes endogenous. It, it comes from within. Okay, the offspring are going to have this viral DNA in every single one of their cells. And essentially, that's where these ERVs came from, according to the evolutionary story. But the ability of these ERV sequences to actually protect against this, okay, the fact that ERVs block the ability of the exogenous retrovirus to infect in the first place and to, be, and to become an endogenous retrovirus tells me that, and, and you can see this in a number of papers I can screen share later, uh, for sake of time right now, I won't. They uh, perform viral mimicry, 
and they require the specific structure and properties, okay, including the gag, the pole gene, the, the ENV, in order to um, carry out this, this ability. And uh, another ability as well is uh, involved in, in tumor suppression, where they also, we can get into that a little bit later, where uh, the structure and property of uh, the ERV sequence itself, these similarities are uh, necessary. They're a, a required design feature to carry out the job that it does in disrupting uh, retroviral insertions and in um, tumor suppression. So I, I don't think the properties that make up the ERV or ERV that are also similar to exogenous retroviruses is a problem for the design hypothesis. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Go ahead. Well, um, yeah, I definitely want to get into the uh, topic of discussion. Um, but as for the question, are you, do you accept that there are retroviral infections that result in these ERVs, even if you're not accepting any of the beneficial ones? You're... Well, that is a good question. And it doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility that an exogenous retrovirus can invade our cells and invade in, in just the right way and in the right spots for it to be uh, passed on vertically, essentially. So it, it doesn't seem to be out of the realm of, of possibility. So how many uh, have actually occurred, have gotten past one of these functional roles of, of the ERV sequences in general to kind of prevent that and stop that? Um, I'm not sure because as far as I know, we don't really have any observable evidence unless you can present that where we have... Um, endogenous retroviruses. We have a new uh, the virus infecting and then becoming endogenous and fixed within, within the population. Because from my understanding and respond to this, um, what we're looking at is genomic fossils to the evolutionists. And so this is a historical record of common descent. So we're not actually seeing the um, endogenization, I guess you could say, occurring today. Um, go ahead. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, like, how would you tell the difference between a retrovirus mimic and a legitimate uh, um, endogenous retrovirus? Well, right, that's a good point, but... Because, well, if I um, could yeah, add a little bit more. Um, so we do know what retroviruses look like when they infect cells, and they have this exact same structure. And um, th the only difference would be that they occur in gametes, um, which are reproductive cells. And as long as that doesn't kill off the uh, fetus, which is one form of selection, if, if the mutation or the um, infection occurs in a highly inconvenient place, that thing's just not going to even be born to uh, pass on its genetics. So, but yeah, these think, we use retroviruses for therapeutics so we know how they look when they infect cells it's just a difference of which cell they infect so what I, I get, going back to the question i asked is there a way to differentiate a virus mimic and a legitimate erv right so that's a good question i would say the majority of what we're looking at in terms of these um you know, quote unquote, genomic fossils that uh, evolutionists such as, as yourself look to and compare across different uh, groups, different species that uh, fall within a nested hierarchical pattern, as well as the uh, mute mutations that occur in, in these LTRs, these LTR uh, elements. I would say that the vast majority, if not all of those are created units of, of DNA function. They are these uh, variation inducing genetic elements that, that were front loaded. And in a way we can tell is whether or not they, they are functional. That's a direct prediction of the design diversity hypothesis that if God front loaded various types of functional units in living organisms, that would include these ERV sequences, ALU sequences, we would, uh, we would predict function and we would predict a lot of function, not just one or two. So when we find an ERV sequence that is functional in, let's say, embryological development or um, uh, beneficial in like right here, human endogenous retroviruses 
have recently been suggested as mediators of normal biological processes such as cellular differentiation and regulation of gene expression. So I would say, okay, confidently, this is a created unit of, of DNA function, given it, its functional role. And uh, for you to demonstrate that, no, this is the ancient remnant of a past viral infection, you would show how it's actually possible empirically for this type of uh, DNA unit to become functional in determining cell types, gene expression, embryological development in the immune response. So that would be my uh, criteria is looking, looking for function. And if we have an ERV sequence, here's the last thing I'll say and then take as long as you want. If we have an ERV sequence, okay, that is, is functional, let's say in, in the immune system. And then we have another ERV sequence that maybe we haven't really tested, so we don't know what the function is yet, but they still bear the same signatures and similarities. I would say, okay, this is, um, I would predict this is also a functional ERV element, but what's its exact function? We still have to uh, test that, which, which is nice because this is where testable predictions um, that are falsifiable uh, come into play, you know? Um, so re respond to anything, but again, I, I, I'd like to ask you, given given the criteria, what would be your best um, example of a, a non-functional retroviral-like element or sequence going from non-functional to something functional in, in the immune system, in, in embryological development? I mean, that paper that I showed in, in my uh, either opening or rebuttal, uh, the authors, which are secular, they admitted that without this endogenous retrovirus, we wouldn't be able to reproduce. It's required for embryological uh, development. So Snake, go ahead. So uh, to kind of correct something, retroviruses have function from the moment of infection. So that you're never going to find anything that goes from non-function to functional. You might have kind of a change of function or a, a shifting of responsibility, but um um, we can talk about that uh, once we once we're fully on the subject of function. But so it looks like you're saying that they're identical in structure, and you can't really tell based on their genetics whether they're from an infection or not. It's just whether or not it has a beneficial biological function. Is that how you're telling the difference? I would say the criteria. Um in terms of determining what is a created unit of DNA function versus, versus what, what is a, a retrovirus. For example, it, when we looked at the, the, the Phoenix virus experiment, okay, that, that's a paper you've cited before. That's a great experiment where they uh, took cells in, in a Petri dish and uh, subjected them to uh, various mutations. Uh, they, they produced a virus. Well, that goes back to what I was saying in my uh, rebuttal, that uh, one creationist hypothesis titled the uh, variation inducing genetic element hypothesis, which suggests that uh, retroviruses, exogenous retroviruses, have originated from functional ERV-like sequences. And at that point, they can escape the genome, cross species, and of course, become uh, damaging, disease causing. And I think that has to be the case anyways, the nature of, of retroviruses. So if we're looking at what you would say is, is a genetic fossil, a dead virus, that is what I'm saying is, is a created unit of, of DNA function. If we're looking at an exogenous retrovirus, then I would say that is what um, probably originated from the, these functional ERV sequences. And I'd like to see where a, a retrovirus, an exogenous retrovirus like, a, like HIV assists in embryological development or determining cell types. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of any research suggesting that, that these retroviruses, before they integrate and are passed down vertically and become endogenous, I'm not aware, aware of any papers that suggest that they already uh, contain the necessary information to assist in, in embryological development. So uh, go ahead, Snake. Um, so you did say that it is possible for some, for at least one uh, beneficial function to come, come about by infection and co-option. Um, so well, I wouldn't say co-option. Um, okay. I mean, that's what you said, but 
you're well, no, I, I, I you're was welcome saying, to I, I, clarify. Well, I, I don't want to, I just want to clarify. I don't want to say that it's impossible. I'm not going to sit here and say, no, it, it's impossible for an exogenous retrovirus to infect a, a germ cell, enter a sperm or egg, and then be passed down vertically. And the offspring now has an adult. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not going to sit here and go on record saying that, that that's impossible. Maybe it's it's possible if if one of their roles these herb sequences is to prevent that. Well, we know we have DNA repair enzymes that that are uh, formulated to prevent mutations, but mutations still occur. So I'm not going to say it's impossible, but we, it's not like we have overwhelming evidence in the lab or a series of technical papers showing this happening. I mean, you can you can present if you can present that, I'd like to see it, but. We're, we don't see that as far as I know. Go ahead. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. As, I mean, as far as uh, cells that are infected with retroviruses, they can reproduce and they still have the retroviral elements in them. Um, and so as far as co-opting a function, like I said, not all viruses are going to be harmful. Uh, and some of them, are going to be able are going to be harmful in the right way, so there are certain genes that we could benefit from having down regulated, and if the virus is infects those genes, then that's going to be beneficial because it's damaging a bad gene or a a gene that might be, need to be turned down or interrupted in some way. So, um, yeah, what is, what's your response there? Well, a few responses and, and a few questions I would have is if, if what we're looking at here, then, you know, the, these thousands and thousands of, of Irv sequences that essentially are the ancient remnants of, of past viral infections, okay, that have been passed down over millions of years. How in the world did, did these ancestors survive? To, to reproduce, especially this, this invasion of deleterious <laughs> exogenous retroviruses. How, how did they survive this, this invasion of all of these viruses? How was this not deleterious to the point where, um, for one, selection would just remove the infected group from the equation? And two... How, how would this result in, in fixation since we're looking at fixed herb, herb like sequences? Uh, go ahead, Snake, if you want to answer those. Well, um, the first step, obviously, uh, we survive all the time, just, just as we are now, getting infected by all kinds of things. Um, uh, as far as deleterious ones, I uh, explained there is a selection filter where just like any, any mutation, if it's too detrimental to the organism, it's not even going to gestate or it will uh, gestate badly. And if it's born, it will die soon after or not be able to reproduce. Um, so there is a selective filter for based on how harmful the, uh, inclusion of the virus is so i mean half of all pregnancies don't even um implant uh half of all fertilized eggs don't even implant and and uh there are i don't know how i think it's in the so like dozens of millions of sperm cells per ejaculate they're all going to have different mutations and potentially infections. So if the infection is bad, the sperm cell will be unfit. It won't even get to the egg. If somehow it gets to the egg, then it probably doesn't have an infection bad enough to slow it down. If it, if the infection doesn't slow down the sperm cell, it might have a adverse effect on development. And thus that uh, genetic element will not be passed on. Um, as far as co-opting a function, there are, we see this in a lot of different um, 
organisms where two different genetic elements or anatomical elements can serve the same function and they can lose one of these and get along fine because there's a redundancy there. So if, um, so if the ERV is providing a similar regulatory function as a regulatory function that the organism already has, it is now free to have that ERV mutate. And this, this happens a lot where ERVs it might be slightly harmful, but they we've we can uh, sequence them and see that they've lost some of the pathogenic elements of them, so that they're not not harmful. Um, or so it, if you if you have that redundancy, you can have mutations in either the ERV or the previous regulatory element, and you'll still have the same regulation. So there's no theoretical or functional barrier to the co-option of those ERVs, even as essential functions. Okay, so <clears throat> I'd want to respond to quite a bit there. First thing I'll say when it comes to the uh, answer to the question about how, how these species could essentially survive just mass invasion of virus after virus. I do believe it, unfortunately for the evolutionist, does require a lot of uh, just so storytelling. We know that the, the, this hypothetical invasion of viruses occurred millions of years ago in order for them to be passed on. And after the human to chimpanzee split, we have the, the similar herb sequences because they um, the human line chimp line went different directions, but but retained these in, endogenous retroviruses, essentially. But my biggest counter to that is is the paper that I showed earlier in my uh, rebuttal that demonstrates we're looking at a lot of conservation, a lot of conserved sequences where um, these herb uh, sequences, herb elements haven't really been hit with a ton of mutations. And so this would suggest, and this was from a secular technical paper as well, this would suggest that we're looking at genome-wide functionality essentially of, of these herb sequences. Now, of course, through mutations, recombination, and uh, other accidental changes, um, these could destroy the, the functions of, of some of these herb sequences. Also, we know that a lot of these herb sequences are only functional. They're expressed during different stages of, of development. Okay. And after they are expressed and, and essentially they do their job, they are, uh, then turned off or, or suppressed in, in their function. So if we were to test that, let's say in, in the life of a specific organism, if we were to test that, and even through genetic knockout, we were to snip it out and there was no immediate effect, well, that's because either one, we're looking at uh, redundancy, two, we're looking at an ERV sequence that is turned off. It, it's only expressed under certain conditions, certain environmental conditions, uh, when it comes to uh, tumor suppression or antiviral infection, they're only called upon essentially in, in light of those uh, circumstances. So there, there, there's a lot of herb sequences, unfortunately, that evolutionists would say are non-functional, but they haven't done enough, I would say, analyses or uh, even knockout experiments to know that for a fact, since we know for a fact that a lot of these herb sequences are only functional under certain um, conditions. And again, when it comes to the, uh, the, the co-option, you know, here, for example, far from being junk DNA, the pervasive retrotransposons that populate the genome have a powerful capacity to influence genes in chromatin. A new study demonstrates how the transcription of one such element, H-E-R-V-H, can modify, notice this, can modify the higher order 3D structure of chromatin during early primate development. Here's the last thing I'll say and then take as much time as you need, Taylor, okay? In the mouse genome, there's a certain class of retrotransposon that if you snip it out, Okay, you remove it, the mouse is developing, you remove this retrotransposon and the mouse stops developing, it dies. It's because again, it requires that functional retrotransposon to develop and live. 
Okay, so I don't think your answers here are adequate, that retroviruses have some innate functionality that when they, uh, in fact, integrate and are passed on vertically, okay, through the germ cell lines, they can eventually become not just functional in, um, in a low functional sense, but literally critical, as in that one paper I showed earlier, demonstrated that no, if it wasn't for this herb sequence, there wouldn't be mammals. <laughs> it's literally required for the existence of mammals. So I don't think you're, you're adequately answering this question because to me, the question could be adequately answered with just a single technical paper that actually shows empirically in a lab, hey, listen, here's, here's a, an herb element that, that we thought was useless, but through a series of mutations or co-option events, you know, it, it went from something that was dead to something that is now critically functional in embryological development. Can you provide an, anything like that, uh, Taylor? And, and go ahead, take your time. Yeah, so they're not functionally dead when they infect. They, they're functionally, well, there's a debate uh, over whether viruses are alive or not. But the retrovirus, as soon as it infects, is functional. All of its viral elements are functional to create viruses. So basically, to gain a function, they have to, parts of it have to die so that they're not viral and pathogenic. But as you said, they can affect regulation. And that's really not hard to explain because mutations affect regulation all the time. Uh, reflect. Uh, they can affect um, cellular uh, division. Um, and, and viruses do have self-regulatory elements in them. They, it's not like once they're inside of your body, or once they've inserted into the genome, that they just continuously replicate and replicate and replicate. There are tons of diseases that can go dormant, and there are certain environmental conditions that will then trigger them to turn on. Um, and so they have a, an ability to interact with the cell, whether it's interrupting it or tagging it for, um, being activated, um, which are not, they are completely unremarkable as far as, uh, non-designed elements go. And like I said, if there's a redundancy there, the original function to that can be lost and it can look like oh the the erv was the only thing that was ever regulating this when it's perfectly capable of having just been a redundancy that is left over um well and yeah go ahead i'm i'm gonna be listening but i'm just gonna grab something real quick no worries no worries so again the example that, that I pointed to, where, where you have a class of retrotransposon that if knocked out, if removed, the organism stops developing, it, it dies. I mean, we're not just talking about the, the known properties or function, I guess you could say, of exogenous retroviruses, okay? The evolutionist is saying that these herb sequences that we see where the debate lies, are these really the ancient remnants of, of past viral infections or created units of DNA function? You guys are the ones purporting. For example, um, I had a bunch of papers here up from, let's see if I can get to them real quick, from the secular literature where the best you're going to get, for example, here, um, if in the past, HERVs were mistakenly considered as useless elements of the human genome, DNA junk, which they're admitting that in the past, this is what they assume. So one question I'll have, if you want to keep it to memory, is uh, do you have any technical paper or any um, example of an evolutionary uh, scientist predicting function before function was found? That's a question I'd be interested in, in hearing an answer to do. Today, some are recognized as conferring biological advantages. In fact, in some cases, HERV genomes have undergone a process of positive selection during evolution, being exploited by the host to benefit important physiological processes. This is, the, this is a paper from 2020. 
this is the best you can find. I've read through dozens of papers and they don't actually, they'll, they'll say, well, these are engines of evolution, positive selection, kind of like what, what you're doing. And um, apologies if this sounds aggressive. I just think it's a lot of uh, fanciful storytelling, a lot of uh, informative gloss and essentially imagination. Like just imagine, you know, an exogenous retrovirus that essentially is, is infiltrating in, in, in order to do damage to the host, uh, the exogenous retroviruses we know today, like HIV, for example, nobody wants uh, that infection, right? And again, thank God, we're seeing it in these uh, populations of, of koalas, where these herb sequences are actually now being called upon. And thank God for, for their structure and properties, the LTRs, the GAG, the pole, ENV, which the evolutionists, that's their best argument. They always say, like you're saying, why do they resemble exogenous retroviruses? They literally require these similarities. They require these signatures in order to do their job when it comes to fighting off bad viruses. They have to have that structure in the first place. And so the uh, VIGE hypothesis at least would say, okay, they look the way they do because one of their many functions is to fight off bad viruses. So the last thing I'll say, and, and then take your time, is I don't feel satisfied with, with the um, answers provided, not only by you, just in the papers that I'm reading, where it discusses these functional roles. I never actually see empirical evidence for how this co-option happened or how this evolution happened. They just say it did because positive selection, engines of evolution, so on and, and so forth. So, you know, obviously you, you can disagree with me, but I, I don't feel like an adequate answer has been provided to uh, how these incredibly important uh, functional roles can, can come about. Uh, Taylor, go ahead, take your time. Yeah. Well, first of all, how much time do we have left? Brandon, you might be on mute. And I'm. Uh, you got it. the 30 minutes is up in 10 seconds, but we can add the extra seven minutes that uh, you didn't use in your opening. So if you guys want uh, the extra seven, you can have at it. Yes, please. Um, so um, as I said, uh, viruses are not necessarily bad for you um, or they could it, it's all completely context dependent so they can be completely neutral they could be uh in fact uh we use viruses to infect and kill cancer cells um because we they can be selective like that um some viruses kill off bacteria but don't infect humans um or viruses might have a disruptive effect on harmful uh, genes or mutations that we already have in us. Um, so the regulatory nature of retroviruses already explains it in any evolutionary way that they can regulate things. Um, the only thing, the, if there's a dependency there, this would seem to indicate that it was not uh, based on the, the evidence that it was infection would seem to indicate that it was a part of a redundancy that we've lost. And we see that um, such as um, in, there's a species of amoeba, which has a, a sister species and there's one species of bacteria that infects both of them. One, one of the cousins is killed by the bacteria it's pathogenic in them the other will die without that same exact species of bacteria and so there's very little difference between them but now but one of them they're, they're the same biblical kind but one is entirely dependent on something that it did not have before getting infected by it so and this is based on redundancies so it had something in its genome that was able to keep it alive before one of the uh, pathogenic bacteria infected the amoeba uh, spread throughout the population because it was not as pathogenic as a variant that it's related to. And, um, and then the amoebas that could tolerate these bacteria 
basically lost their original function and now you can't take the bacteria out without killing them but they originally had this function so we observe this process happening we know it's possible in in viral uh, regulation um so uh snake if i as, could it, yeah. I just wanted to make sure you answered the question and still continue on as long as you need. Um, one of the questions I, I asked in my last response was, did uh, evolutionary scientists predict function before function was found? Do you know the answer to that? Um, I, as far as the literature says, it's usually uh, was it was not known. So they it's an investigation. They, they discovered viral elements. Uh, a lot of people assumed because it's an inactivated virus that it wouldn't be that important, but then we discovered that it was. So, isn't that just I mean, retrofitting not... the data, though? No, that's just investigating what what it is. Like, there's no no one's claiming anything outside that it's like if if we f we're investigating the genome, we find these elements that look like viruses. And eventually we found out that some of them have uh, beneficial functions. So that's not, that's not retrofitting any data. The only thing that worked. Well, what would be, if you could, are you, like, if you could screen share or present us with, uh, based on, on what you're saying, okay, what would be the best tactical paper or lab experiment that, that you can provide myself or, or anybody on the fence, let's say in the audience, that would would show us and uh, kind of make the light bulb go off where we're like okay okay we can see how because if you notice this paper here HERVs appear to play important roles in physiology fetal development and human evolution this is not a creationist paper by the way if the accidental notice this the accidental infection of a mammalian ancestor by exogenous retrovirus had never occurred the placenta and the mammals that produce it including humans <laughs> would never have existed. And I want the audience to pay close attention to that. Without this endogenous retroviral-like sequence, we couldn't exist. Humans would have never existed. These beneficial consequences can explain why these uh, HERVs have been fixed into the genome instead of being eliminated over, over the years. The most parsimonious explanation for me is, okay, these are necessary, these are essential, these were designed and created. But for you, I just see, you know, unfortunately, and I understand you'll disagree, I do see a lot of kind of just so storytelling, maybe this, maybe that. But why in 2022 don't we have a, a technical paper documenting some kind of lab experiment where this uh, endogenous retroviral-like element was, was subjected to a series of mutations or, or whatever that actually uh, led to a, a highly essential endogenous retrovirus? Um, yeah, go ahead. What would be your favorite technical paper just to just to kind of throw at us uh, demonstrating what you're saying in terms of the co-option? Uh, you mentioned the Phoenix virus. Uh, so uh, we can make them. We know that these uh, elements are uh, telltale signs of a viral infection. So at some point. Yes, some regulatory function is beneficial. That's that's well, what not did the Phoenix virus any... experiment demonstrate though, for the audience sake? It demonstrated that it's a virus of viral origin. Well, firstly, so, how is that then, demonstrating their their the co-option of these uh, functional roles in embryological development? Well, we know that this is possible. Um, I can cite the the, <laughs> the amoebas paper uh, that we know that. Um, redundancies with like with this type of thing occurs um it's extremely rare like like you said there's one of these out of thousands of these so uh it's not going to be easy to evolve this in a lab um but we do know that they are viral elements we do know that the result of an infection and we've kind of lost track of the fact that there are hundreds of these that are shared with chimps. So this is, again, st since we know that they're viruses, 
statistically impossible. Well, I, I wanted for us I, to I just want to make sure that the audience. I, obviously, I disagree with that. We don't know their viruses. I, I think we've demonstrated that they're not. But but I understand you th you believe that we know their viruses. But the only reason you conclude that is because of their properties, the, the structure, the LTRs, the gag, the pole, the NDMD. their viral exclusive properties, right? But I've already pointed out that <laughs> the structure, the makeup, the properties of the ERV uh, sequence are required for one of their many, many roles, which is fighting off exogenous retroviruses, working in the immune. If they did not have these similarities to uh, extant retroviruses or exogenous retroviruses, they couldn't do their, their job. So I don't understand why you believe this is evidence that they're ancient remnants. No, so of that would be, infection. so that would be something like the envelope protein. But the rest of the telltale signs are not necessary because. So, uh, you mentioned viruses being bad for us. We can't have an immune system unless we're exposed to viruses and bacteria. So our immune system literally needs examples for it to learn. Um, we produce antibodies that go after all kinds of things. And this is a process of miniature evolution is there's all, it's called somatic <laughs> hypermutation produces tons and tons of different mutations. Uh, and then the ones that work survive and proliferate. And then that's the immune system that you work with going forward. And if you encounter more, um, there's that. And then you, you say Wait, that these are if if I not could, retroviruses. Joe, if I could, if I could. Okay. I have to point out that no, every property of, of the, the unit, the ERV unit, for one, a lot of what we're looking at in terms of these sequences are just LTRs, just functional stretches of, of DNA. You know, we only find very few full endogenous retroviral sequences. I think you understand that. But what, if you're looking at the LTRs, the GAG, the poll, the ENV, it, it's all functional for for the unit okay it would be like saying well you know a human no. being is is not a functional unit it just has some functional parts and other parts that are not functional well, that, that doesn't make any sense the erv unit itself is made up of properties or ingredients i guess you could say that are necessary for its functional roles including the fact that they jump around retro transposition they they can jump around the genome OK, yeah. leading to genetic diversity, turning genes on and off. They require their structure to even do that role. So I, I just wanted to say, I, I think you're wrong on that, uh, Snake. Go ahead. Uh, no, because they, you don't require them to have retrotransposable elements. They stay in the same place. That's part of the reason that that's part of the whole argument, because they're in the same place. If they were hopping around completely. That would... Well, they can move around. They're, 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 there's, there's class one and class two. They can either move around through a copy and paste mechanism or even a cut and paste. Yeah. They're transposed they're jumping but, genes, right? But the fact that they're found in the same locations is one of the pieces of evidence. So that's not a functional element that you don't require it to jump around for it to express envelope proteins, which is that's one of the ways that uh, the it's beneficial to cancer is it starts producing... Uh, viral specific particles that the immune system can recognize but it doesn't need an entire uh it doesn't need the ltrs to to express those envelope proteins um and in fact the, the LTRs, ltrs have a different function but as you said not all of these are complete retroviral sequences anyway they could they have function and get along fine without the entire suite of retroviral tags right. A lot of what we're looking at in the genome are just LTRs. And notice here from PubMed, <clears throat> endogenous retroviral LTRs as promoters for human genes. In this review, we summarize known examples of LTRs that function as human gene alternative promoters, as well as the evidence that LTR exaptation has resulted in a pattern of novel gene expression. You can read through this all yourself. My hand and my foot and my heart and my lungs, okay, everything that makes up me, Okay, the unit that is a human being has different functional roles, does different things, just like the ERVs made up of LTRs, or you just have uh, isolated or, or solo LTRs that are just functional uh, stretches of DNA, critical in, in, in um, mm. 
gene promotion, things like that. Either way, what we're looking at, regardless of the property, it, it's functional and, and necessary. And it contradicts this idea that, that these are the ancient remnants of, of viral infections. Again, I haven't really seen a, a, the, the Phoenix, Phoenix virus experiment. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That just showed us exactly what we've been predicting, that viruses, retroviruses have originated from within the genome. So they subjected a, an endogenous retrovirus to, to a series of, of mutations and uh, revived a virus. Well, that's exactly what we're saying based on our um, VIGE hypothesis. So that doesn't work to answer the question. Uh, I just think this is a question that, that evolutionists really do struggle in, in explaining. And I understand why, you know, uh, go ahead. Uh, Nick, Taylor. Yeah. yeah. Why, don't, why don't you go ahead and take the last word on that? Address what he said there. Take your time and then we'll move into your guys' closings if you want. Yeah, so the entire suite of retroviral parts is not necessary for the beneficial function of it. Uh, some LTRs are beneficial, some ENVs are beneficial, some GAGs are beneficial, but not the entire thing. You can cut it up. Um, and as you said, some of them are missing some of those parts, but those are identifiable tags that show us that they are viral elements and it doesn't it actually we can give you that it's a retrotransposon on that originated in the genome um it doesn't matter um well i'll finish that thought but uh so even if uh so this is it with the ltrs example that you gave this is exactly what we expect evolution to do is we have uh, and uh promoters uh we expect that new DNA elements are introduced or are moved around that can change the regulation of certain genes or change the composition of the proteins of the genes that get made. And this is, so this is not news. It's just news that some of the, vi the viruses are confirmed to have functions. So that's exactly what we, how we expect evolution to work is to co-opt new pieces of, uh, genetic information. But as far as we can give you that they're not even uh, the results of uh, retrovirus infections, but simply created transposable elements. So I'll give you God created uh, these pieces of DNA, but if, the, if you're going to go with their transposable elements, there's not, there's no mechanism for them to transpose to the exact same place or, or any very specific place. So the fact that they transpose in the exact same location, in the exact same genes, in the exact same location of chromosomes with the exact species is still evidence that they, come, that they are an inherited suite of a pattern well, one, that comes from a common ancestor. Well, before you go into your closing and maybe answer this in your closing, <clears throat> um, you understand that a lot of these uh, jumping genes, these retro transposons, they do have, it, it's not entirely random. They have prefer, preferred integration sites. As in maybe, you know, between this gene and this gene is going to allow for the essential function that, that it requires, or this will allow for the, um, for genetic variation when they jump around. So they have, perf so it's not just completely random. A lot of what we're looking at is, is non-random. And so that's yeah, why we would I, see them jumping into a lot of similar spots. Maybe save that for your closing. You have five minutes. Sure. Uh, yeah. Let's move into that. Um, All right. So like said, Am Snake, I going? You're get, uh, five minutes. Yeah. You'll go ahead and go first. All right. So yeah. Um, I calculated um, being extremely generous and only, Again, the, this one viral group, uh, the ERVWs, uh, HERVWs, -E if we're saying that there's only, so there's only, there's 211 that we have, and we're going to be extremely generous and say that there's only 211 possible places where it, it can insert, which is way, way too generous to be realistic, but we'll, let's go with that. Let's say that each virus can only go to one of these 211 places. 
And let's say that each has a 50% chance of going there, because yet, like you said, there are preferred sections, but there are still millions of them. Uh, but we'll, we'll reduce it down to 211 and give it an extremely generous chance of 50-50%. We still have a 3.5 times 10 to the 64th chance of it occurring the way that it does. And so there's that. Plus, it happened exactly the same way in ch chimps, oh well, uh, to the 205th. So uh, that's still statistically, that's, I don't know, it's a bigger number than the quintillions. So even if we're being extremely generous and saying that it's a retrotransposon that's originating in the genome and it has exactly as many places as there are and no more, and we're giving it a 50% chance, it's still statistically about zero likelihood that this is going to happen the same way in both chimps and humans. Um, there's the, and the fact that it just so happens to coincidentally match the exact same phylogenetic trees as is represented by uh, genetic barcoding of any other gene or uh, and the exact same phylogenetic tree as happens with morphology that's not that's also a coincidence because it's a suite of traits that's that can't be a coincidence is what I mean to say um, because again, there's hundreds of different insertion sites that could be anywhere, that could be functional anywhere. We know that that, that could be functional anywhere. We uh, These uh, glowing jellyfish in my background, we just took their uh, fluorescent protein and we can just stick it in pretty much anything and make it glow. And it doesn't really matter. It, there, you can't just stick it literally anywhere, but it you can put it on different chromosomes, um, things like that. So the location is not important to function. So this is an extremely poor design for God to have programmed, knowing full well that people like I and 99% of all of the best scientists are going to see the evidence in apparently the wrong way. I'm not sure why he's going to make the decision to give a design that's apparently deliberately confusing um and i've got about a minute left i think um as for functional elements they're all related to uh things that are that viruses are already capable of uh, they behave exactly how we expect um these uh, signals to expect or uh, to behave. Uh, it's not, it's not out of the realm of uh, probability to expect uh, regulatory elements to have deleterious, neutral and beneficial effects. You can just throw them randomly into things and they'll have beneficial, deleterious and neutral effects. This happens with viruses. And so that's not a problem. The fact that uh, we observe in many species uh, redundancies that can then be taken up, that, that you can then lose one of those redundancies and still have a necessary function, that explains every functional element that it re required functional elements. Um, so, yeah, I think that just about wraps it up. That does it for your five minutes, Nate. Excellent closing. Very good. It's been a lively debate. Tons of points made. So, Donnie, whenever you're ready to give your five-minute closing, man, have at it, and I'll start your timer. <clears throat> okay, I appreciate it. Let me start my timer as well. Lots to cover in just five minutes. So, no, it's not bad design. It's actually a perfect design.
okay? These elements are essential. They're critical to immune responses, cell stress responses, embryological development. I mean, during this debate, I must have shown at least over a dozen technical papers um, verifying exactly what I'm saying. And uh, Taylor, unfortunately, he didn't provide even, even one technical paper showing empirical evidence for how these uh, elements can uh, evolve such as essential functions, including embryological development. I mean, that one paper I, I showed uh, from the secular literature literally admitted if it wasn't for this retro transposon, we wouldn't exist. How is that bad design? They're admitting we wouldn't exist without it. That's good design. I like existing, and I think Taylor likes existing as well, okay? We share these elements with other forms of life like the chimpanzee simply because of common design since guess what? Chimpanzees also require elements to help with embryological development, determining cell types. Did you know chimpanzees are also made of cells? Yeah, believe it or not. Um, gene expression, gene regulation. Okay, aiding in the immune system, tumor suppression, so on and so forth. Okay, so they require these elements as well. Were we just supposed to expect to find them only in humans and not in any other form of life? That sounds kind of bizarre. And uh, Taylor tries to counter uh, the fact that these endogenous retroviral sequences have incredibly important and essential roles that if you knock out a certain retrotranspose on, the organism dies. Again, that is good design. But he looks to this uh, Phoenix virus experiment where um, scientists took human cells, mutated uh, the DNA ever so slightly uh, in the endogenous re retrovirus, and it turns out that an extinct virus was revived from a DNA sequence that was found in the human genome. That's exactly what we would predict, because as I've pointed out several times in this debate, okay, RNA virus, retroviruses require a host to replicate. What came first, the host or the RNA virus? I asked this question to uh, Snake a couple times. Obviously, the host, these had to have originated within the host, and we would suggest that they originated from functional ERV sequences. And that makes sense. We can actually track back every single exogenous retrovirus, given the genes and the properties it has. We can track them back to the host that they originated from. Okay, and there's, there's many creation scientists, one specifically named Dr. Peer, Turborg, I think is how you say his last name, who has done just that. And there's been no counter. Okay, so the Phoenix, Phoenix experiment does not help. It actually helps our model that uh, suggests that a lot of these uh, viruses came from ERVs, came from the, the human genome to begin with. There's a paradox. There's an unsolvable problem with those that uh, believe in, in um, deep time evolution. Where did RNA viruses come from in the first place? OK, so no, this is completely uh, compatible with our model and does not answer the question. The important question, are these really the ancient remnants of past viral infections or are they created units of DNA function? OK, one function that, that we kind of touched on slightly is that when the cell is under uh, under stress, OK, transcribed ERV elements gives the cell the appearance. Notice this of being invaded by a viral infection, which as a result targets the cell targets that specific cell, more destruction by the immune system. And some tumor cells can invade detection of the immune system, but this mechanism, which is mediated by what's called, it's a super protein, okay, P53, is a way for those tumor cells to become detectable by the immune system as a way for the immune system to clear these tumor cells from the body. And researchers, they're working on uh, various drugs that will uh, st stimulate P53 activity and the transcription of, of herbs as anti-cancer therapy, anti-cancer. These herb sequences are playing a role in tumor suppression through viral mimicry. Guys, the properties and structure of the herb sequence is required. It's, necess it's a necessary truth for these herb sequences to perform their roles. Notice here in the last 40 seconds. Seconds. Um, why would a creator produce functional genomic features that so closely resemble an endogenous, endogenized retrovirus? Okay, we've seen this in real time. I've shown many technical papers. The structural and functional features of the pre-existing ERVs, their capacity to copy themselves and move throughout the genome, are precisely what make these ERV sequences so useful. Their capacity for retro-transpositioning affords these sequences the means to disrupt the endogenization process of invading retroviruses. They literally act, they operate as antiretroviral elements. They must. 
they must, and I'll say it again, they must resemble endogenized retroviruses. They have to have these similarities to extant retroviruses or else they couldn't do their job. End of story. Slam dunk. Irv argument for evolution is, I think, dead. It's a fatal blow. So I'll, I'll yield there. That Actually, that's two seconds left. So that that's that's my closing statement. I appreciate it. Excellent timing again as well. Well, pretty good debate. I mean, I almost tailed off a few times not paying attention to the timer because uh, you guys are bringing up some good points. A lot of good questions. A lot of good information. <laughs> Uh, now we get to move on Technical to subject. the real fun part, right? The the audience Q&A. And we've got quite a few here. Um, looks like we got about 18, 17 and a half minutes left till we hit the two hour mark. So we'll see how many we get through. I'm going to scroll down and we'll jump right into the super chats. Uh, first off, George Bond with the $10 chat. Sweet chili chicken burger for lunch. Not bad, George. That sounds pretty good. Uh <laughs> Alec Cox with a $10 chat. I uh, threw in some random stuff here, but his question, um, how long does it take a cell to divide in a human? Number two, what is missed in that division? And I'm assuming this is uh, pertaining to something snake said. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what is missed in that division. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean. Me neither. How about the for any thoughts on the first part? How long does it take a cell to divide in a human? Alex asked. Uh, it's a couple hours, uh, twelve-ish hours, like, depending on the cell. Twelve hours. Excellent. <laughs> I'm not sure what the second part is. Supposed <laughs> me, to neither. me neither. Me neither. <laughs> You're getting a quiz, Taylor, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Question for Danny. Has anyone seen a modern viral insertion into the genome that hasn't caused serious health problems for the host, something similar to HIV? Right. So when these modern viruses, these extant viruses like um, HIV, when they... Um, when they invade the host cell, okay, they end up, um, it, it can be passed on uh, horizontally, but not vertically, like the endogenous uh, retroviruses, and they um, result in disease. They were, they, they're deleterious. They're damaging. And these retroviruses are very interesting because I, I pointed it out in, in my... Um, opening statement is, is that they use a, a very specific enzyme called reverse transcriptase to transcribe. They're made of um, RNA genetic material. Okay. So they use this uh, enzyme to transcribe the RNA in reverse back into DNA. And um, the virus uses another important enzyme called integrase to integrate its genetic information directly into the host's DNA. Okay. And if you are infected with one of these extant uh, retroviruses like HIV, for example. There's another one, um, the exact name of it, I can't think of right now, but it, it can actually result in lymphoma, various cancers, okay? These are deleterious, these are damaging. But what we see in terms of the endogenous retroviruses that are tightly regulated and integrated into the genomes of living organisms, they function in the embryo. They function in determining cell types. They function in gene expression. They have antiviral properties. They function in tumor suppression. They uh, aid in transcription, act as promoters. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And th that's, that's not deleterious like these extant uh, retroviruses. So I yield there. And what was the question again? The question was, has anyone seen a modern viral insertion into the genome that hasn't caused serious health problems for the host? Uh, modern? Uh, yeah, I'd have to look into exactly what it was. But um, yeah, most uh, diseases are not going to be fatal. Um, and uh, you were mentioning uh, reverse transcriptase a lot which is one of the hallmarks of a viral infection, 
which is not going to be required by something even even if uh, even those elements that are required to mimic a virus uh, for cancer cancer regulation is not going to require reverse transcriptase. Um, that's just going to look. That's just going to tell us that it's actually from an infection. Any last thoughts um, on that, Johnny? You want to move on to the so, next one? Yeah. Okay, so it's my question. I'll, I'll give the last couple thoughts. So, again, yeah, a lot of diseases that come about, okay? Not every single, uh, dis like a, a single point mutation can kill an organism. Okay, well, you know what? Uh, that organism's removed from the equation, okay? Selection's dealt with that. Selection is all about differential reproduction. Who's, who's having the most babies? Yeah, most diseases are not detrimental enough to fitness where that uh, person experiencing the disease can't have kids and then pass on their... Uh, deleterious mutations with it. Like if, if I lost both my hands and both my feet, let's just say even through a mutation, that sucks. But it's not going to prevent me from having kids. Okay. So yeah, many, many diseases um, are, are not going to uh, prevent reproduction. And, and the last thing I want to say is, again, when it comes to the reverse transcriptase, the GAG, the poll, the, the LTRs, the ENV, whatever, okay, every single property is essential for what these do, specifically the transposons, how um, they, they, they are mobile, mobile genetic elements, and uh, they can move around the genome, jumping from one location to the next in the DNA. They can do this through a copy and paste mechanism or a cut and paste mechanism. And the structure, including the reverse transcriptase uh, property of these uh, ERV elements are required for their many functional uh, roles, this specific one in generating genetic variation, which is what creation is predicted. I'll, I'll yield there. Excellent. I hope that satisfied the questioner there. We'll move on to the next one. I think this one is for you, Snake, uh, pertaining evolution. They say, so if evolution is the result of random, unguided processes, why should we expect to see any kind of a pattern at all? Because uh, it's not. It's, it's not unguided at all. It's guided by chemistry. It's guided by uh, selection pressures. Um, so, I mean, and we can prove that the, these exact mechanisms can create functional elements, uh, whether we're looking at uh, computer simulations of random mutations and then uh, being subjected to selection, which can cause uh, functional code or functional uh, body parts if we're simulating 3D body parts. Uh, these All these exact same uh, processes work. Uh, we can also observe it uh, at the genetic level with actual organisms. Uh, but again, it's not unguided. So I'm not sure what... Uh, that That's usually a straw man uh, calling it an unguided process because it's not. Okay. Danny? Yeah. If I could, these patterns that, uh, that we see, let's say specifically the nested hierarchical patterns, the fact that we share more with other primates, let's say we share more with the chimpanzee than we do with, uh, with a lemur. We share more with even the lemur. We can be grouped together with the chimpanzee and the lemur, uh, because we share more in terms of morphology, anatomy, physiology, and genetics than we do with a dog or a fish. I mean, this is expected, of course. Just stand back and, and look at the organism. You're going to predict more similarities uh, in genetics with a chimpanzee than, than with a dog. But even, even when it comes to these patterns that apparently, according to the evolutionists, are expected and, and predicted uh, from common descent, from the common descent uh, starting point, uh, we see inconsistencies all the time. There's something called incomplete lineage sorting, where uh, depending on what gene you look at, depending on what genetic marker you look at, you're going to get totally different trees. Look at the Y chromosome, for example. The Y chromosome between the humans and uh, gorillas <laughs> is more similar than uh, the Y chromosome between humans and chimpanzees. There's a break in the so-called hierarchy. And even when it comes to these uh, endogenous retroviral-like uh, sequences, there's inconsistencies in the hierarchy as well. For example, here's a paper. A herve, her whenever you see the H, human, human endogenous retroviral, K provirus in chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas. These observations provide very strong evidence that for some fraction of the genome, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas, notice this, are more closely related to each other than they are to humans. Okay, but the bottom line is we do share more 
endogenous retroviral like sequences with let's say the chimpanzee than we do with a, a creature that we share less in terms of morphology and anatomy with because we, sh we share more in, in terms of anatomy, morphology, physiology. So of course, we're going to share some of these uh, ERV sequences with them, especially if they function again in the embryo, determining cell types, gene expression, so on and so forth. That to me points to common design. Um, explaining the pattern far better than evolution. I'll yield there. Last word, Snake. Yeah, so that seems to be an inconsistency that you would expect similar morphology to have the exact same genetic elements. Um, but then you point out places, uh, isolated places where there are uh, certain breaks in the phylogenetic tree. Um, but that's not really how phylogeny is done. It's done with a suite of traits, not just one single trait. Um, and the Y chromosome specifically is one of the most fastest mutating, uh, well, it is the fastest mutating chromosome we have. Um, but it's not really, the arguments, at least with ERVs, is not about, uh, strictly about the similarity. Um, it's about the fact that has gone uh, basically unaddressed completely, which is that regardless of where you think they originate, these are elements that uh, came to rest where they are in the genome by, via either infection or transposition, which is statistically impossible to end up the exact same way in two different species like that. Um, and the fact that it we can predict how much that's just an added cherry on top, I guess. Excellent. All right. So before we move on to the next question, let me just say that logical, plausible, probable is having an after show. And that is exclusive for cool people. So if you're not cool, don't even think about going over there. High probability of dumpster fire. And I am a fan of probability theory, even uh, Bayesian probability which puts the resurrection at a probability of 0.97. And I would say the probability of dumpster fire might not be as good as the resurrection. We'll put LPP's dumpster fire like 0.96. But make your way on over there after this if you want to. Let's get on to the next question. I think this is for both of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's good. Only losers won't come to the after show. All right, so question for both of you guys. Do ERVs in similar areas of coding sequence because of similar pressure and similar purpose. ERVs seem to be no more evidence of common descent than of common design. Same pressure, same region. Uh, well, you could make certain arguments that it is, uh, I guess, agnostic for things like function. Yeah, it, it could go either way. Um, but again, the the thing that really differentiates it is the uh, the viral elements that, you know, uh, viral exclusive elements that we know are from viruses, um, or if you prefer tra uh, transposable elements, um, like you said, sometimes the uh, there are more or less uh, parts of the virus where. The fact that it looks like an ERV is important in it's it expressing itself in cancer cells so that it, it can be detected and will target cancer cells. Uh, this is to be expected. Um, if there's an infection, it, a different, uh, an added genome can tag things to be differently, uh, to look differently. Um, but, uh, other, other things like the, the mammal-required uh, placental ERV, it doesn't have to mimic an ERV. Um, so there are certain uh, parts of the genome that are not necessary but still mark it as an ERV, and that's how we're able to identify them as separate parts. They're, they're, these aren't just random pieces of the genome that we're deciding had to have come from viruses. They have specific tags. Um and um, yeah, all the papers you're referencing are have been reviewed by evolutionary biologists, and they come to uh, the conclusion that they are evolved. Like the one you quoted about uh, mammalian uh, 
ERVs is about the evolution of retroviruses. Um, we should go into detail about that study. Uh, there should be a round two. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I guess I started off my statement saying there are thing, there are uh, functional elements which could be agnostic, which could be designed. The thing that is not agnostic to this debate is the... Uh, the likelihoods that these elements are transposed to the locations that they are is uh, basically zero. So, and we haven't really addressed that at all. Okay. <clears throat> well, I appreciate that response. Um, first thing I want to add is <laughs> I'm choking. That's the first thing I want to add is <coughs> The evolutionists keep saying that, that these are expected, but then they admit that they never predicted the function. So uh, how are these things expected if they, they never predicted the embryological uh, developmental requirements, essentially, of, of these retrotransposons? And I saw someone in the chat. Yeah, uh, apparently the, the technical way of saying ERV is ERV. Their ERVs or uh, ALU sequences, ALU. Uh, but oftentimes it is easier just to say ERV, endogenous retrovirus. But <clears throat> yeah, so the evolutionists never predicted. They, and, and I'll go on record saying they retrofitted the data. And of course, the authors of, of, this, of these papers are not going to conclude, okay, special creation. I mean, that's off the table. Okay, they, they are required. Sure, they can question some details of the evolutionary story, but they can't question uh, the bigger picture. They can't conclude, well, okay, you know, this must mean they're created units of DNA function. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that paper wouldn't be published. That's why they say things like motors or engines of evolution, positive selection. That's not telling us how an endogenous retroviral-like element can go from what they once assumed was junk to something incredibly functional in the immune system. I mean, I find this so funny. So apparently <clears throat> we were invaded by exogenous retroviruses which today endogenous retroviruses fight against, protect us against. So these exogenous retroviruses got passed down vertically, became endogenized, and eventually uh, evolved the ability to fight off that which they were before. I mean, that sounds to me kind of bizarre. Okay, a lot of this is just fanciful storytelling. It, it's a fairy tale. And here in this question, if I'm understanding it correctly, <clears throat> I want to urge creationists. Taylor does have a point. If we are saying that these are actually the result of ancient viral infection. Some creationists uh, hold that position. And I wouldn't recommend that because Taylor is right. We share a lot of these sequences or even uh, fragments with the chimpanzees. And so it's very unlikely that, that we independently experienced the uh, invasion of, of these viruses in um, similar positions. Okay. You know, one, given the amount of locations in the genome is somewhere like one in a million. So if you go into 200, 300, <clears throat> it's, it's even more than that, of course, because that's not what the evidence suggests anyways. The fact is the mutations that we find in the structure of the endogenous retroviral elements, like the LTRs, yeah, that can be due to environmental pressures. We know mutations are not as random as once expected or predicted. No, mutations are essentially, a lot of them are non-random. Okay, we also know that evolutionists assume all DNA differences are the result of mutations over time. So a lot of these DNA differences are, you know, quote unquote mutations in the properties of the ERV, like the LTRs that form these nested hierarchical patterns, may not even be uh, the result of mutations. They may be uh, functional differences that are required for the respective uh, organism. So anyways, I, I could talk all day, but I'll, I'll just say, you know what, as a creationist, we should go with what the evidence suggests. And the evidence suggests that these are created units of DNA function. If a creationist wants to say that these are the result of uh, ancient infections or even infections thousands of years ago, now the creationist is stuck in the same position as the evolutionist. How do you explain the functional roles? How did those, uh, you know, uh, get adopted essentially? So uh, I'll yield there. Good question. Anything you want to add to that, Taylor? Um, so uh, in that paper you were talking about, they there are conserved sequences of the ERVs and non-conserved sequences. So they, they're using that to track basically uh, the, the lineage of a certain ERV, which 
I mean, there's different levels of this. So there's the shared ERVs, and then within those shared ERVs, there are even further differences um, that aren't seen in the conserved domains. Um, and the the point there is the highly variable regions are essentially not functional because they're so highly variable, um, uh, especially LTRs. But um, well, actually, Taylor, uh, to, since that was a question for both. Can I just respond to one we, thing and then I I have one okay. more thing to respond to. Sure, um, as far yeah. as um, what was it? My I kind of derailed my train of thought there. Um, so. Yeah, go go ahead. As if if I can, uh, I'll get my train of thought back. But you can go ahead. <laughs> Apolo yeah. Apologies, I almost forgot what I was going to respond to. Okay, so the conserved versus non-conserved regions. Okay, when you find these conserved regions, let's say let's say we just stick with ERVs, ERV sequences. If we find an ERV sequence in let's say humans and chimpanzees that's nearly identical, or um, conserved as you could put it evolutionists say well you know these are we have these conserved sections of dna in humans and mice because they're, they're essential they're they're important so selection has essentially conserved or preserved them over time but here's the thing an, an irv sequence in humans that say has to deal with uh determining cell types or or uh, regulating genes but specifically we're focusing on you know similarities in morphology or anatomy, that ERV sequence is going to be very uh, similar anyways. And um, that so that, that could be interpreted as conserved. But then non-conserved regions, that doesn't mean that it's non-functional. It just means there's also some parts or aspects to the gene expression pathway found in humans that's a lot um, more dissimilar to chimpanzees. So we would expect that those would, the evolutionists would say those are non-conserved. No, they're different because humans also have a lot of differences with the chimpanzees. And so those those functional uh, differences would, would reflect in the sequences as well. And, and the DNA differences in those sequences, the evolutionists might say are due to mutations over time. But maybe those differences are actually there because they're reflecting functional differences between humans and chimpanzees. So that was kind of a mouthful, but I'll, I'll yield there. Go ahead, Taylor. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the thing I, I lost my train of thought on was the the idea that, um, oh, I'm losing it again, <laughs> It's I'm going back, what were you saying, uh, the being able to, uh, you said that we're just kind of accommodating the data, so uh, I guess I wanted to clarify um yeah, so it wasn't predicted necessarily the that ERVs had a sp specific function, but it is it's not unexpected. Like they weren't surprised or caught off guard that ERVs had the specific functions that they did because they already knew that viral elements had that function of uh, they can regulate themselves, they can disrupt genes. In fact, that is one of the causal elements of why uh, so many retroviruses can cause cancers is because they interrupt uh, cell division regulatory genes, um, apoptosis regulatory genes, uh, which is programmed cell death. Uh, so when we confirmed what, like, we're not going to be able to predict everything about the genome because of uh, basic Darwinistic mechanisms. So there's always going to be something to discover. Um, but it it's always in line with what we know about what the already knew what the functions that viruses are capable of have. So we're not seeing things like, um, I don't know, like a like a blood coagulant or like an antifreeze gene coming off of the uh, these things that apparently look like ERVs, um, we're seeing virus-related functions. So, uh, yeah, and just to kind of liken it to uh, crime scene investigation, we're not going to say, well, it looks like the victim has been stabbed with a knife, but he could have just been born with a knife in his chest. 
we're going to say, okay, we know knives can get there by the process of stabbing. Same thing we're doing with the ERVs. We know that they can get, we know that it looks exactly like this when retroviruses insert themselves. So, uh, and a lot of the functions are not related to needing the entire retroviral uh, suite of traits. Um, and that's why there's such a highly variable region. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so it seems like that question alone could have been a whole other debate. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. A whole well, I just want to ask one simple question, and then we can move on. Are are you going on record saying that exogenous retroviruses they can accomplish many crucial crucial functions such as regulating gene expression, cell differentiation, and embryological development? Is that your position? Uh, they have yeah that they have the ability to regulate or disrupt genes that they insert into <laughs> disrupt we've seen but mm -hmm. we have not seen an exogenous retrovirus integrate itself into the genome be passed on vertically to be essential in embryological development to the point where we could say wow if it wasn't for that retro transposon we couldn't exist show me a technical paper on that send it to me after or it, you know i i'm going to call a bluff on that one taylor uh, but we have seen is that their their ability to regulate the genes that they're part of or inside um, of or bordering. So we've, we've observed the turning on and off of genes. Uh, the, the, these exogenous retroviruses involving themselves in, in the gene expression pathway, you're saying? We've, we've observed this? Uh, yeah, that's what they do. Okay, so what's a technical paper that, that shows an exogenous retrovirus infiltrating the, the cell and, <laughs> and then um, adopting a function where it actually helps in gene regulation, cell differentiation, expression, things like that? Like we've observed this in the lab, you're saying? Um, well, uh, when you're going highly specific laboratory experiment that includes a beneficial necessary retroviral insertion uh i can look for one for you we can have around two um, but as far as the functions uh, regulatory functions are and as far as the fact that we can tell what uh dna elements are inserted and transposed uh yeah we um using the evidence that they are, in fact, retrovirus infections, we can tell that certain uh, viruses or certain ERVs necessary for development are were the result of infections. Um, as far as us accomplishing this in the lab, uh, I'll have to search for one for you. But Well, we see these ERV sequences that you say are genomic fossils, right? Brandon's laughing, never ending. We see that they function in turning genes on and off. That's what gene regulation is essentially, okay? And we know that uh, gene regulation is incredibly important in, in uh, development. And these genes are often turned on and off based on the presence or non-presence of these ERV-like sequences. So we see that, we see that they function that way, but we don't see exogenous retroviruses invade the cell and then evolve that function. That we don't see. So it sounds like to me, you're, you're seeing the, the functions in the endogenous retroviral-like sequences and assuming, well, the exogenous retroviruses may already have the built-in capacity for that function. Is that essentially what you're saying? Well, we know that they do have the built-in capacity to regulate to regulate the host genes in helping with development, turning genes on and off. We know that. Uh, if it happens to affect a gene that ha is involved in uh, development, 
Well, let's see that. And, sure. and we're just, I'm just asking, let's see that. Let's see a pay. I want to, because all I ever see is engines of evolution, positive selection. We don't see, okay, you know, here's an empirical example and observable and example of an exogenous retrovirus integrated into the cell being passed down vertically. And now, wow, look at this. It's, it's critically functional for the, the organism. You know, I, I don't believe we see that. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And we do, but I would just have to have you prove that to me is what I'm saying. Yeah, um, but that what I'm saying is that's an unreasonable standard of evidence because we already know that redundancies and um, uh, dependencies can evolve. And we already know ERVs that's not can an insert, answer, though. We already know that they can regulate. And we know where we these we know that these elements come from. I think we'll save that one for round two. Huh? Round two. Yeah. yeah, it's a good it's a good topic. And this has been enjoyable, Taylor. I appreciate we, we it. We could we could yeah. make it just on that mammal paper. Well, we here's a, here's a question that might uh, that might lead you into that about mammals and endogenous endogenous retroviruses inserting themselves. The question states if we see similarities in monkeys, would we then find some of the endogenous retroviruses to be in other mammals like whales? We do find directed towards you, Taylor. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry for we do out. have some similarities with whales, yeah. As far as the RVs go. Um, like you said, a lot of these are mammalian specific, uh, which all mammals share. And there there's a uh, phylogenetic tree, a, a nested hierarchy, um, that shows the same relationship as is predicted by evolutionary biology. Uh, through morphology. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> ERV sequences are, are abundant in jawed vertebrates, mammals, obviously, and in primates. We're talking specifically here about um, the primates and how these ERV-like sequences do fall out into a, um, a nested hierarchy as well as their uh, mutations. A lot of the times in the structure of these ERVs, they also fall into a, a hierarchy. But here's the thing, again, going back to the beginning of the debate, is what we're looking at in terms of these so-called genomic fossils, are we really looking at the ancient remnants of viral infections? I'm saying no. Or are they created units of DNA function? That I'm saying yes to. And we can predict function. Evolutionists admit that they never predicted it, but they say over and over again that we expected it. Okay. Well, if you didn't predict it and essentially you're retrofitting the data and all their papers never actually say how these functions were co-opted or came about, they just make the claim. They just assert co-option, rapid evolution, engines of evolution, so on and so forth. But they, they don't actually give a, an empirical reason for uh, a creationist to believe. Okay. You know, non-functional uh, properties of, of the endogenous retroviral element or unit, uh, you know, went from, from non-functional to something incredibly functional in determining cell types, gene expression, so on and so forth. And again, the question, the follow-up question by the evolutionist is, well, why do they resemble exogenous retroviruses? Why do they have, you know, LTRs and the gag gene, the pole gene, um, and, and the uh, envelope protein, for example? And it's like, we just had a paper in either 2021 or 2022 that, that I showed earlier that demonstrates that these properties and the structure of the ERV is required for its purpose and job. I mean, that's perfectly compatible with the creation model. And the evolutionists can reject it and say, well, no, we were invaded by a virus. And then the virus became an endogenous retrovirus as it was passed on vertically. And then it evolved the ability to fight off that which it used to be. I mean, to me, that just sounds ridiculous. When it comes to the hierarchy, of course, if these are created units of DNA function, okay, this should be basic to anybody, then of course we are going to share more for example, humans and chimpanzees, we are going to share more of these ERV sequences with the chimpanzee than we're going to with the mouse or a whale, okay? Because we already share more with the chimpanzee in terms of morphology, anatomy, physiology, and genetics. A sedan is going to, by definition, share more features with the SUV than it is with a, a bicycle or a plane. Just stand back, look at the... Um, 
the structures and, and anybody can, can predict that. So the nested hierarchies that we find are agnostic. What's not agnostic is the function. That is my position. I am making the claim that DNA function can help differentiate between the models. Ancient viral infections, created units of DNA function, repredict function, evolutionists, although they've had to retrofit the data, they predict these are evolutionary leftovers. Okay? And so they would predict non-function. They'll still predict most of them are non-functional, even though that, that logically has been, has been overturned. So I believe the DNA function and the lack of response from the evolutionists in explaining the DNA function is the fatal blow to, the, uh, to their interpretation of, of the endogenous retroviruses. I yield there. Taylor? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the nested hierarchies are agnostic until you get to transitional forms that connect all the separate hierarchies. Uh, and like when, what you were saying about um, the the cancer regulation ERVs that need um, more of the viral elements, that's a completely different mechanism from the mammalian uh, developmental ERVs that do not um, and do not need to uh, resemble um, vi a virus. That's related to regulation, not immune development. Um, and then the final point, I guess, is just uh, prediction versus expectation. So it wasn't, uh, we didn't predict the functions. We investigated the functions. So, um, and then we didn't predict non-function. It was more just a lack of, we don't know what they do. We're, we're not predicting what they do. Um, so they investigated what it does. Um, but all functions were within expectations of what viruses function as. Um, so don't, uh, I don't want people to confuse uh, expected virus function with a prediction that a specific ERV is going to function in a specific way. Interesting. Um, I do have a question from Dustin. Um, it's a little tough to read. I don't know if you can see this, Donnie. I asked him to rephrase it in the comment section a while back, but let's see what you guys can make of this. He says, where does the line lie as far as an inherent genetic trait and a new something that develop. I know that sounded kind of choppy, but again, he says, where does the line lie as far as an inherent genetic trait and new ones that develop? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that says. I can't. For example, Ooh. alcohol was once thought to be passed down, but not every ancestor had access to alcohol. Does that make any sense to you guys? The line between inherent genetic trait and new ones that develop. Um, as <laughs> if I try and understand that as far as the evolutionary perspective, uh, there isn't a line because new traits that develop are derived from inherited genetic traits. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, the enzyme to metabolize alcohol is what he's talking about. It, it's possible. I don't know what a wan is. The W O N S. I don't know what wands are. So I don't, maybe can you make sense of that, Donnie. You maybe got... he's talking about um, the difference between uh, genetic traits that we all share and and traits that have been regionally adapted. Yeah, I don't see him in the chat anymore. Maybe he left. So if I mean. If you got anything to say on that, Donnie, feel free. If not, we can we can uh, <laughs> skip that one. <laughs> yeah, let's move on to the last one or two because we're coming at the two and a half hour mark, and I'm getting pretty exhausted at this point. Very well, this interesting is, technical debate. So this, this is, is the last one here from Bubble Gun. Um, Bubble Gum Gun. It's a little tongue in cheek, but this is more of a statement to the both of you. He says, how convenient that these ERVs found just the right spot to insert themselves to later in the future become necessary. Such foresight from that virus. Uh, 
yeah so that's not as i've explained that's not really how it works so the the fact that something is necessary is not an indication that it was ever the only necessary element or the only uh, part of the genome that served that function. We know there are biological um, redundancies. We know the mechanisms by which you can gain a redundancy and then lose that redundancy, but the part of the genome supporting that function changes because there is a redundancy. Uh, it's like if you have, uh, I don't know, two different uh, ways to support, like my computer is supported by a couple of books right now. I'm putting it up high. If I put another book in there and I take another book out, it's still supported. Um, so it's not the second book having the foresight to be necessary there and there are a lot of uh, ERVs that are not necessary uh, and in fact are still harmful. So, so much that could be said there. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, hinder myself from from a monologue, but um, I, I think Bubblegum Gun nails it there, where it it must be convenient that the essentially these deleterious exogenous retroviral infections um, invaded the genome, invaded the cell, invaded in, in the right spot to uh, be passed on vertically and eventually become an endogenous retrovirus. The offspring um, would, would have this viral DNA in every single one of itself. And then eventually it also adopts, co-ops, evolves the uh, essential functions necessary for humans to even exist okay uh essential in embryological development snip out that certain class of retrotransposon and although the mouse is developing bam you snip it out it dies okay in evolution when they talk about uh, redundancy they'll often uh, talk about it in a different way than we would okay redundancy is evidence of, of forward thinking. Anybody who does computer code understands that, okay? Or let's say a spare tire in, in the back of your car. Well, to the evolutionist, that might be redundant. Like, why is that there? I've already got four tires and they work just great. But you know what? If the environmental condition arises where you get a flat tire, thank God you got that uh, that spare, okay? But what's, what's funny about that is once you use that spare, okay, that's it. You're even even uh, redundancy can only go so far because mutation like treading on your tires. Every time you go out driving, you are ruining the, the, the treading and eventually you'll you'll need new tires. Now it's there. It, it, it's redundant. It's there for wear and tear, but it can only last for so long. OK, any any computer coder can tell you redundancy is evidence of forward thinking. The evolutionists, though, they look to redundancy and essentially they give evolutionary mechanisms a mind. Because they'll say, well, these neutral mutations, which we know is false, we know they're they're uh, nearly neutral, effectively neutral, slightly deleterious. They build up over time and they become like a hidden reservoir of genetic change. Where at some point, this quote unquote redundancy or genetic baggage can be called upon through mutations, neo-functionalization, co-option, whatever, co-option when it comes to the, the herbs. And, uh, and, and they can become beneficial, okay? Now, th this hasn't been observed, specifically with the ERV sequences. We haven't observed the types of functions that we see. The evolutionists never predicted it. And they'll admit, no, we never predicted it. You know, we used to assume that, that, that these were uh, the junk, useless, and now we know that, that they are uh, functional in tumor suppression, gene regulation, antiviral function, okay? Again, I want to point out, it sounds silly, to anybody who thinks about it logically, that these viruses invaded the organism and then eventually evolved the ability to fight off that which they were. <laughs> it's like a robber breaking into your house, but deciding to live there for some reason has an agreement with, with uh, you know, the, the people that live there and own the house at the time and, and decides to just 
have a change of life. He repented and now he's going to fight off future robbers from breaking into the house. It's just, it's ridiculous. And a lot of this, it's storytelling, it's imagination. You know, we want the empirical evidence. We want the technical uh, data. And we just focused on ERVs tonight for the most part. But I mean, we can talk about uh, all sorts of, of function for, for what was once assumed to be uh, junk DNA. Nucleoskeletal hypothesis is fascinating. I talked about it with Dr. Fazrana in my two-part series with him. Uh, these so-called uh, junk DNA regions are acting as a mutational buffer. They're maintaining the 3D structure, which, which is amazing. It's like, the, the, this just came about for, for no reason because of uh, the buildup of neutral mutations, regulate histone binding, gene regulation, the pseudogenes code for uh, functional proteins. So I'll, I'll end it there. I, I just think that the whole uh, model of these neutral mutations building up to the point where they can be called upon for um, beneficial change or novelty. I, I think that that's more in theory or, or even just a hypothesis which, which without any real uh, solid supporting evidence. So I guess we'll give Snake, I think the question was for Snake. He can have the last word. Yeah, so we have an anti-fragile genome, which basically means um, that uh, you can mess with it a little bit. Um, some, some mutations are worse than others. Um, but we get along just fine with uh, some instability where uh, we have certain things like um, like with cancer. Um, there are certain things that are, are cancer causing, but we can get along with them for a while and then cancer hits an old age. Um, so uh, some instability where ERVs can cause uh, cancer. Um, we can live with those mutations. Um, and then there are some ERVs that cause instability in cancer causing uh, genes uh, that um, interrupt those or combat them in some way um, by tagging them, or they can also, uh, uh, they can upregulate or downregulate genes. And the fact that we see both is more consistent and, pro and actually exclusive to evolutionary mechanisms um, uh, because this is like this is more consistent with the hit or miss type of uh, method of evolution because we're seeing from the same uh, genetic elements viral elements we're seeing both beneficial and deleterious uh, effects um, Upregulating, up, up regulating, down regulating. Uh, out of the thousands of ERVs we have, there are uh, literally just a handful of, uh, like one or two, that are absolutely necessary. Um, so, and all of the rest of them are not. Um, so that's way more consistent with the kind of shotgun approach of evolution where most of these are going to hit in places that are really not going to do much. They're going to be basically neutral. We're going to see all uh, their function all over the place, um, going up and down, um, beneficial, uh, deleterious. That's not what we're going to see if we're looking at a perfectly designed genome. So, um, and then let's not forget that even in the best case, these are transposable elements that could not have possibly ended up in the same locations. Um, yeah. Is, Is that, that it? it? <laughs> Is that our final question? <laughs> we made it. Two and a half hours on just ERVs. I think that's, that's pretty, you know, Snake, this might be the most comprehensive debate on endogenous retroviruses that, that exists. And I think this is an important topic. And I, for one, want to do more of these types of debates where we focus on one line of argument as compared to some of these debates where it's just a shotgun of, of arguments that, that we deal with. ERVs is an incredibly important topic, incredibly technical topic. And I'm glad that we had such a great audience on, on a very technical topic. So, of course, let's do a round two where we can go over uh, some of the papers brought up, some of the arguments. Yeah, um, like I, I would I would even say 
we go even more specific, like just talk about certain, like one or two, a handful of papers at a time within a, at a very highly specific topic. So, because because at this point we've had the same like oh evolution versus creation debates like hundreds of times so i think the audience is ready for amen a little amen. deep let's, deeper dive there yeah let's uh let's give them the meat and potatoes so yeah uh ervs is uh to the evolutionist the uh one of some say that the number one best evidence for evolution. So as a, as a creationist, I think, uh, you know, we should be tackling these, these types of debates and arguments. And I really, really enjoy this. I think this was a ton of fun snake. I'll send you, uh, a, maybe a, a few of the papers that, that I brought up. You can look through them and, and pick which one you want to discuss specifically. And we'll, we'll do some type of follow-up discussion on, on those. So again, Taylor, thanks so much. Brandon, great job moderating, brother. You're a superstar. You're the man with the plan. Very impressive. So listen, so next time you guys debate, it's going to be a rigid timer. I'm going to bring a blowhorn. <laughs> and that's it. We had a kind of a second debate there at the end. Yeah, you did. We did. You yeah, did. That, I'm not sure who, who asked that question, but uh, kudos to you. <laughs> uh, your one question was a ripple effect into a whole nother debate. <laughs> Brandon, go ahead as host, uh, closer down with, with some closing words, thoughts, jokes. You know, I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, but. Man, I got to tell you, I, I actually learned a lot from that debate, uh, not just from Donnie, but you as well, Taylor. I, I think you're, you know, pretty well read in the topic and not a lot of people are. It's, just, it's one of those uh, niche topics that's tough to get into. Um, and in, in, and kind of stay, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. Like to keep it interesting where, you know, people don't find that topic interesting like some of the other things do, but it is really important. Like SFT mentioned a few times. So I appreciate the debate. I learned quite a bit uh, from the both of you. I think a, a second debate is going to be excellent. Um, I'd like to read some of the, uh, you know, studies both of you have looked at. I think it's some pretty good talking points and, Something I'm definitely interested. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to run too long. I guess I'll just remind everybody again, head over on the LPP's channel. If you want to experience what it's like to stand on the surface of the sun in a blazing inferno, you can have <laughs> that, that over there. <laughs> For me, I'm going to get some food and, uh, you know, get some beverages in me. And then I may just uh, head on over there after. Uh, this was a fun, engaging technical debate. So I'm definitely going to uh, relax for a bit and an important debate. So I appreciate the the prep, obviously, that, that you know, Taylor put into this because to make for a nearly three hour debate on ERVs is, is pretty awesome. And I had a ton of fun. So those are my final words. Uh, Taylor, final words from you. Yeah, it uh, depends on what the the ladies in my house uh, are feeling. Whether I, my my dog and my girlfriend, uh, if I go over to the after show or not. But uh, yeah, they're they're the boss for now. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Snake. Thank you so much to the audience for tuning in. I appreciate some some great um, engagement in, in the chat. Although I was debating, I didn't see a lot of it, but I look forward to uh, rewatching and, and getting some, I'm sure, laughs from the uh, from the side chat. One quick reminder, this Friday, we've got uh, Matt Slick, the great Trinity debate. He's taken on Otis Lewis. And on the Thursday, we've got the uh, the epic round two between uh, Kent Hovind and Wade the Wizard. So there's three heroic debates for you guys this week. So lots of fun. Make sure you're subscribed if you're not yet subscribed. And share around this content and uh, share around this debate. It's an important topic, and I think this one was a ton of fun. So anyways, God bless. Saying for Truth is out.
right, looks like we are live for the SFT Creation versus Evolution podcast. This is episode two. I've got Andrew C., aka, AKA a rational empiricist, here with me. Uh, I do want to thank everybody in the audience for being here for our late night podcast show on the creation versus evolution topic. Uh, Andrew, good to have you here. I appreciate you be, being willing to engage in, in these important discussions. Andrew, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing good. Thanks for uh, having me on. I'm uh, glad I could make it to this discussion and glad to see everyone the the chat willing to come here and uh, listen to, to both positions and uh, I guess mine in particular, since I'm the, the, uh, you're in the hot seat, <laughs> right, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're the evolution. I blanked out on the word there for a second. Listen, you found it. We found it together. And yeah. again, I appreciate you uh, doing this. I appreciate all of the uh, late night party animals in the chat, no matter what time we go live. We've got a solid audience to enjoy these, these important discussions. So if anybody is wondering, uh, you know, we have been hosting so many debates on all sorts of topics, theology, soteriology, creation, evolution, nature of God, so on and so forth, that uh, for myself, when it comes to uh, engaging in, in these dialogues with those of differing views, since I obviously moderate uh, these debates as we host them. So what I'm doing is this podcast series. So a couple of weeks ago, I had uh, evolutionist Ken Rock here, and the uh, topic was specifically ancestry. If you've not yet seen that, it is linked in the description box. Ton of fun. Uh, you know, we went over two hours. It was comprehensive and touched on a lot of good topics. Uh, so here's episode two. I've got a rational empiricist here, my arch nemesis. So, uh, you know, that's kind of an inside thing we have going on, but it also makes it uh, fun for the audience. So, uh, you know, there's no um, secret that, that I'm a creationist. You're an evolutionist. Yeah. And uh, the topic specifically tonight is going to be endogenous retroviruses, which is perfect because uh, Andrew's favorite book these days, the Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook, uh, written, <laughs> written by me. Uh, this is good for, uh, you know, review and just kind of in engaging, um, you know, some of the criticisms and objections in a sophisticated way. So, Andrew, before we get into it, let me just uh, address these super yep. stickers, super chats. Doki Doki Bible Club, the super sticker master. Appreciate it, brother. And uh, George Bond, $10 super chat from Australia. Appreciate it. Uh, Doki Doki is back. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby is right. So, Andrew, you know what? Before we um, kind of get right into the topic, why don't we, um, for the audience's sake, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, uh, sure. you're no stranger. You've been here before for informal debates and things like that. But, uh, yeah, a little bit about yourself. What's going on? Yeah, so my name is Andrew, aka uh, go by a rational empiricist. Um, currently a community college student uh, here in California. Uh, I enjoy studying different topics related to biology, geology, astronomy, whatever I can get my hands on, whatever subjects, books I can get. Um, you should see my library. <laughs> um, but basically, yeah, I'm here to take the position that ERVs are evidence for universe or common ancestry, specifically universal common ancestry, at uh, the very most common ancestry between all primates. I guess we could talk about that position specifically. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I think that is not really that much to me besides that. So what you're saying, Andrew, is you're a jack of all trades, biology, genetics, astronomy, yeah, geology, you do it all. You do it all, which is why you're perfect for this debate community that we have going on. So, uh, you know, as, as a debater in formal or informal uh, platforms and, and format, uh, it's good to have a, a wide range of knowledge on, oh, yeah, on all definitely. different topics. Okay, well, why don't we... Um, 
why don't we start it off this way? So since obviously we have uh, differing views on the topic of ancestry and specifically uh, endogenous retroviruses as they apply to the ancestry debate, right? Do the existence of endogenous retroviruses and uh, even the nested hierarchies that they fall out into in uh, sequences and in mutations, right. are they better explained by the separate ancestry model or the universal ancestry model? So what I want to do, Andrew, since you are uh, my guest for tonight, and again, I thank you for that. Uh, let's hand it to you. No time limit, no rush. Just kind of go over your position for the audience's sake. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about ERVs if you'd like to, and why sure. you believe uh, they're best explained by evolution. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I guess from the common ancestry perspective, or I guess the, the more mainstream biology perspective uh, paradigm, ERVs, aka endogenous retroviruses, are viral DNA elements that are inserted uh, into the, the host genome uh, in an ancestral species. And if that ancestral species happens to, or, sorry, I should say ancestral individual within a population, and that ERV uh, fixes within the population, uh, depending on whether or not it makes it to uh, fixation. And from there, if the population within uh, of that species happens to split into different populations, the ERV is carried along with it, inherited, we would say. And basically, from there, we get this natural nested hierarchy of ERVs within some lineages and ERV, different ERVs in other lineages. Um, basically from my position, the way we know that ERVs are among other things, viral insertions, uh, is the fact that the, the genes, I should say, complete ERVs contain, uh, include the POL gene, the GAG gene going out of order here, uh, but yeah, the GAG gene, POL gene, and ENV gene, and those are usually found in retroviruses. Um, more than that, we also have the long terminal repeats, aka LTRs, at the uh, opposite, I guess, ends of the, the gene section, basically for lack of a better phrase there. Um, and apart from that, uh, Beside those LTRs, we also have what are called target site duplications. So basically, these are markers of where integrase, one of the retroviral proteins, uh, kind of snips the DNA in two, and that is where it kind of patches itself into the host genome, essentially. You get these two repeating DNA segments on either end. Um, I guess that's kind of the, the background of ERVs and a the reason I think they support common ancestry, our strong support for common ancestry, is the nested hierarchy, for one. Uh, there are kind of nested hierarchies within nested hierarchies here. Basically, the, the ERVs have shared locations, what we'd call homologous lo loci, between different species. Um, and those fall into a, that distribution falls into a nested hierarchy. And as you kind of mentioned earlier, uh, SFT, the shared mutations within these loci also fall into a nested hierarchy. Um, and that, uh, among other things, is kind of the, the main evidence uh, that supports common ancestry coming from ERVs. And I, I guess one other thing would be that the, these nested hierarchies happen to support or uh, are consistent with the nested hierarchies derived from other molecular sources of evidence, say pseudogenes and uh, other genomic regions. And I, I think that has to be mentioned also because they could have happened to be different, but they're not. So I guess I'll leave it there. That's what I find to be the strongest evidence. And we can go from there as the discussion progresses. Appreciate that, uh, Andrew. Um, before I kind of give my thoughts on it, uh, 
in its entirety. You mentioned uh, nested hierarchies within a greater nested hierarchy. I find that interesting. And uh, for the audience sake, um, it, it might be good to, to define some, some of these more technical terms. What sure. do you mean exactly by, let's say, a nested hierarchy, but more specifically, hierarchies within a hierarchy? Right, yeah. So um, a nested hierarchy essentially just means groups within groups. So if we're looking at uh, these, the say, the, the pattern of traits between species, we can uh, arrange them or... Uh, this would be so good if I had a, an image to share here, but it make things easier, but I'll, I'll try my best here. Um, basically, we can say, okay, all mammals, for example, have hair, among other features. Uh, within the larger clade um, grouping of, say, vertebrates, all vertebrates have bony vertebrae, among other things, a, a backbone, essentially. Um and within all animals, for example, have certain traits, uh, including non-vertebrates, that vertebrates share with them. So you kind of have this organization where these distinguishing traits um, connect groupings uh, within other larger groupings based on more distantly shared traits. Um, uh, uh, the technical term for these traits is called synapomorphies. Um, shared unique traits, I like to often call them. But yeah, that's a, essentially what a nested hierarchy is, a group or a system of groups within groups, basically. Um, and what I, to the other question, what I mean by hierarchies within hierarchies is essentially we can have a sort of uh, a hierarchy, nested hierarchy derived from one line of evidence, say, the shared location of these ERBs, depending on the species. Uh, we can also have a nested hierarchy derived from the shared mutations within those ERVs. And essentially what I mean by hierarchy among hierarchies is these different layers of evidence for the same feature, essentially, uh, corroborate each other. And like I said earlier, they also corroborate uh, other lines of evidence, say morphology, and uh, other sources of molecular data. So that's what I basically mean by hierarchies here. I Again, that's uh, probably informative. No, that's good. That's a great explanation. And um, so essentially what you'd be saying, like if we were to, as everybody understands, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, we have these, as you put it, groups within groups patterns where humans can be grouped with, let's say the great apes in the great ape family right? Individual species like the human species, the chimpanzee species, where they can also be grouped together as primates, grouped as mammals, vertebrates with, you know, what the evolutionists would say or taxonomists, a human, right? Being a human ape and like a chimpanzee and a gorilla being non-human apes. Humans and the great apes share more in terms of morphology, genetics, anatomy, and physiology than, let's say, uh, the old world monkeys, uh, fish, dogs, all the way down the line, um, I guess, in, in, in its most basic form. Would you say, uh, Andrew, that's an accurate representation? Yeah, I, I think so. Like I said, it gets kind of a, a bit more nuanced by the fact that Linnaean taxonomy isn't uh, as uh, cut and dry as we'd like it to be nowadays. And the fact that I mentioned these shared derived traits is what they're called. Um, there, there's another discussion to be had basically between using shared derived traits and using shared, what we call ancestral or primitive traits. Um, but yeah, that's a, a, a fair representation of what a nested hierarchy represents. And those shared derived traits would be the shared derived somapomorphies that you're talking about, correct? Yeah, synapomorphies. The, the shared uh, ancestral traits would technically be called plesiomorphies. Right, right. And there are other, other morphies besides that, but those are the, the two uh, main categories. So you would say, because you were pointing out uh, these multiple independent phylogenies that can be derived based on the evidence for endogenous retroviruses, right? Not only the hierarchies that the ERV elements fall out into, 
but also the hierarchies that the mutations found in the properties of the ERV element, like the LTRs, for example, right? You're talking about the long terminal repeats. There's another independent uh, phylogeny that you're saying is best explained by common descent. Uh, is right, that correct, right. Andrew? Yeah. yeah, basically you can find, um, you, you could have found these shared ERV distributions could have supported a, a hierarchy where chimps and humans were not cl as closely related as say chimps and gorillas but obviously that's not the case we find that the shared locations and shared mutations point to this group of chimps and humans within a a larger grouping of apes within a larger grouping of primates etc so yeah they they corroborate the same general order of branching so you're saying hierarchies within the great apes hierarchies within primates, hierarchies within mammals, hierarchies within vertebrates. Right. Okay. So that's where we get the groups within groups patterns. Right. I should um, make a, a, a kind of note here that at a certain distant relationship or uh, as you go bar, uh, back on the, the evolutionary tree, um, eventually these ERVs have been mutated to such a point that they uh, the the groupings kind of falls away. So this is why we don't find shared ERVs, uh, or, or for the most part, we don't find shared ERVs between, say, all fish, for example, because there has been, according to the evolutionary model, there has just been so much time for since their last common ancestor. Uh, this divergence has caused the ERVs to essentially wither away um, or to, to basically become unrecognizable. So it's it's only useful for uh, certain groupings, but it, it does, I, I guess you could say, compared to the creationist model, it would show that what would usually be called kinds are have these shared ERVs in common. So I guess that's one point that could be made that it, it ends at a certain point, but either way it shows that uh, these kinds have some kind of thing going on basically. So would you then say, Andrew, that you're taxonomically restricted endogenous retroviruses? Let's focus on just humans. So your herbs, right. human endogenous retroviruses. Would you say that we would expect, based on the common descent model, that those herb sequences would be more so complete than what you would say is a shared herb sequence between a more distant common ancestor, let's say humans and, and a mouse? Yeah, generally speaking, we can find that for um, uh, the, the LTR sequences, for example, according to the evolutionary model, they, the two LTR sequences on opposite ends of the ERV sequence um, start out identical mm -hmm. and diverge, become more disc, uh, different from each other over time. So yeah, generally speaking, the more time has passed, the more patients they accumulate as well, many other regions of the genome for that matter. Okay, so you're talking about the LTRs, the long terminal repeats, right? Right. Is that basically when they go in looking for the for, for an endogenous retrovirus and also shared herb sequences, right? When it comes to the hallmark signs that they would be looking to or looking for to say, okay, here here's either a complete herb or here's a, a degenerated herb, right? right? An incomplete herb, just pieces of the herb, I guess. Is it the LTRs that that would be the main sign or, or hallmark of an ERV? Is that essentially what, what they're looking for in these genetic sequencing? Uh, it's it's one thing, like you, like you said, if, if it's a complete ERV, for example, you'd obviously be looking for the retroviral genes among uh, along with the LTR sequences. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, you also have to, or you, you're generally looking for the, the flanking DNA sequences beyond the LTRs, kind of like the if, if the uh, integration is basically a, an event where a scar has occurred, you're looking for the regions of tissue around the scar that kind of tell you where that, uh, that scar is located, basically. And in this case, some of those sequences would be these target site duplications. 
um, which are kind of uh, for the audience, are these uh, little short stretches of gene of repeating. Uh, I wish I had a picture for this. Um, yeah, it, it basically when you have this certain sequence, for example, and since the DNA is complementary, when the integrase kind of snips it and inserts the retroviral uh, DNA into the host genome, it kind of uh, cuts it unevenly so that the opposite uh, strand has to be uh, replicated. And since DNA is complementary, you get two repeated identical um, uh, repeated strands basically on opposite ends of the, the LTRs. And those are okay, so, target site duplications. So, and, and you're saying that uh, sometimes the signal is a little more difficult in terms of uh, locating these ERV sequences because over time, the sequences themselves and the properties associated with them, they become more and more degenerate or eroded due to mutations over time, right? Like those LTRs, the second the um, exogenous retrovirus infects, in the right way and is passed on vertically, the LTRs, right, the uh, ends of, of the ERV element, you're saying are identical. They have to be identical at insertion, correct? Right, yeah, basically, um, even if the, you can have mutations, for example, where the, the retroviral genes are kind of entirely deleted, but you end up with these solo LTRs, basically, or I, there, there might be double LTRs I haven't really looked at that specifically, but I do know that so LTRs are remarkably common in our genome, for example. So yeah, okay. essentially you're right there. Okay. So we've got these ERV sequences then, right? Being passed on vertically for millions of years, right. being subject to uh, mutation. I like the way you're describing it vertically there. That's a, a good way to put it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Vertical especially vertical. for the like for the audience sake, when you think of an exogenous retrovirus, typically you think of HIV, the HIV virus, right? right? Well, the HIV exogenous retrovirus is not passed on vertically, right, to, to offspring via genetics, but it is passed on horizontally, right? The herbs, though, pass on vertically. Right. So if, if the exogenous retrovirus infects in, in the right way in, in a germ cell, and uh, gets passed on to the next generation, every single cell now has that viral genetic material, and now it's passed on uh, generation after, after generation, where, as you're pointing out, the LTRs are nearly identical, but as time goes on, and these ERV sequences are being passed on generation after generation, they're being hit with mutations, and therefore becoming more divergent. Actually, this is where they would actually uh, look to uh, a molecular clock in the mutations in the LTR sequences yeah, and determine yeah. a time for insertion. Um, <clears throat> so over time, the signal becomes a, a little weaker because no longer do you have LTR, LTR, gag, pole, ENV, right? You might just have what's called, you said, a, sol a solo LTR. Right, yeah. That's, that's a good summary. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's the next question I would have them. Sure. When it comes to the shared ERV sequences, right? Typically that's what we'll say, you know, the argument goes shared ERV sequences, but in light of everything that, that we're talking about here, Andrew, how many of these uh, sequences are actually whole, right? Complete ERVs, LTR, LTR, gag, pole, ENV versus just solo LTRs due to um, mutations and deletions over time. Right, yeah, so this this kind of gets into the, uh, I, I guess, depending on the researcher you're talking to, you can get, uh, uh, if, if they're defining an, an ERV, basically, like you said, as a complete ERV with all the, the retroviral genes and the LTRs together, um, then you, you still have, I believe, uh, probably at least a few thousand, a few 10,000, um, which uh, if you're looking at solo LTRs um, or just these uh, uh, LTR retrotransposons in general, which is a, an, another kind of way of uh, terming these uh, ERVs, 
um, because they have these LTR sequences and they're classified as retrotransposons, hence LTR retrotransposons. Um, since they make up roughly 8% of the human genome, uh, as far as I'm aware, you find more of these degenerate ERV fragments, I guess you could call them, than complete ERVs. Okay, so we find right, so more... So I don't know the exact numbers here, but I, I think that's generally the case. And that's completely fine. So we do um, find more shared pieces of ERV sequences rather than shared complete elements of the ERV is what right. you're saying. More, yeah, more pieces. Yeah. Okay. But nonetheless, thousands, if we consider the few that are shared that are complete, but then the, the thousands, would you say pieces, solo LTR, so on and so forth, shared between, uh, let, let's stick with the primates, shared between uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, orangutans, gorillas. Um, so then are, are you saying that we would share more complete and incomplete herb sequences as humans and chimpanzees, let's say. So we share more with chimpanzees than we do with gorillas. And we share more with gorillas and chimpanzees than we do with the orangutans. Is that your, is that your position and what you're saying? Right. Yeah, that's, that's uh, the nested hierarchy we're, we're talking about earlier. Right. Okay, so, so we have a, a hierarchy in the elements and also a hierarchy in the pieces. Yeah, ba basically, like, like I said, it depends on how kind of fragmented they are, how, how recognizable they are. But um, generally, yeah, for these, uh, I guess you could call them small-ish groups on the evolutionary tree of life, um, generally, you, you do find a, a large number of ERV, complete ERVs and ERV fragments that are shared between them. Now... Because endogenous retroviruses, because uh, from my understanding, we share them uh, pretty much with um, all vertebrates. Like we find these sequences in uh, nearly all vertebrate genomes. Um, so if we're just looking at vertebrates then, how consistent is this hierarchy? Once you leave the great ape family, let's say once you even leave, you know, the primate group. Okay. Um, how consistent is this hierarchy or does it start to break down? Uh, I, I guess since the, the main information or the kind of the main arguments centered around ERVs have to do with primates in general, I'm not terribly sure on that one. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. That, I, I'd be curious. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd have to look into that myself, but at the moment I'd, I just don't know. Let's even stick within mammals. Sure. It's safe to say that we share more with the chimpanzee and the other great apes than we do with, with mice. Yeah, basically, yeah. Okay, okay. So more with chimpanzees than, than we do with, um, it, as we would find in, in the mouse right. genome. And, okay. and to, to phrase it kind of a, a different way, way real quick or, or kind of adding on to it, basically, you could also find unique shared ERV insertions in say rats and mice that aren't found in uh, humans and other primates that suggests that rats and mice of course are more closely related to each other than they are to to primates and that again fills or falls into the nested hierarchy of these shared ERV locations. Now, when it comes to these multiple independent phylogenies, Andrew, do we have the hierarchies primarily in the RTR, the, the LTR uh, properties of, of the ERV where we get the insertion, the LTRs are identical, and as time goes on, they accumulate um, mutations. So you have one LTR, one LTR on, on either end of, of the uh, ERV element, right? So you're saying, you know, this LTR let's say on the right versus the left might accumulate more mutations than, than the left. So the right LTR becomes more divergent than, than the left or, or what, what would you say? Like the percentage, is that what you mean by divergence, Andrew? Uh, I, 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 I guess it depends how you're looking at it by divergent. I think you're just comparing one to the other. So it, it could be that one just accumulates, happens to accumulate, more mutations than the other um 
I, I think, uh, at least from my understanding, the more likely outcome is they both accumulate a fair amount of mutations over time, but they, they're they different, unique mutations. So say uh, you, you have an A uh, to T in, in one uh, base pair region um, where you have a, a, an entirely different substitution in a, a different region of the, the other LTR. So so I think it, it could go either way, but yeah, generally uh, the, the discontinuity you're looking for between them, I, I guess, could account for either case. Okay, so by different mutations, you're saying it could be like a base substitution, it could be a deletion, right. an insertion. It's not always the same exact kind of mutation. It's not always just a base substitution, you're saying. Or it's not right. always a deletion. It's a mix. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, what about, because again, you know, we're talking about the structure of the ERV, right? LTR, LTR, gag, pole, ENV genes or properties of the ERV. So we have hierarchies in the LTRs. Do we have hierarchies in the gag, pole, and ENV? properties of of the earth sequence like wh where is primarily the hierarchies found uh so are, are you asking basically do they the genes themselves start out identical and kind of diverge like the ltrs or i i don't know if i quite understand your question yeah like when we talk about um shared mutations mutations in the irv sequences themselves that you're saying fall out into these nested hierarchical patterns that's the distribution of them um we have in the multiple independent phylogenies where we have uh, hierarchies in the ltrs mutations in the ltrs what about mutations in the other properties of, of the erv element right yeah that, that's why i think adding the kind of unique portion to it so these are kind of shared unique mutations so if if you imagine um when you're doing your phylogeny, basically, uh, you, you're often looking for rather than traits that could appear, because uh, you often can have evolutionary reversals, say a, an A to a T, but then a T back to an A, just because there are lots of nucleotides in the, the DNA that can mutate back and forth. Um, but generally, you're looking for kind of these mutations that are less likely to occur in the sense that, um, I think. Sorry, I think I'm going off topic here, but yeah, basically, what what you're looking for is not just shared mutations. You're looking for these mutations that are found in one that are unique to that one, and in a different ERV from a different lineage, a different location. You also have the exact same shared unique mutation going on. So, say you have a I don't know, just hypothetical example, you have a small insertion of a few DNA letters into one complete ERV in one species at one location. Um, you have the same insertion in a different species at a different location in the same ERV. And that shows or the, the chances of that exact mutation happening in that particular ERV at that particular location of the genome in two uh, very, uh, to various extent related species uh, is highly unlikely. And that's the, the kind of the, the hierarchy going on here. Okay, so you would say then based on- I, I don't know if I phrased that in a very uh, understandable <laughs> way, but you can try and help me out here. You're doing good answering these these technical questions. So we're getting in the important details and I appreciate the fact that you're knowledgeable on this makes it more fun, right? Makes yeah. it more of an engaging and sophisticated right. yeah, of course, yeah. So um, you would then say, I, I imagine, that given the hierarchies in both the IRV sequences and the um, mutational discrepancies, and the, dis the distribution they, they fall into, right. um, even uh, considering the fact that we're looking at different kinds of mutations, right? right. Um, so for these to occur independently, right, in different lineages, rather than them being inherited from common ancestors, um, let's focus on just humans and chimpanzees. Sure. Would 
one of the main arguments be that of um, statistical, right? You would argue that the chance of, let's say, a human and a chimpanzee, or even a human, a chimpanzee, and a bonobo being infected by an exogenous retrovirus that is then passed on vertically and now is an endogenous retrovirus. It occurs right. from within, right? It originates from within. To find these in the exact same spots and to have occurred independently is, as I've heard the evolutionists say, far less than you know one in 10 million. And when you consider multiple sequences that would have to be inserted independently in different lineages, then it becomes more like one in 100 million, one in 500 million to the point where it's just very highly unlikely. Would that be an accurate representation? Right. Yeah. And uh, again, you can also extend this to the case of the, the shared uh, individual mutations within these ERVs um, it, for kind of the same reason, like if you had a common ancestor or, or say, say these two lineages, whatever lineages we're talking about, A and B, are a separate ancestry. They're completely unrelated to one another. Um, the chances of them having the same ERV insertion in the same location are vanishingly small. But uh, the likelihood becomes even smaller, according to the, the argument, uh, when they also share happen to share the same exact mutations in their sequences because if they were not related there's no specific reason beyond inheritance um for them to share those exact mutations so it's kind of uh i guess you could say the layers stacking on top of each other to build this argument is is one way to put it so you're saying it, it it's a multi-layered argument it's right. not just okay. We have these these shared uh, viral genetic sequences between humans and chimpanzees, and and the primates and and all vertebrates for the most part. It's it, it's more than just that. It, it's multi layered. So I, I guess two questions. Sure. Because we discussed a lot there. When it comes to the shared mutations, when it comes to the hierarchies that they followed into in both the herb elements and the um, mutations themselves and not to put you on the spot here but uh you know obviously i know you don't have every technical paper handy and that's fine right. what what would be the, the the best um studies the best technical papers that have actually uh, documented these hierarchies that that we find in the herb elements and then the herb mutations uh <laughs> Um, I, let's see. It, it, uh, it's fine if you, if you don't, cause I, I'd really love to love to know, you know, how many, um, studies, right. Comprehensively right. document this, because I, I also wonder behind the assumptions, the assumptions of mutations, cause Andrew, you and I have, uh, dis discussed at great length, the assumptions behind the, um, universal ancestry and separate ancestry sure. models, right? where the universal ancestry model explains all DNA differences, all DNA, you know, quote unquote discrepancies as being the result of mutations over time, whether it's right. a frame shift, an insertion, a base substitution that we were talking about earlier, a deletion. Um, this is all explained by, by mutations in, right. in one way or, or another. When the creation model, the separate ancestry model would say, no, mutations do happen but they are the minority in terms of genetic sequences, genetic elements, and DNA differences, right? We, who hold to the separate ancestry model, we would suggest that the majority of DNA differences found within species across species, and this goes for DNA elements as well, like herbs elements, are the, the, the result of initial uh, creation or design diversity, or in technical terms, created nuclear heterozygosity, right? right? So I guess my question to you is, and, and I find this shared mutation argument that f fall out in the nested hierarchical patterns to be very interesting, because I find it curious that g in light of the evolutionists assuming that, that all DNA differences, all, all discrepancies between species, and obviously within species too, taxonomically re restricted, um, that is, are the result of, of mutations. So what assumptions would you say the evolutionists are um, 
what assumptions are at play when determining the shared mutational discrepancies that followed in the hierarchies? How do you know that this, let's say, shared mutation or DNA difference is, um, you know, a, a mutation, a, a base substitution, yeah. an insertion, so something like that? If you want to go into that a little bit. Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a, a a fair point. Like, how do we know that these DNA differences are indeed from mutations and not from some other mechanism, um, whatever that that mechanism may or may not be? Um, basically, uh, one one thing I find, uh, or one reason I think mutations are the dominant source of, I guess you could say, ultimate DNA variation, because we know that recombination scrambles the or doesn't. Uh, uh, shuffles the DNA, you could say shuffles the variation around in a population, but ultimately, according to the evolutionary model, DNA differences come from mutations. Um, and one reason why I think, uh, a strong reason why I think mutations are the source of this DNA diversity. Oh, are you still there, Donnie? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Andrew, keep talking. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, I, I don't know if you left the no stream worries. for a sec. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically the uh, the the main reason why we usually think that or we assume that these mutations or sorry DNA differences are due to mutations is the fact that from what we see of mutations that we have observed in the lab, for example. Um, so or just kind of a little background here: there are four DNA nucleotide. Uh, types basically ACTG, um, but it turns out that these nucleotides, um, these base pairs, uh, are not exactly the same chemically. So you you have your purines, for example, and your pyrimidines, um, depending on where there's kind of this two ring structure or this one ring structure, and it turns out that from mutations that we've readily observed in the laboratory. Um, uh, purines are more likely, not always, but much more likely to mutate into other pure, uh, the other purine and vice versa um, than a pyrimidine and a pyrimidine more likely to mutate into a per, another pyrimidine and vice versa than into a purine. Um, so this is, uh, when you get into the phylogenetics, for example, just a side note, this is where in maximum likelihood analysis, you, you use these probabilistic models of sequence evolution where, for example, uh, not all mutations are equally likely to occur. And that's kind of the one reason why I think mutations are the, uh, the ultimate source of this DNA variation is because when we look at, say, DNA differences that we haven't observed occurring in different species, we find that the, the occurrence of these DNA differences um, compared to, to other sequences and other closely related species, um, which we can say, a, or hypothesize share a common ancestor, we find that they, they match the expectations of these probabilistic models um, that, that purines mutating into other purines, pyrimidines into other pyrimidines more likely uh, and that isn't to say that a purine can't mutate into a pyrimidine at all. It just means that some DNA differences are vastly more common than others. And that's what we see and why I think mutations are the ultimate source of these differences. Okay. Well, it's kind of long winded there, but I, I want to go nope. into it. And that's fine. That's um, and, and that's important for the second half of our discussion. So, sure. uh, you know, I, for the audience sake, you know, what we're doing here is kind of laying down the details in terms of um, why endogenous retroviruses and shared endogenous retroviral viral sequences between organisms are uh, important in the uh, ancestry debate. OK, so one more question and then we're just going to do um as we do in this podcast series, a two minute break. I get a bathroom break from all the water that I drank and then a refill. And then the second half, I am going to uh, start Andrew and, and I'll give, uh, you know, a, an alternative explanation 
and then uh, you know for the separate ancestry model and explaining endogenous retroviruses, and then we'll engage that uh, in detail. So my okay. question is, when it comes to the shared mutational discrepancies that followed in the hierarchies, okay, are these are these fixed? Like in humans, when you look at an ERV sequence and you see what you believe is, is a mutation, is it fixed within the, for the audience sake, fixed just means to be stuck in place, okay? So is, is this mutation so-called, is it stuck in place? Is, is it fixed? Uh, it, it, generally speaking, I believe so. So without okay. going into the, kind of the, the, the technical papers here, which I, I don't have on hand. Um, yeah, basically, it, if it becomes common enough in the population, it, it, it becomes fixed. And you can kind of see this for these different species that supposedly have diverged so long ago, or relatively long ago on, compared to human time scales, that many of these DNA differences are presumably fixed, would be my guess. Okay. So you have, let's say you have a common ancestor, right? You got the human and chimpanzee common ancestor sure. between six and 10 million years ago. Okay. So, um, you know, they're hit with, with a bunch of exogenous retroviral infections. And then these insertions are passed on vertically. Now, eventually you get a split or you get the human chimpanzee split. So you get the human line going one way, you get the chimpanzee line going the other with them comes the viral genetic material, right? The, the, the inserted DNA essentially right. is passed on. Once the split happens, now you start getting the possibility of independent insertions. So those would be taxonomically restricted and independent mutations, right? right. But the mutations that occurred in the ERV sequences prior to the split, right? Those are the ones that would be shared between humans and chimpanzees once they split and then diverge from each other. Is that correct, Andrew? Right. Yeah. So, so you'll have these these mutations are obviously shared between them according to this model, and you you uh, in each unique lineage you'll find their their own unique mutations going along with them that aren't shared with the other lineage because they diverged since that time. So, so you're saying then, for the most part, the um, ERV sequences that are shared between humans and chimpanzees and the mutations, since they were inherited from past the past common ancestor, right? Um, they, they, they would be fixed. You're going to find them for the most part in humans and then in chimpanzees stuck in place overall. Right. Yeah. For, for, for the most part. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I, I think that's important. Uh, we, we just hit the 50 minute mark. So, you know, sure. I said one more question, but I do want to point this out in, um, especially again, for the audience sake and to make this uh, podcast discussion as beneficial and edifying as possible. The most, yeah. um, basic, I, I guess, mutate. I mean, you got, you got different mutations, right? The deletions, base substitutions, insertions, frame shifts, frame shift mutations, insertions, right. so on and so forth. But the base substitution would be your, your most um, basic genetic mutation, right? And that simply involves the, um, you are explaining it earlier, the, the swapping of one nucleotide for right. another um nucleotide you, you, DNA you can replication. think of it since these are kind of the the smallest changes one they're they're right. the simplest to occur and they're much less likely to disrupt anything because right. uh they're they're uh just changing one nucleotide for another basically and how many are uh, okay so how, how many of those are shared would you say on, on average like a percentage or, or is that a big bulk of the mutation that that's shared uh I uh, I don't quite know to be honest, but um, I, I would assume so given how how common they are. So I I I, I do think it'd right. be a mix between the two. But yeah, I, I I think since substitutions are generally more uh, the most common type of or for at least some regions of the genome, then yeah I, I I'd assume so for now at least. And, and I'd find, you know, I find that to be curious since if, if you're just swapping out, right, one nucleotide for another, one DNA letter for another, 
I find it difficult then to truly determine if this is a mutation or if this is just a reflection of the functional nature of, of the ERV sequence. Because if it's just one letter for another, right? How, how do you know that that really did occur as a mutation? Especially if it if it happened in in a, a distant common ancestor, and we'll touch on that in in detail in the second half. Sure. But um, yeah, how confident would you be as an evolutionist to say, okay, you know, this is most certainly a, a reflection of a mutation, rather than let's say a, a created uh, DNA letter? Well, I think offhand one reason would be the fact that you can have DNA differences or minute ones, of course, because of the, 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 the recent divergence, um, be you, like you said, you find unique mutations in one lineage in one ERV and not in the other. And I think that from what you're saying, if, uh, in my view, if they were designed for a specific purpose for that, that reason um that this wouldn't really be possible if if they're they're highly specified here then at least in in my view there shouldn't be these distinct mutations in either erv and either lineage that kind of differentiate them that show that there there is variation possible basically in the the sequence even though it may be smaller or large depending on the erv well he Here's something that, that I find interesting. Okay. And this is the last comment I'll make before we go on uh, just, just a two minute break here before part sure. two, where we're, we're really going to get into um, the differentiating evidence and kind of engage it. Um, these single base substitutions, or, you know, in other words, these point mutations. Okay. From my understanding, a lot of uh, rare diseases are due to single point mutations, right, Andrew? Sure. Uh, sickle cell anemia, I believe, is due to a single point mutation. I mean, yep. Yep. one one single point mutation can can kill a person. One single point mutation can lead to disease. That uh, you know, the the person with the disease, it, it it's harmful, but they can still survive. But the point is, and and I'll make the point, I guess, by asking you a question. Those point mutations that result in in those rare diseases. Would those be fixed in the population or unfixed? Well, if they cause these diseases, then they'd most likely not be fixed because of the detriment, detrimental effects they have. In order for them to be fixed, they generally either have to be neutral due to genetic drift or they have to be beneficial to be selected for. Right. All right. Good answer. So um, this is where I think the important aspect of this debate comes into play in that we can determine, I think, safely what is actually the result of a mutation based on that which is fixed, that which is unfixed, right? I think we determined for the most part that, uh, you know, these ERV sequences that are shared are stuck in place. The mutations themselves that are shared are stuck in place, are fixed, in the human population that we find fixed, uh, you know, so-called mutations in the chimpanzee um, population that are assumed to be inherited from a, a common ancestor in, in the distant past, right? But the question is, since they are fixed, maybe they are fixed for a reason. Maybe that is because they are a design difference. And that's where, you know, in, in my book, I have a whole section that uh, predicts that these indeed, these shared mutations that, that form hierarchies, they may be pre-existing. They may be reflective of the functional requirements of the respective organism, right? Versus the unfixed mutations, which we can typically determine like sickle cell anemia or just mutations that have happened over uh, you know the last few hundred to few thousand years, they're not stuck in place. Right, that they're on fix. So we can safely say, okay, this is um, you know, not a pre-existing difference, essentially. This this is something that has occurred after the fact. Um ha have a quick final word on that. We're gonna take a two-minute break and then we're really gonna get into the meat and potatoes of this, Andrew. I, and I appreciate your answers here. Go ahead. Yeah, um 
Yeah, I, I, I guess that superficially would sound reasonable to me at the moment. I feel like I'd have some deeper responses here if it if it weren't so uh, late back here. But yeah, I, I think uh, I guess I'd agree with that for now at least. But I'll I'll have to kind of look into it because I, I just to kind of make sure it's it's rock solid basis so I'll, I'll 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 give you that point for for this discussion at least okay i, I appreciate it andrew you did a great job answering a lot of these technical uh sure. questions we're gonna do uh we hit the hour mark so typically these podcasts we go two hours we take a two minute break uh midway so here we go guys everybody in the audience have some fun have some side debates uh andrew if you need a bathroom break or refill your water now's the time and uh two minutes and uh you know the the battle continues and uh the second half is, is always a little more wild than the first half i'm just kidding of course but okay here we go guys we'll see you in two minutes All right, we are back and appreciate the audience for uh, sticking in for the second half. And Andrew, no worries, we can even go a half an hour. I know two hours is kind of long at this time. Uh, for yeah. the second half, I'm even, I'll, I'll do my third week. <laughs> I'm even switching glasses. Uh, so I got a new pair of glasses here and they take a little while to oh, get nice. used to. So, um, okay, here we go. I do got to say a uh, shout out to Doki Doki Bible Club, uh, the super sticker master. Uh, put my kids through college brother so i appreciate that okay so i um over an hour ago at this point now andrew i appreciated your your opening statement and also the fact that you um did a good job answering um my questions to that so what i'm gonna do now is i'll just take equal time about five minutes sure we'll engage my points a lot of this you, you've heard before and um that's why what we'll do is engage it. I'll present it for the audience's sake. And that's, then that's um, ready. 
There we go. Uh, I'll just go through a few random slides and also just reiterate some points from the first half. Okay. Sure. So, um, and, and this is why the, the topic of endogenous retroviruses as they apply to the question of ancestry is so important. Okay, guys, because as uh, we demonstrated throughout the uh, first hour of this discussion, um, if these really are the ancient remnants, uh, past viral infections, okay, at least the pre existing ones, that is, um, then it would be good evidence, reasonable evidence for common ancestry, because as we laid out, for all of these sequences to be inserted independently. In, in different taxes, I guess you could say, different lineages, the chances of that, especially the mutations, being the same mutations is, is relatively low. Okay, and, and I can admit to that. So that's why I typically ask the question that uh, is no stranger to Andrew. Are these really the ancient remnants of past viral infections or are they created units of DNA function? at least the fixed ones, the ones that are stuck in place, I can confidently predict these are created units of DNA function. Therefore, I would predict function. And this also applies to the uh, shared mutational discrepancies. Okay, if they are fixed, if they are stuck in place, then this may actually be reflective of the functional requirements of the respective organism, okay? And what I mean by that is information flow and cell optimization would be expected to be slightly different in let's say humans and chimpanzees. There may even be secondary functions involved in these ERV sequences that are reflective of the uh, so-called shared mutational discrepancies that may indeed just be um, created units, okay, design differences. Um, and the, the way, let's say, a mouse would use its ERV sequence could be slightly different than the way a human uses their ERV sequences and also, uh, you know, the chimpanzee and so on and so forth, okay? So um, all of this we, we touched on earlier. Uh, what is an endogenous retrovirus? Andrew also touched on the, uh, the properties of the uh, in the nature of the ERV sequences, Andrew, I, I appreciate you went into integrase, right? We also have a reverse transcriptase, right? I find this interesting. Retroviruses, however, use a slower, stealthier approach. After entering the cell, the retroviruses the uh, retrovirus uses an enzyme called reverse transcriptase to turn its RNA because it, it has RNA as its genetic material into DNA. It has to do that, of course, to insert and then hopefully be passed on vertically uh, before making its way to the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, it inserts its DNA in, into the host genome. And then, of course, we, we get replication. And if it hits, as you can see here, most of the time when a virus integrates its genome, with the host, a new hybrid genome dies when the cell and its descendants do. Sometimes though, and this is what Andrew and I were talking about when it comes to the sequences that are passed vertically rather than horizontally, okay? Sometimes, however, a virus will infect a sperm or egg cell. If fertilization occurs, the offspring will have a copy of the viral genome in every single one of its cells. It can pass the hybrid genome onto its offspring, creating what scientists call a fully endogenous retrovirus because it, it occurs from within, okay? A fancy term for a virus, as you can see, you see here, that uh, comes from within. We talked about HERVs, right? Taxonomically restricted endogenous retrovirus. Uh, the genomic organization and signatures of ERVs, what they look for, the LTRs, the uh, GAG poll, and ENV uh, properties of it. And um, here's some important questions, okay? Why are there ERV sequences shared between the genomes of organisms? Well, we've discussed. It's either the common ancestry model would suggest that they're uh, vestiges, and they uh, can be used, utilized, or looked at as a, almost a historical record of evolution, common descent. 
Okay. Or are they reflective of common design and design diversity, which has its own set of expectations and predictions? But, but if they really are created units of DNA function, even if we find functions, even if we find a lot of functions for these or for these elements, okay, these created units of DNA function, as I would propose, there's still the greater question. And this is a good question. If viral-like sequences in the genomes of organisms are functional, why do they bear similarity to viral genetic material? We still have to explain why these ERV sequences, even if functional, still have these similarities, the LTRs, right? The GAG, the pole, the ENV. Why do they still have these similarities to exogenous retroviruses? And this is where I want to get to this slide. Okay, so for sake of time, I said I was only going to use five minutes, so um, I'll, I'll just go over this specific paper. But there are dozens of papers here. But this is what I find to be a, a more um, interesting and, and just fascinating function of these uh, ERV sequences in, in that they are antiviral protectors. Okay, they protect us from viral infections. This is a 2021. So this is new research. And they still say in these papers, when you read them, that they're just in the beginning stages of understanding how endogenous retroviruses uh, protect us from viral infections. There's still so much to learn, they'll say. They'll even say that, you know, these are unexpected. And so they look forward to the future of discovery. You know, what else are they doing? What is, is the, um, you know, the, the nature of, of this ability, the, more of the details essentially. So notice this excerpt from this paper. Long disregarded as junk DNA or genomic dark matter, endogenous retroviruses have turned out to represent important components of the antiviral immune system. Of course, for sake of time, I won't. I've got dozens of papers that talk about how they're functional in gene expression, gene regulation, embryological development. They're functional in uh, you know, determining cell types, functional in uh, tumor suppression, just a number of things, a couple that come to mind not only regulate cellular uh, immune activation, but may even directly target invading viral pathogens. One focus will be on recent advances in the role of ERVs as regulators of antiviral gene expression. Okay, so here's um, where it discusses the, the, the tumor suppression. So the important point about uh, their function in terms of being antiviral uh, protectors is that it turns out it turns out that the way that the ERV is structured, their similarities to exogenous retroviruses are needed. Their function is actually predicated on their similarities to exogenous retroviruses, okay? Because they can perf perform something called viral mimicry as well, um, where the way that they're structured, that actually helps are necessary for, for their function in, in fighting off um, retroviruses. And I wanted to go to one specific right here, for example, in what has been called viral mimicry, ERV expression can elicit host cell immune signaling via induction of viral defense pathways. Uh, it goes into a proposed explanation. Um, right here is where we talked about how 90% of herbs don't even resemble true endogenous retroviruses, right? Solo LTRs that actually um, may just represent functional stretches of DNA. Notice this. But these similarities might be related to their function of fighting off viruses, right? Their, their similarities to exogenous retroviruses and are not necessarily due to some ancient viral invasion. Notice this, but it's also possible that what evolutionary biologists call endogenous retroviruses, remember the ERV sequences did not call themselves ERV sequences, okay? Scientists <laughs> that assume they are the ancient remnants of, of past viral infections name them endogenous retroviruses. We're stuck with the name, so you know we'll, we'll stick with it here, although I think it's better too, in light of their fu many functional roles, to uh, refer to them as uh, created units of of DNA function. Right here, the long terminal repeats that Andrew and I talked about uh, may just simply represent long terminal uh, repeats because they uh, stretches a, a functional DNA can serve as a binding sites for initiating or enhancing gene expression. There's one slide I wanna get to, uh, Andrew, and then I'm gonna hand it back to you. And it is, um, let's see here. So again, the herbs are integral and important components of the immune systems. And 
Uh, I got so many slides here that I may not be able to find it in time. But what I'll do is just go right back up to here. And um, for my last point, go over the uh, mutations as well. So my overall prediction would be if, if we're looking at that which is fixed, okay, in the IRVs themselves pre-existing, because we do know that one of the IRVs jobs, one of their, their operational roles, is to actually prevent the endogenization of exogenous retroviruses. That's interesting because remember, we also have DNA repair enzymes that um, stop mutations, right? That they fix mutations. And, and we have DNA breaks all the time. And if it wasn't for these uh, highly intricate DNA repair enzymes, essentially we'd be extinct after a few generations. Of course, they work great. They work great, but they don't work perfectly. So mutations get through, mutations happen, many mutations in the somatic cell lines and uh, in the germ cell lines where some are passed on as well, roughly 100 per person per generation. So the point I'm trying to make here is the pre-existing fixed herbs, they function to not only fight off exogenous retroviruses, but it looks like they also function to stop endo the, the endogenization process of them, or even if an exogenous retrovirus becomes endogenous, is passed on, of course, um, the pre-existing ERVs, it looks like they, they can actually disrupt the um, endogenous retroviruses and, and pretty much kill them. So they don't uh, induce harm, harmful effects. I think we see this in, in the koalas with, with the KORV. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is, although the pre-existing fixed ERVs have that function, it doesn't mean that the function is, is performed perfectly, which means, yes, some exogenous retroviruses may make their way through, hit a germ cell, and uh, th through the, the fertilization process get, gets passed on, okay? But here's the thing that I would say, is those would be the unfixed ones, those would be disease-causing for the most part, and those should not have essential functional roles, like in the embryo, and certainly not uh, fighting off viruses okay but it's the pre-existing the fixed ones that i would predict are functional okay functional to the point where they're essential as in some of these papers that i have literally admit that without this irv sequence we would not exist i like to exist so here's the last thing on the non-random mutations and hotspots although i believe a lot of the dna differences a lot of the so-called mutations are reflective of um design differences okay that may suggest the, the differences in uh, the functional requirements of the respective organisms. But we do know that a lot of mutations are uh, non-random. There are hotspots. And I would say that there are more hotspots than the evolutionists would say because my position suggests and predicts that the majority of the genome is functional, where the evolutionists would predict that the majority of the genome is not functional. But if the majority of the genome is functional, that means these functional units would be expected to also be hit with a lot of the same types of mutations. Okay, if you actually uh, Google, um, you know, re research what what are the main areas most affected by uh, corrosion or or rust. Okay, and they'll talk about how um, you know it, it could be the pain in your car or the engine, and how there's on on all modes of transportation that there's certain parts of the car that are more prone to uh, damage, to, to corrosion. And even if it's an engine, we know the engine is, is important, okay? And if we have all sorts of important and necessary uh, genetic sequences and units in the genome, then we would all, uh, also expect that a lot of them would be subject to the same kind of, of damage. So overall, the shared mutations, that's the last thing I'll say, Andrew, and then take as long as you want. Uh, the shared mutations, I think uh, the answer to that is a combination of created differences, okay, and mutational hotspots. But I would predict there are more hotspots, many more hotspots than the evolutionists would predict. And that also comes down to uh, whether or not the genome is, is mostly functional. And Andrew, that was a lot there. Go ahead, uh, take your time. What are your thoughts on that? Anything you'd like to, to push back on? Anything you'd like a clarification over? Uh, the floor is yours. Sure, yeah. So uh, lots of uh, diverse set of topics we can get into that unfortunately we may or may not get into all tonight. We um, can do a part two and three as well. These are always fun with you, Andrew. Yep, yep. Sounds good. Um, 
So I guess kind of pushing back on one of the main things you said, which might guess into uh, another rabbit hole, but we can move, shift topics if need be from there. Um, basically, this conclusion that uh, these ERV sequences are, like you said, not retroviral in origin. Because I think, like you said, if they are retro, if they are derived from exogenous retroviruses, then in my opinion, that pretty much uh, hits a, a significant nail against uh, separate ancestry, um, which is why determining their origin is, like you said, so so important for the argument. So if I could share my screen, um, I'd like Absolutely. to, uh, for the audience's sake, uh, show one thing I mentioned earlier, which I think pretty conclusively demonstrates uh, that these are, in my opinion, uh, retroviral in origin. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is there any way I can make this any bigger? Uh, uh, does that make it any bigger on your end? Um, yeah. Yeah. When you zoom in, that definitely helps more for sure. Okay. That's good. All right. Uh, can you also see my mouse? Yes. Uh, yeah. I'll even okay. make it full screen on my end too. There oh, we go. Okay. That's Thanks. better. All right. Um, so one of the things I was talking about earlier is the, the fundamental way, um, integrates uh, this this specific enzyme uh, that we know from retroviruses observed in the laboratory, how it inserts the DNA into a particular region of the genome. Um, what it does is it basically cuts it at this, this kind of zigzag shape. Um, it, it, it cuts it unevenly, basically. This is a, a clear delineation that integrase has been here, kind of, Thing, um, when you when you find that and the way we can track that basically is okay if say integrase has inserted this section of DNA uh, retroviral DNA into the host genome what does this create these gaps because of the zigzag shape that it's uh, the uneven arrangement that's cut and basically since the DNA is complementary you get these two identical strands that have been filled in and these are called target site duplications. And along with the LTRs and the genes, they kind of show that the, the picture most consistent is in fact that at least for these complete ERVs, which are, as we talked about earlier, very still quite numerous in uh, different lineages, uh, these target site duplications, among other things, show that these ERVs are most likely viral in origin. So I kind of just want to, to show this graphic for the audience's sake to show what I was uh, talking about earlier, make it a bit more digestible information. But yeah, that's uh, the first thing I'd push back on is I, I do think these sequences are uh, derived from retroviruses um, because of these target site duplications, among other things. So uh, what are your general thoughts there? Okay, so um overall you would say that these are including the pre-existing fixed ones the result of ancient viral infections right that right. have been passed on vertically due to not only their sequence similarity to exogenous retroviruses right ltr ltr gag paul env but also these uh, target site duplications right. that you're talking about right Right. So you, you can, you can kind of, like I was saying, or you can kind of consider it if the, the C ERV sequence itself was like a scar, these are kind of the, right. the regions of tissue around it that indicate a scar has, has uh, been formed here basically by some in, inflammation of some sort. Okay. In this so, case, the, the inflammation would be analogous to the, the integration for the audience. So if these, ERV sequences really do represent um, scars or genomic fossils, right, right, of evolutionary history, essentially, then these regions of tissue that, that we're looking at um, are evidence of, of that is, is would be your position. Right. Um, basically, because we know that when we observe in the 
retroviruses today, HIV, for example, and all the other retroviruses that the integrase it uses um, creates, like I said, this zigzag shape that leads to these target site duplications. And when we see these uh, TSDs, um, in the, I, I just want to clarify, you said sure. it's the integrase. Right. Yeah. That it's result the, in these scar tissues, essentially. Right. Yeah. Basically, the integrase itself is cutting and uh, kind of inserting the, the, uh, the retroviral DNA. And so it's kind of doing both at the same time. Right. Right. So the integrase do, in doing its job, right, through uh, cut and paste means. Right. Or we know that a lot of these retro transposons can move around just through copy and paste or cut and paste, as you're saying. Right. When this occurs, this is leaving every time almost a scar. Like, like if I were to fall on my elbow or something and I were to um, get a scar, which I got quite a few scars on my body, <laughs> it would be kind of silly to say that you know, these were pre-existing. I were born with them. It's probably better to say, no, that's probably due to an injury in the past. I fell right. on my elbow or something. Right. And I, um, I think, yeah, that, that can, that's a, that's a fair summary. Um, I, I would say that it would be even more specific to say that, say, uh, if, if we know from pre-existing conditions, you land on your elbow in X way, you're going to get X scar, then that would show that okay you, you probably landed on your elbow this way some some time ago and like we said from these uh the ltr regions that are seem to be consistent with this um kind of the the broader picture here we can like i said take a, a molecular clock analysis and kind of right kind of okay, figure out so, the order basically of insertion okay so let's break this down a little bit sure. uh, these are some really good points andrew and and um Clearly, you've been studying this, and it makes it a lot of fun. So, again, sure. I appreciate that. Um, so, as we've, I guess, where do we start? So, as we've discussed, there are a couple of um, unique aspects of retrovir exogenous retroviruses, but we also find these in endogenous retroviruses, are the specific enzymes, the reverse transcriptase, and the integrase. Okay, right. specifically focusing on the integrase here. Uh, well, uh, just quickly now, I will also note the the ENV gene. Just for honesty's sake, that the uh, these glycoproteins that um, for the retroviruses at least help them kind of uh, gain access to the cell to begin with. So that's kind of right. the, the major proteins involved in overall. Just noting okay, so, that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So. In this process, then, specifically of retroviral integration, right? right? When the retrovirus makes its way into the host cell, right? The um, And I got a whole section on this in my book, too, where the um, RNA nucleic acid of the uh, exogenous retrovirus, they're eventually um, released. And when reverse transcription takes place, right? Which is pretty much just transcription in reverse. That, that's really all it means for the audience. Right. Okay. So the reverse transcriptase, it binds to the viral RNA to perform reverse transcription. But we also have the integrase, which helps to integrate the DNA of the virus, right? Into the DNA of the um, host cell. And that's exactly why they would call it integrase in the first place. And then at the end of the day, in we have... case would kind of be a weird sounding to be <laughs> Integrase flows a little better. So yeah. now we've got what's called a provirus, right? Which right. is a combination of host cell DNA and viral. Um, right. Yeah. That's a, a term we forgot to mention earlier, provirus. Yeah. Right. Now, so, so here's my question. And I'd like if you could reiterate it too, because this is such an important point. Sure. When we get these, um, you know, the, these scars. Okay. Is this, are these scars being uh, left there? Okay. These signatures essentially for us to see when the, the either cut and paste occurs or the copy and paste. Uh, so, so you're, you're asking kind of are these generally left for um, like say, DNA transposons, which use the kind of cut and paste mechanism versus 
retro transposons which use the kind of more copy and paste mechanism you're are you asking right. are, are they yeah. found in both basically yeah like because we know that um and i think we would we, we would all agree the evolutionists and and the creationists that um certain classes of retro transposons they can um one of their abilities is to move from one chromosomal location to another right. and what I find interesting, and I've got papers I, I could screen share, the ability of um, certain retrotransposons, not all of them can do them. It seems like they've lost their ability to mobilize, but many can. When they do move around the genome, they can not only you know turn genes on and off, but they, they can actually um, result in genetic variation that, that can be passed on. And what this tells me is there's a lot of latent genetic information in our genome and because many of these retro transposons andrew have a gene promoter in them okay right. so let's say we have a retro transposon that's stuck in in a certain spot within the genome okay well if, if they move right a gene that's turned on based on the uh location of of this retro transposon if they move that gene is now turned off Right. So as jumping genes are popping in and out of the genome in different places, they can literally turn things on and off. And so right. my point is when they do mobilize, when they knew they do move around. OK, I would expect them to then leave these signatures, right, these scars. So the scars are being left from movement within the genome, but not from outside. Does that make like I, I would expect the same signatures from a retro transposon that's moving in the genome. And if it came from, from outside, like how could we tell the difference? I, I guess my question would be, does that make sense, Andrew? Go ahead. Yeah, um, that's a that's a good question. So, so you're basically just clear what you're asking uh, these retro, retro transposons that are already in the genome say, are, are when, when they're when they're kind of copy and pasting themselves do they kind of leave the same scars these genetic scars basically as a, a exogenous retrovirus when it's first entering the in inserting itself into the genome exactly exactly you got it so when they move around in the genome from one chromosomal location to another right every time they do that either through cut and paste or copy and paste are they leaving the same scars that if uh, an exogenous retrovirus was integrating fr from the outside, would it be the same signatures, I guess, is the question. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 as far as my understanding goes, I see no reason why it wouldn't generally be the case. Um, I guess one thing I'd push back on though, is that there are, multiple types of retro transposons and obviously not all of them have these same genes the integrase for example and ltrs for that matter um right there's non-ltrs you're saying right, uh, yeah. non-ltr retro transposons right? right yeah exactly so so i guess my uh kind of counterpoint would be it seems curious to me that these uh integration sites would also contain LTRs um, and these target site duplications if they're just from, say, any random kind of retro transposon. Why do they happen to be these uh, ERV-like sequences? That's a good question. And I think it comes down to just how incredibly varied these uh, ERVs, ERVs, and other classes of retrotransposons are, and ALU sequences too, right? That are found in, I think, only primates. Right. Um, because even in a lot of these technical papers, like 2022 even, they're saying like, wow, a lot of these, these functions are unexpected and they admit, which is awesome, this is what, this is what science is about. They admit, you know, that there's now so much more about these uh, various classes of retrotransposons that we just don't understand. Like as in th there's a really, th there's a, a strong level of excitement in terms of what more are we going to discover? I mean, we have some classes of retrotransposons. One specific that I like to point out that we find in, in the mouse genome, right? That um, if you deactivate it or snip it out, okay? 
the mouse as it's developing it stops developing and then it dies like it literally needs that uh piece of dna viral quote unquote to, to develop and then right. the, the same would be true for for humans that's that one specific class of, of retrotransposon but then we got other classes of retrotransposons like you're saying where they can actually mobilize within the genome right they can move from one chromosomal location to another and the presence or absence of some of these jumping genes can actually turn on and off various genes. And as I pointed out, some of these retrotransposons actually have a, a DNA um, promoter in them. And so uh, one thing I would say, too, is, is their uh, functional role in, in the innate immune system also relies on their similarities to exogenous retroviruses. And Andrew, that includes... That includes not only the LTRs, the GAG, the pole, the ENV, but the integrase and the reverse transcriptase. So that could be a possible answer, too, from our side is everything about them in order to. And I use this analogy before, like if I was trying to if, if a, an American spy was trying to um, infiltrate. Actually, I'll use a different analogy. People that have sure. watched like uh, Goodfellas or The Departed or Godfather, all these cool mafia movies. Well, if you get somebody like an FBI agent who's trying to uh, infiltrate the mafia, right? Or a mob, well, they got to look the part. That they, they can't look like an FBI agent or else they're going to get detected and be killed. Right. So they got to play the part. They got to look like a mob boss. They got to look like a, cr a criminal, essentially. Um, and, and that's what we see as well with, with these uh, functional roles in, in fighting off viral infections is, is they have to look the part. And they do. Thank God they, they do. And, and I would say that that also uh, suggests that they need the integrase. They need the, the reverse transcriptase. So, yeah, the, the, there's a lot of variation in their functions. There's a lot of variation in what they do, why they're there. So it's it's not as black and white, I guess, Andrew, is is a long answer short. It's not as black and white. Sure. So we'd have to look at the specific retrotransposon and then sure. we'd have yeah. to determine, you know, what's this, what's the function, what's it doing there? Why does it and, and I think once we recognize what the function is and why it's there, then we'll also know, okay, that's why it's structured the way it is. That's why it's an LTR retrotransposon versus a non-LTR and vice versa. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Great questions, by the way. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess this, this actually leads to some of the other questions I, I kind of want to push back on, which is uh, regarding the LTRs and um, the the shared locations, among other things. I'll start with the, the LTRs, basically. Um, so what you were talking about, for example, these uh, uh, DNA elements, um, when they're mobilizing, basically they're, they're cutting and pasting or copying and pasting more generally into a, a different section of the genome for LTR retrotransposons. Uh, specifically, these LTRs can, like you said, obviously serve as uh, binding sites for uh, proteins related to gene expression. Um, I guess my question uh, would be if these were specifically created to do that, um, it seems like there'd be a uh, kind of a, a. It seems curious to me. I guess I could say that the designer would make it in such a way that we have these LTR regions related to gene expression, but we also have host genome promoters, like you said, among other things like enhancers and silencers that are also related to gene expression, and so. It, it, it just seems odd to me, and I, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Why would the designer uh, put these very different regions that kind of do the same thing, but don't really need to be as different as they are in order to carry out their functions related to gene expression? So so, so I'm essentially saying if, if you uh, most eukaryotes, for example, already have these promoters, why do we need LTRs to be there also. Like, couldn't the designer have also made a different mechanism where he could have put promoters there already, uh, or, or just a, a completely different way we haven't thought of where it didn't have to involve these specific LTRs? Those are good questions as well. I, I would say it just comes down to the 
for one, the complexity, right? We're not looking at like a two bit code, you know, zeros and ones. We're actually looking at a four letter code, ATCG. And um, a genome of, of essentially three billion letters, six billion in total, you know, when, when three billion from mom, three billion from dad. So I don't think it's a stretch to believe that in, in the front loading of genetic diversity and functional DNA elements, there would be a variety of DNA elements that, that assist in a genome that is nested, consists of multiple overlapping codes and massive amounts of meta information. You'd have all sorts of uh, functional stretches of DNA that are assisting in the uh, gene expression pathway, um, determining cell types, gene regulation, so on and so forth, rather than just, um, you know, one specific genetic element that looks a specific way. And that is all that is used basically for, for gene expression. So I would just say, sure, like we find a variation. I'm not sure if that's answering your question. Are you saying why, why the LTRs that act as promoters for human genes, but also other types of genetic elements that also function as promoters for human genes? Like, why not just one? It seems redundant. Is that is that kind of your question? I want to make sure I'm answering it. Correctly. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, you're basically saying that the designer made it for uh, because of his creative diversity, essentially, right? Well, especially because there's so much that is just going on right now in our bodies that we don't even know that that's happening. I mean, our bodies are regulating our heartbeat, our blood pressure, our brain activity, blood th flow through the body. I mean, <laughs> we're debating here and yet we're thinking about what we're going to say next. And then we're thinking about what we're going to say next, as in like, is that a good thing? Like we're thinking about what we're thinking about. What right. we're thinking. Like there's so much in our body that's going on in terms of regulating all the different systems, the nervous system, endocrine system, cardiovascular sure. system. There's so much going on that I would also expect a variety of incredibly designed, unique and complex DNA elements that that help in that regulatory uh, process. And, and one last thing I'll say is just the developmental process alone. Andrew, we have these various developmental windows that in nine months we go from, you know, a single cell, a zygote to a, a fully functioning, fully formed human being, a, a baby. And that developmental process requires so many DNA elements many being the earth sequences that are functioning right in in development determining cell types determining what's going to go where and how it's going to grow and making sure that there's not overgrowth like making sure that you're not going to grow 10 fingers you know it, it, on one hand instead of five so, so there's just so much going on to make sure that that the human being it develops uh, and forms appropriately and then a lot of those dna elements are, are shut off that their jobs, it's almost like a construction site. You have the construction workers that are actually building the uh, building, let's say. Once they build it, they're done, right? They go on to another job and then that building, whatever it may be, then you get workers in there and maintenance and stuff. So the, the, there's a lot in the genome that to an evolutionist looks redundant, but it's actually the fact that it, these elements, these redundant elements have already done their job and now they're either turned off, not expressed, or they're repurposed for a possible future job via environment, via stressor. Um, but I'm saying a lot there, Andrew. So go ahead if, if there's some pushback or another question. Sure, yeah. Feel free. So, so, so kind of just to, to clarify, you are um, indeed saying though that the designer, if he exists, um, he 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 could have this created potential of diversity in uh, designing things in different ways depending on kind of the the choices he's making, right? I, I would think so. I mean, at my slide here, notice you know the genome is a multi-dimensional operating system for an sure. ultra complex biological computer with built-in error correcting and self modification codes. I mean, we can go on and on about the mul multiple overlapping DNA and RNA codes. Right. 
So yes, I would expect amazing variety in terms of the functional DNA elements that are actually designed and used for regulation, expression, so on and so forth. Sure. Yeah. So, so I think that gets into the the last thing I, I want to, to ask, and we can go on a, a bit more about this before we wrap things up. Sure. Um, basically, if my I guess my argument would be, if you're saying that the designer does have the potential to have this kind of created diversity in in what he designs, as you said, with these LTR versus or LTRs versus other kind of promoter like regions that we see in different organisms. Um, and you also mentioned with say the the mouse or the the, the mice earlier, basically, uh, actually you mentioned the, the let's see, development. Uh, I, I'm sure you're familiar with basically the, the placenta development due to, uh, uh, how do you pronounce it? Sync, 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 sync <laughs> I'm probably mispronouncing it. Yeah. Yeah, sing Satan. Yeah, you know which one I'm talking about, basically. Yeah. Um, the the fact that we have say different sing Satan ERV sequences in different locations in say the mouse versus the human, um, which shows yeah. that even though they perform the same function, they can be in different spots. Um, but also say in ERVs that do have the same location or, or in homologous lo loci, for example, um, that it, it seems like you could explain that by variety, but it seems kind of contrived to me that, okay, he would design it in different places here, um, but wouldn't design it because of, like you said, the, his potential for created diversity um, in why, why would he design it in the same location if he could also design it in different locations? It, it seems kind of inconsistent, if you ask me, based on what, what, what you've said so far. Right. That's a very good question. Um, firstly, be before I answer it in, in, in great detail, um, would you say that a lot of these, gen let's just say genetic markers, okay? Because there's a lot of different types of markers we could look at. Pseudogenes, herb sequences, okay, you name it. Uh, that these highly conserved mitochondrial proteins as well, right? We can look to like right. the CO1 gene or we can look to cytochrome C. You would say, correct me if I'm wrong, especially because one of your expertise, Andrew, is phylogeny right. and phylogenetic systematics. <clears throat> the reason why, let's say the CO1 gene or let, let's say the cytochrome C, okay? One of these ATP synthase proteins. The reason why... It, the human and the chimpanzee, let's say, although that protein has one function, right? One job. The reason why it's slightly different though, there's a slight variation between the cytochrome C in humans and chimps. The reason is due to common ancestry as in time since the split. For example, let's say you have a cytochrome C in the common ancestor, humans and chimpanzees split, humans go one way, uh, chimpanzees go the other, then you'd expect some variation since the split. And right. therefore there'd be more variation in let's say cytochrome C in humans and a mouse, because obviously humans and, and mice share a more distant common ancestor than humans and chimpanzees. So more differences in, in these highly conserved um, genetic markers between humans and mice than between humans and chimpanzees because of time since most recent common, last common ancestors. Is that an accurate representation or just want to make sure? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that's good so far. Okay, so you're saying why didn't God just make them all the same then? Why the variation um, that that looks like common descent? Why not make them the same? Well, why sometimes in different I, I guess just to, to clarify, uh, to be specific here, um, yeah. I'm saying why didn't he make them either all the same or all in different places? Like why the kind of the combination between the two? Right. And I think that's a good question because you know what? That is what um, a combination of the, two, of the two, that is what you'd expect based on common ancestry and divergence. 
Um, but one paper here, this is what we're finding. Again, unexpected findings all the time. We're finding that a lot of genetic, a lot of functional stretches of DNA, including proteins. Like here's a paper, protein moonlighting, I find in uh, nuclear DNA proteins to be rather fascinating. So notice this. A single protein with multiple functions might seem surprising, might seem surprising, but there are actually many cases of proteins that moonlight or have more than one role in an organism. Right. Okay. Now, here's the thing. We're just in the um, infancy of understanding the DNA language. Okay, so there's a couple things I have to respond to this because this is a very technical argument you're using, actually. This is probably one of the better lines of evidence for common descent. Uh, and it, it deserves a technical response. So here's the thing. Since we are in the beginning stages of understanding the DNA language, it's kind of like if, if I, I don't understand any Russian. I can't read it. I can't write it, okay? If I was hired to go to Russia to be a proofreader, okay? Let's say they got a book. 300 pages, you know, Donnie, I want you to proofread this. Tell me, you know, what's a spelling mistake and what's not. I'm going to have trouble doing that because I don't fully understand the Russian language. And I'm going to be looking at it and I'm going to sure. say, you know what, this looks like it's a spelling mistake when in fact, maybe it's not. Maybe that's actually the way the word spelled. And that's kind of how it is in the DNA language. And it's, it's very difficult right now for scientists to actually identify what is a mistake and what is not. What is a mutation and what is not? What is a base substitution? What is, um, you know, an insertion, deletion, so on and so forth. That, that's how it, and, and that's why we as, as creationists, we say, no, we need to understand the fact that what we may be looking at is reflection of design diversity and, and the front loading of functional DNA elements. How this applies to um, your argument here is the reason why they don't all look the same and that they may be in different spots. Let's say, let, let's say they look the same in a human and a chimpanzee or just slightly different, just a slight variation, sure. but a lot different between humans and, a, and a, a mouse. And also it's in a different spot in the mouse than the human sure. and the chimpanzee. Well, here's the thing though. If, if what I'm saying is true, okay, based on what we know about protein moonlighting, maybe other functional stretches of DNA have a primary function and a secondary function with the secondary function being specific to the respective organism having to do with information flow. So that means this, let's say an herb sequence is in a different spot in the mouse because although its primary function is embryological development, its secondary function may be different to the secondary function in humans and chimpanzees. And therefore it pri its primary function may be the same, but its secondary function is different. And so we find it in, in a different location. The question is though, what is that secondary function? And that's where creationists can make testable predictions. I've made specific predictions on IRV sequences. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen made predictions on like uh, these highly conserved proteins that, you know, maybe this or maybe that is the secondary function. Um, that's a lot there. Go ahead, dissect that if you want. What are your thoughts overall? Do you think that's a good prediction? You know, go ahead. I, I accept all your criticisms, <laughs> Andrew. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I guess there... <sighs> The, the problem is there are multiple things I could touch on there, but I feel like if I do, then we're probably going to go over time. <laughs> um, the longest so I, podcast of all podcasts. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess if it's okay with you, maybe I'll kind of make a, my final points. You can make your final points on kind of this general topic or maybe the specific one. And then we can, Either continue this at a, a part two, maybe, or just yeah. kind of uh, well, something like that. Well, if you don't mind this, Andrew, this sure. for sure, like for we need an entire podcast for what I'm about to ask you. But I am sure. curious because it does apply. Because I think we have about three or four answers to a lot of the questions you've asked, as in why do they look so similar to exogenous retroviruses? Why are they designed with the integrase, the reverse transcriptase? Why do we see the scars, right? Well, the bigger question, okay, and a lot of evolutionists scoff at this model, but I actually haven't seen any, any really strong rebuttal. That's why I'm kind of curious, and I'd like to just get a, 
uh, maybe um, a, a generic response from you, and then we can touch on it later in a in, in a sure. future podcast. Okay. The question is, what is the origin of retroviruses in general? Because retroviruses require a host to replicate. Okay, so the question is, did or did retroviruses come from with from um, outside the host or within? Right. So notice this slide. Um, accordingly, retroviruses could have originated from within the host genome instead of invading it from outside. This had to have been the case in any scenario since viruses. This is what I want you to focus on, Andrew, since viruses are dependent upon host cells. This means that the cells genome had to predate viruses. Viruses are incapable of surviving without a host cell. That is, the herbs are more likely rogue products of the genomes of their host. So here's the thing. There's a strong case to be made that we have these variation-inducing genetic elements, okay, that you can call herb sequences, and bad viruses actually originated from, from them, from within the host. And so the question is, if they are originating from within the host and the host has these genetic sequences that are made of the, the gag, the pole, the ENV, the LTRs, reverse transcriptase integrase, well, I feel like the evolutionists might have it backwards. The question is, why do the exogenous retroviruses look like the ERV sequences? Because if they actually came from the ERV sequences from within the genome, then it makes sense. That's why they look like them, because they came from them. They're rogue products. Now, a lot of evolutionists would scoff at it, and, and it, it's um, it's definitely not a prevailing model, but I think there's a lot of explanatory power in it. So I'd be curious as to your initial thoughts of that, and also, Andrew, how would you um, explain th this paradox in terms of the origin of retroviruses to begin with? Did they... Right. right? Go ahead. Go ahead. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, so kind of, uh, unfortunately, you've hit on the... Uh, a, a major question, kind of conundrum in, in virology in general, which is how did viruses at large originate if they're dependent on their their uh, host uh, cell, whatever cell that may turn out to be. Um, and I, I do think one of the, maybe not the, the exclusive hypothesis for their origin, but one of them, like you said, is that they, they originally came from the cell. Maybe it's genetic right. material of some sort. And I think that's one potential answer to your question is maybe they didn't originate um, or these uh, retroviruses alone didn't originate from these sequences, but maybe at least a, a broad range of viruses in general, if that makes sense. So I think you're, you're definitely onto something there, um, and, and I, I definitely will look into it because that is a, a very interesting question to be sure. Um, but I, I, I think... There's, there's just so much research that still needs to be done, if that makes right. sense, regarding wh wh where specific viral lineages came from. So you would say then that some viruses, there's many types of viruses, obviously. Right. Um, some viruses, maybe the, the, the bulk of retroviruses, actually did originate from within the cell rather than outside, since, since they need a cell to replicate. That kind of makes sense, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's that's definitely a, a plausible scenario, at least. And and here's the thing: this is exactly what we're saying with with what's called the VIGE model, right. the variation inducing genetic element model. That bad viruses that cause disease that are harmful, HIV being one of them, are actually rogue products of that which they came from, and that which they came from was initially designed good. And that's why we see the herb sequences do serve a lot of good. They definitely do serve a lot of good. So if they originated from the cell, then maybe the reason why they resemble, right? If, if they came from the cell, then the reason why they, they resemble the herbs, then they have all these different components is because, well, of course, that's where they came from. And obviously, you know, there, there's a lot of, of study still right. in terms of, of that hypothesis. But I, that I, I have heard good. the, yeah, the, the Vi, Vige hypothesis, basically. Um, uh, unfortunately, like I said, I haven't had the time to look into it in as much depth as some of these other topics we've discussed. But I think that's definitely a motivation for a, uh, I, I, I guess, once I do that, we can continue from there. I, Absolutely. It, yeah. So I think okay, that's go a ahead, good Andrew, motivation. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think you were saying, and I think that's great. I, I just stopped screen share and we're almost at the yeah. two hour mark. So Andrew, we made it. We made it. Yeah. I didn't think Ken Rock and I would make it either. The, see, the, the difference between these podcasts is they're not formal. So there's no really long openings, long rebuttals. We're just right. talking for two yeah. hours straight, right? And, and that, that that gets tiring, especially on a topic like this. It is so technical, right. so important. And uh, Andrew, you, you've been very uh, sophisticated in your dialogue, been very respectful. So what I want to do is uh, go ahead. Anything I said there, wrap up your thoughts, wrap up your points. I'll do the same and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. So I think this is definitely a, an interesting question to look into our ERVs from common ancestry or separate ancestry. Obviously, I believe uh, a, a, as this discussion shows that they uh, the the most parsimonious explanation when you account for all the data is common ancestry. I will admit that there is a a always a like uh, a small likelihood that they could have been designed because science cannot uh, rule out all explanations. But I, I do think that it can show that some are more likely to be true than others, and that some are more consistent internally or more. Uh, are simpler explanations. And I think, at least in my opinion, the data shows that common ancestry fits that category. Um, but but that's just my view and definitely we'll, we'll probably have future discussions where we uh, disagree with one another on that. But I, I appreciate the discussion we've had. Um, the last one we've had uh, kind of got a, a bit heated and that's because there were multiple people in the room. But in this kind of format I, I i appreciate kind of the the cordial back and forth we've had so far absolutely it's exactly why i'm doing this podcast uh sometimes in these uh, open mics uh you know it gets passionate you got 10 different voices and you got yep. 10 different people wanting to make their points so it's hard and i really wanted to this was important too because it's something you can't do in an open mic is spend an hour like we did understanding the argument, understanding what the problems are, understanding what we need to right. discuss. And that's why the shared mutations argument and the hierarchies uh, that flow from them, it, it's such a deep topic that it's, it's hard to give a quick answer. And that's why, you know, we spent so much time discussing, you know, the assumptions behind DNA differences. We discuss, you know, fixed versus unfixed sequences and mutations. And what I'd like to say, though, for, for the audience sake, I just want to kind of wrap this up here. And sure. Andrew, uh, I, I understand <laughs> that you're going to disagree with this, and that's completely fine. Yeah, uh, sure. We can even do a greater discussion on it next time. But basically, okay, our model in its most simple form, all right, starts from Genesis. It's as simple as this. The Bible tells us that God created man in his image. Okay, so us as biblical creationists, uh, at least, um, you know, my approach is to say, okay, if this is true, if we really are made in the image of God, then there must be something about us that reflects the divine. As it applies to ancestry, universal or separate ancestry, okay. Well, then maybe we can get a sense for how God designed the biological world based on how we design things. And this is the part that you love, Andrew. <laughs> but, but, you know, and, and I say it because I, I think it um, not everybody has to be an expert on this very technical topic, to at least to, to understand this part. So here's the thing. I can look to the way we design things, at least currently. I think we're in the infancy of understanding God's design and say, OK. And Andrew, this is where we're definitely going to have a greater debate. Okay, it, it so turns out that, you know, there exists, in a sense, hierarchies in, in the design world, whether we look at computer code, the way systems are built, uh, modes of transportation, things like that. We see uh, human engineers build in homologous patterns. We see human engineers build interesting, uh, what looks to be transitional forms. We see that definitely in the military. And we see that 100% with family vehicles. And I know as, as a family man too, like these crossover SUVs, it's like, man, what is that? It's hard to classify vehicles. And we find hard to classify animals. But here's the one thing I want to say. As it applies to, I'm, I'm setting up a, a, a possible answer to your question too, a more simple answer to why maybe God 
created an ERV sequence that functions in embryological development in humans, chimpanzees, and mice, but it, it, it turns out it's in a different location in, in mice. Well, you can actually look it up. There's vehicles where the engine has a function, a primary function for a vehicle, right? And uh, I mean, without the, the engine, your, your vehicle is not going to function. It's worthless. But you can find an engine in certain vehicles that's built in the front, that's built in the back, and some, believe it or not, that are built in the middle. All right. So the question is, well, why? Why didn't human engineers just put the engine in the same spot in every single type of uh, mode of transportation? You know, why is there variation? And that the, the, the curious part is we're asking the same question about the biological world. So to me, this goes right back to my basic starting point. Maybe we can get a sense for how God designed based on the way we design. Okay, and I'll end it there. But what I typically like to do, Andrew, and this didn't work out this way, is whoever my guest is, I want them to have the last word. Okay, because you were so willing to engage. So what I want to do is, is give you the last word. Okay, so if there's just a, a couple things you wanted to address, bam, we'll, we'll end it right after that. So Andrew, thanks for doing this. To the audience, thanks for tuning in. This has been a ton of fun. We're definitely going to do more of these. To any other evolutionists, but before you get the last word, Andrew, to any other evolutionists that want to do this as well, jump on the podcast. Let's pick a topic. Um, you know, endogenous retroviruses seems to be the hot topic. So if you want that to be the topic, let's do it. I know me and Mark Drysdale are going to be doing one on, on that soon mm. as well. Reach out. Let's set it up. This is a lot of fun as I think you can see here with my discussion with Andrew. Andrew, go ahead, final word, final thoughts, and then we are going to call it. Yep. Uh, <laughs> kind of unfortunate that I missed a, a few seconds of your explanation there. My internet cut out for a, a short time there for a sec, but I did hear most of it. Yeah, obviously we are going to disagree on that. Um, but I, I think... It is good to examine the foundations of our ideas, especially in science, where sometimes the wrong assumptions can lead to the wrong conclusions. Um, obviously, in, in, in my view, sometimes when those assumptions hold, the conclusion probably holds too. But that's, uh, again, a, another topic for another time. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that. I've had fun with this discussion on ERV so far. All right, Andrew, appreciate it. Make sure you send it to my boy, Speed of Sound. Right. We'd love to hear his thoughts. Uh, and, yeah, he, uh, he's, the, he's probably going to have something to say about it when he sees this. So. No worries. Hey, I appreciate listening to the critics because it, yeah. it's how I improve as well. And it helps with my research and study. So, uh, Andrew, uh, appreciate you jumping into uh, this podcast. It's not always easy. But we like to uphold and promote critical thinking. So uh, we just want uh, more people of differing views to feel comfortable in uh, jumping into the octagon and uh, engaging in these uh, technical and important topics. Okay, so the uh, SFT Creation versus Evolution podcast episode two is over. Share it around. Uh, hit that subscribe button, like, uh, reminder bell, notification bell. And God bless all. Stand for Truth is out.
right, we are live. Hey, everyone. I want to welcome you to this important debate about uh, endogenous retroviruses. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm going to be your moderator for tonight. Um, so if you guys have any questions, you can tag me at Redefine Living. That's two words. And so, yeah, um, just real quick, I want to let you guys know if you could uh, hit that thumbs up. It'll really help with the algorithm. And then, of course, leave comments after the video. That all helps, too. So I guess... Um, over on our right, we have Luca. You want to take a moment to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, as you, most of you know, uh, I'm an atheist. I have a degree in chemistry. Uh, I work as a teacher. And I recently uh, opened a small, very small channel. And that's all. Uh, that's me. All this right. Really Thank you. One. And then uh, definitely someone who's no stranger to the channel because it's his channel. <laughs> Go ahead, Donnie. <laughs> Sam, thanks for doing this, brother. You nailed it. I'm going to be out of a job soon. You're so good at being a host and a moderator. So, yes, my name is Donnie B. I'm the founder of Standing for Truth Ministries. Uh, in terms of formal debates, I believe this is my 98th. I'm excited to be debating Luca, who's uh, well-studied and well-educated in these areas, being a, a chemistry teacher. So I do appreciate you doing this, Luca. I've written a book specifically on this topic, the Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook, which Luca has assured me that he's he's read it all. I've also written uh, numerous other books, and I think as a ministry, we've, we've written close to 20 now. So uh, looking forward to this. Sam, thank you for being a host and moderator. And Luca, thanks for uh, being willing to engage in this debate. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Um, all right. So really quick, the format, we're going to have 15 minute openings followed up by eight minute rebuttals. And we're going to have a 40 minute discussion, which will be a dumpster fire, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, we're going to have five minute closings after that, and then we're going to have 25 minute uh, question and answers. So again, tag me, two words, redefine living, be patient with me. I'm going to try to be saving these comments. So um, yeah, so I guess with that said, unless there's anything else, uh, who's going to go first? So was that, Luke, are you going to go first? For me, it's the same, Donnie. Yeah, well, I mean, being the, the title, Our Endogenous uh, Retrovirus is Good Evidence for Evolution. Uh, Luca says, yes, I say no. So Luca, we'll have you start. All okay. right. So I think what I'll do, unless you don't want me to, Luca, I can let you know at 14 minutes. Um, then mm -hmm. you'll have one minute to kind of finish up or just go right to 15 minutes and then we'll yes. be gracious. Uh, I do have uh, my clock here. So, okay. But uh, I do appreciate it. Appreciate it. Cool. Uh, the so All right. well, uh, if okay. we are ready, I can share my screen and start my presentation. And let me uh, remind people, uh, Redefine Living, you might have already said, uh, for the Q&A portion, yeah, make sure you're tagging at Redefine Living, not at Standing for Truth. And then that way he won't, um, he won't miss it. So, Luca, yeah, when you want to uh, share screen, let me know. I'll, I'll get it up there for you for your 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, uh, that's the end of the <laughs> the presentation. Uh, you all can see it, Luca. Yes. You're giving us a sneak peek into the after credit scene before yes. the debate even starts. <laughs> yes, Marvel style. Okay, yeah. Whenever you're ready. Okay, so debate uh, are endogenous retrovirus. Uh, evidence for evolution? Of course, uh, my answer is yes. So what's the evidence? Well, we have those sequences in our genome. They look like remnants of viral infection and they follow a pattern cladistic. On these things, I think that me and Donny would agree uh, without a problem. So where we do not agree. Evolution, we are results of Asian infection, and they reflect evolutionary pattern, the cladistic. Uh, for creation, ARVs are designed by a creator, and they reflect a design. So those views are equal. 
For me, they are not, but we will talk about it uh, a little bit more. So, uh, the Vige uh, hypothesis, I do not know the pronunciation of these things, but we will talk about it. So, uh, using the words of the author of the paper, we will see those are vages. So, uh, they are elements in our genome. Uh, they, for this author, they precede uh, ARVs and I, they are the explanation for their existence. So not a viral infection, but a unit of DNA designed by the creator. A unit that uh, is the origin of uh, viruses uh, in the views of this scientist. So here you can see a small part of the paper and I want to point out uh, the style of this paper. Uh, this is uh, one of the pictures and it does represent uh, what will be the evolutionary uh, view of the process. And I think that it's not uh, really um, something that uh, a real uh, scientist would um, use, I think. Uh, first of all, the um, terms used are uh, for sure um, made by R, um, are for a uh, public of uh, young earth creationists, not for scientists. The, um, it's not for scientists, this paper. And I think that uh, it's wrong on a couple of things. You cannot uh, have a substitution like that. I do not think that any scientist will propose anything like that. But uh, it's not my real problem with the paper. Uh, here you can see uh, the proposed uh, mechanism for evolution. Uh, and here you can see uh, the mechanism proposed in the paper for the existence of ERVs uh, for the creation uh, worldview. Let's say that. As you can see, those units, those units uh, in this uh, hypothesis are already in the genome. Here you can see they are already designed like that. And that's the hypothesis from this paper. Why I have a problem with it? Uh, I will say that this hypothesis could uh, be right, but I have a specific reason to uh, do some criticism on it. So, here you can see my points. That would be a good hypothesis if we can show uh, the intact, uh, intact uh, VIG. Maybe not all of them, but, but at least some of them. And how will it be possible to show something like that? Well, uh, if uh, the young earth creation uh, narrative is true, we could uh, find uh, DNA of ancient humans or, or at least humans close to the flood, so less uh, degraded humans, and we would be able to show these elements in uh, our genome. So, um, yes, uh, also to show the actual presence of a designer would be uh, optimal, uh, let's say that. Let's see uh, on the uh, secular side uh, what we have. So, of course, uh, for what I can say, tell, uh, ARVs are uh, traces of ancient infections. 
Uh, so why we think so? Uh, it's possible to show a mechanism that leads to the formation of ERBs. So we can observe this kind of mechanism. And of course, uh, if we can show uh, instances, uh, example of this happening and to show um, these uh, elements to be integrated in the genome and to be kept, uh, to be in inherited uh, by the descendant of that organism. So yes, we can, uh, but it's not like I will just tell you so. I, I did bring some example. So first uh, example, uh, it's uh, from actually from uh, uh, um, cita uh, citation, a quote from uh, um, Dennis book, uh, more like uh, one of the paper cited uh, in the book. And yes, uh, scientists did observe uh, de novo uh, insertion of ARVs, and they also observed the degradation uh, after the inclusion in uh, the DNA. It's a very interesting thing if you think about that. Also, integration of transposon, so not uh, ERBs, uh, but transposons. Uh, transposons can be um, the result of the infection of something different from a uh, virus, like uh, bacteria, but they can also be uh, from uh, viruses. Uh, and that's an example uh, from my previous debate. Um, basically, uh, the uh, insertion that led to the formation of corn, a uh, very uh, peculiar example, but I think it's a good one. Why not uh, using it again? I think it's a good one. Last one. I do not bring any citation for that, and there is a reason. Uh, I do have some uh, experience with those kind of things, so I can talk about uh, GMOs in some details without a citation. And it's important to note that we do understand this process, uh, the integration of transposon, or ERBs uh, so well that we can use this process to uh, do GMOs. So it's a process so understood to this point that we can use it to our advantage. Uh, so that's a very um, good point from Donny. I want to admit it admit it. So uh, I was pointing on my previous debate with him that uh, LRVs, long terminal uh, repeats, were basically non-coding uh, pieces of DNA, but it's true. They do have a function uh, time to time. They can uh, promote uh, the expression of some genes and some are really, really important for us. Uh, I think that Donny gave uh, plenty of examples about this. So um, it's these look very good for creationists. Uh, why I say uh, the opposite? Why? Well, uh, let's look at some citation, some quotes, uh, sorry. This first quote is from uh, the book, uh, The Endogenous Retrovirus and the Book. And you can find here uh, the page uh, where I did find uh, this uh, citation, this quote. So uh, it's a young earth creation uh, quote. 
uh, it's not uh, from a secular scientist. And the view of the author, of course, is similar to Danny, but I want to point out that even them say that most of ERVs are defective retroviral copies. And now we get to uh, a paper. This paper is cited, uh, is quoted in the book. Uh, so we can say it's still a quote from the work of Donny. And yes, uh, Donny is right. Uh, we do have elements that can promote uh, gene expression uh, and they are very important to us. But most of those uh, scientists uh, those um, function are in intragenetic uh, places. So they do not uh, work uh, as intended. They are uh, not uh, aiding us in any way. And they can be also uh, dangerous time to time. Uh, actually. So it's very important to note this. Uh, not every uh, ERV is, is useful. Uh, most of them are defective or they are in uh, non um, in places where they do nothing, basically. Let's See, last, uh, this is my last argument, cladistic. Uh, so um, you all know for sure what cladistic is. Uh, here you can see uh, baraminology, uh, that's uh, a phylogenetic tree uh, from uh, answers in Genesis. I do not know if this source is okay maybe uh, Donny has a better one, but you can see their baramin and how um, lineage work in the young earth uh, model. And when we talk about uh, my model, well, here you can see the tree of life uh, for my side. Very, very good. Uh, it's different. So when we look at uh, ERVs, what we find, and here you can see the result. Uh, it's taken from a paper uh, about old world monkeys. We actually are in this clade, uh, at least for my position. And so it's quite important. I did not read the paper. I was just interested in uh, the picture. So, conclusion. Here are my conclusion. The Vige hypothesis could be good if you can show evidence. The vast majority of ERVs seem to be inactive or damaged. Cladistic evidence, uh, for what I can tell, uh, does support my side. So, I at this point, I do not see any reason to think that Donny position is reasonable, but I'm open to being wrong. Thanks for watching. For any question, contact me. This is my YouTube channel, very little, but it's growing. And I hope to see you soon. All right. Thanks, Luca. Good job. You, you even got a comment on your lab coat. They said you should have a beaker behind you, maybe. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So I just want to remind everyone to tag me, redefine living, two words. Um, I will be looking in the chat, though. So if you do ask a question at Standing for Truth, I'm going to try to grab those two, but uh, no promises. So that said, uh, Brother Donnie. 15 minutes, whenever you're ready. All right, thank you, Sam. Let me just get my slides up here real quick. 
And okay, here we go. Can somebody share my? Just kidding. I'll share my own screen. So here we go. Oh, let me do that real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Okay. I'll hide this. Let me know if my audio and everything's coming in nicely. Yeah, just go full screen, maybe. But everything sounds good. All right. Let's have some fun. I'll start my timer here. Luca, thanks so much for your opening. Lots of interesting points to address. And as a matter of fact, several that I'll address here in my opening statement. So endogenous retrovirus is evidence for evolution. Donnie B versus Luca Medugno, debate number 98. Um, I've written a book on this, as, as I've uh, pointed out earlier. And I answer all of the, the common questions, challenges, objections regarding this this topic, I'm currently working on a follow-up that uh, basically deals with very thoroughly all of the objections and challenges and just the repeating of talking points that I address directly in the handbook itself. I'll be uh, putting that all into a follow-up uh, follow book, refuting the critics. Again, the Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook is available on Amazon, and you can find endless content on our Standing for Truth ministry. So the title of tonight's debate, are endogenous retroviruses good evidence or reasonable evidence for evolution? And first thing I want to point out that endogenous retroviruses, what are they? Well, they're very small pieces of DNA that are found within the genomes of many types of creatures. And the most important question to ask is, are these DNA elements the ancient remnants of past viral infections? Or are they created units of DNA function? And this is the question that my opening presentation will answer. Now, firstly, when it comes to the word evolution, okay, are endogenous retroviruses good evidence for evolution? Well, what do we mean by evolution? If by evolution you mean dogs and wolves are related, well, we're not going to have a problem, okay? Because evolution, biological evolution just simply means changes in allele frequencies in populations over generations, okay? Change over time. People say, you know, phones have changed over time. Computers have changed over time. I'm not gonna have any issues with that. But if by evolution, you mean that dogs, chimpanzees, humans, banana plants, and strawberries are related, well, that's the kind of evolution that we're gonna have a disagreement over. That's the kind of evolution that is not scientific, and that is the one we're essentially debating here tonight in context of endogenous retroviruses. So the separate ancestry model, as compared to the universal common ancestry model that would say whales and strawberries are related through common ancestry, would suggest that God created distinct kinds of animals. Okay, The Bible clearly uh, tells us that God created Adam and Eve separate from any other form of life. So here's a basic diagram. Uh, that you can find in a must-read book, Contested Bones, where we have humans separate from all other forms of life, okay? I can, I can stay as close to home as possible and demonstrate through various uh, genetic-related arguments, like the, the Y chromosome dissimilarity between humans and chimpanzees, mitochondrial DNA mutation rates, Y chromosomal uh, DNA mutation rates, DNA function, linkage blocks. I can demonstrate that humans are not related to any other form of life, specifically not related to chimpanzees. So if humans aren't related to chimpanzees, then that means they're definitely not related to strawberries and, and whales. So our model would suggest that in the beginning, God would have front loaded the original created kinds, okay, humans, and then this would obviously apply universally among the original created archetypes, he would have front loaded them with what's called created heterozygosity, which is just a technical of way, uh, way of saying design diversity. Okay, heterozygosity is a state of DNA diversity. And this makes sense both theologically and scientifically because when God said to be fruitful and multiply, he didn't mean that to, to mean, you know, be fruitful and clone yourselves. So pre-existing heterozygosity makes sense, but how this applies to the endogenous retrovirus debate is the fact that God would have also front loaded various classes of DNA elements, functional DNA elements, ERV sequences being one of those, which we're gonna to touch on here, okay? Also, since the DNA differences and DNA diversity is built in, okay, we don't need millions of years to explain the origin of species and new 
chromosomal combinations. Because simply through processes like recombination and gene conversion, you can get a great deal of morphological variability because there's an amazing amount of morphological adaptability built into each created kind. So just through the shuffling of these pre-existing DNA variants, you can get new uh, combinations of chromosomes, allelic variability quickly. Okay, so endogenous retroviruses, let's go over some of the details. Okay, firstly, I want to point out that when it comes to the structure of herbs that Luca touched on a little bit, okay, the structure of herb sequences, they match modern retroviruses. For example, uh, think HIV, okay, where you have, I want to go to a diagram that I put in here, where you have the uh, LTRs on both ends of the retroviral DNA, you're going to have identical sequences known as the LTRs. Okay, those stand for long terminal repeats, which we understand are functional. In between the LTRs, we find the gag, the pole. Now, the pole is what codes for what's called the reverse transcriptase. And then we also have the ENV, which is the envelope protein that codes for the envelope that makes up the body of the virus. And these structures are common in herbs and retroviruses, which is precisely why evolutionists believe they are the ancient remnants of past viral infections, since they share so much similarity to exogenous retroviruses, okay? And this is what I am going to want to touch on, okay? Um, so because uh, Luca, evolutionists like Luca, assume that these herbs are the ancient uh, remnants of past viral infections, and they consider them to be genetic fossils that point to common descent, they will say, as a main line of argument, that the chances of two herbs being inserted at the same exact location in separate organisms, let's say humans and chimpanzees, is very small. Okay, they will argue that the chance of a human and a chimpanzee being infected in the same exact spot by the same specific type of virus is far less than one in 10 million. And to them, this is highly unlikely. And of course, the more shared herb sequences, the more unlikely it becomes that they're inserted independently. But again, that whole argument from statistical probability relies on the assumption that these really are the ancient remnants of past viral infections, as we can see here. Human endogenous retroviruses are expected to be the remnants of ancestral infections. Okay, so they represent 8% of the human genome. They are an important component of the human genome. Uh, according to the evolutionary model, they're incorporated into the genome through the invasion of infectious, exogenous retroviruses that basically would have happened um, millions of years ago. Uh, they look to them as, as fossil viruses. And again, uh, for the most part, they, uh, the evolutionary community will admit they occurred millions of years ago. Exogenous retroviruses are relics of exogenous retroviral infection of germ cells that result in integration of what's called proviral DNA into the host genome. And I've, I've got a whole uh, bunch of points in terms of the uh, details of endogenous retroviruses. What I want to move on to the, the important questions, okay? The important questions that I'm going to answer are, why are, the, uh, why are there herb sequences shared between the genomes of organisms? If viral-like sequences in the genomes of organisms are functional, why do they bear similarity to viral genetic material? What is the best explanation for the nested? So they'll look to what's called a nested hierarchical distribution of these elements, where more herb-like sequences are found in similar locations between a human and a chimpanzee, and with fewer herb-like sequences shared between what is assumed to be a more distant relative, like gorillas, uh, the orangutan, or even uh, mice. Okay, so, you know, Luca would look or appeal to what is called a family tree that he would interpret the uh, nested hierarchical patterns, let's say within primate genomes, in terms of their arrangement of these herb-like sequences as, as reflecting common descent rather than separate ancestry. So I want to answer that question as well. And of course, can the separate ancestry model explain the data better than the common descent model. Okay, so here's an important detail. I want to focus on the placenta for a minute, okay? In the early stages of development, humans will develop what is called a placenta. And a placenta is a temporary organ that arises during pregnancy. This structure is absolutely vital. It's critical for ordinary and healthy pregnancy. It provides nutrition to the developing baby. It also helps uh, it get rid of waste. Now, for the placenta to work, though, this important structure needs to be connected 
to the baby. And an endogenous retrovirus is actually key to embryological development and placental function. The placenta secretes a protein that binds it to the embryo, which keeps the two connected for the next several months of development. We could not, we literally couldn't exist if we did not have endogenous retroviruses. I like to exist. Our award-winning moderator, Sam here, I believe likes to exist. Luca likes to exist. Okay, so if we have shared sequences that are involved in embryological development, well, guess what? Chimpanzees also require embryological development. They require uh, DNA elements functioning and determining cell types, gene expression, gene regulation, okay, acting in cell stress responses. So of course, we're gonna expect uh, shared sequences if these really are created units of DNA function, okay? So the DNA that makes up that protein is very similar to a region of a retrovirus that allows the virus to attach to its host cell. Without endogenous retroviruses, the placenta, which is critical to pregnancy and embryological development, would not work. We would basically not exist, okay? Because these functional DNA elements are essential for life. And endogenous retroviruses don't just assist in embryological development and embryonic immune systems. They also work in our immune systems after we are born. Our immune system pathways are dependent. They are literally dependent upon enzymes generated by endogenous retroviruses and herb like elements. These so-called ancient remnants of past viral infections are safeguarding our bodies against microbes and other viruses. They're also participating in allowing for small scale but significant changes in how the human body works in general. As a matter of fact, these many functional roles, okay, many of the functional roles of herb elements and retrotransposons are basically dependent upon their sequence similarity to exogenous retroviruses, the LTRs, the GAG, the pole, the ENV elements of it. Those are necessary components of the ERV sequence in order for them to be able to carry out their job. Okay, this also comes down to the uh, what's called the junk DNA paradigm. Because ERV sequences have been, and still for the most part, are assumed to be junk, evolutionary uh, leftovers, genomic fossils, viral fossils, okay? So with the overturning of junk DNA comes the overturning of endogenous retroviruses as evidence for common descent. And we understand actually that uh, most of our genome has tremendous evidence for biochemical function or activity. And it was in 2012 that the ENCODE project came out with remarkable findings indicating that upwards of 80% of the human genome was active to some extent. Okay. And of course, the evolutionists have jumped uh, all over that and criticize it. They need to maintain junk DNA. Okay. And I address all that in my book. So here's just a few of the functions of non-coding DNA, regulating expression of genes, regulating uh, genome expression, maintaining genome integrity, work as regulatory elements during transcription and translation, controls the process of mRNA and protein formation, repairing DNA, aiding and folding and maintenance of chromosomes, controlling RNA editing and splicing, not predicted by the evolutionary model, okay? Acting as a mutational buffer, maintaining 3D structure, pseudogenes we now understand are necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the cell. ERVs, again, ERVs are involved in, in antiviral function, tumor suppression, gene regulation, which I do want to uh, touch on, okay? So again, it turns out that one of the major functional responsibility uh, responsibilities of ERV sequences is that they operate in the innate immune system. They literally perform an antiviral role. And I wanna to go to a paper here specifically right here. Switching sides. How endogenous retroviruses protect us from viral infections. Okay, so they literally are our built-in, our built-in antiviral programs. They perform an antiviral role and they are valuable DNA elements that work considerably in the immune system of their host. The way that they systematically exercise their antiviral effect has to do with their sequence, resemblances to viral material. So again, without the nature of the ERV sequence, the way that they're designed and structured, they could not actually carry out the significant job that they perform. 
We should be thanking God that they resemble exogenous retroviruses, okay? The properties of an ERV sequence are absolutely necessary considering their fundamental roles in aiding the immune system. When it comes to explaining the functional roles associated with ERV elements, okay, all we get is rescue devices, storytelling, and imagination. We had a PhD virologist, Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal, admit that they've never actually observed in real time, empirically, there's no technical paper showing a non-functional endogenous retroviral-like sequence going from non-functional to something incredibly functional in determining cell types, in regulating genes, in the embryo, placental development, so on and so forth. So what I say to these rescue devices is uh, cool story, bro. So as I come up to the 15 minute mark, time really flies by. Last thing I wanna point out when it comes to nested hierarchies is as we can see, the evidence best suggests these are created units of DNA function. So if we share more with the chimpanzee than we do with a the mouse, there's no surprise there since humans and chimpanzees share more genetically in physiology, in morphology and anatomy anyways, than let's say between a human and, and a mouse. So, uh, and that's 15 minutes, time flies by and I am going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Yeah, I kicked myself out. So you might have to take away that, uh, that award. So um, yeah, just wanna remind everyone to tag me at Redefine Living. I am looking uh, very carefully over the chat. So if you guys do tag Standing for Truth, um, I'll still grab that and save those questions too. Try to make sure they're relevant if it's possible. Um, we've got questions for you, Luca, coming in, asking if you're married, what are you using your hair and things like that. So, uh, <laughs> so with that said, Luca, you ready for your, your rebuttal? You're going to rebut all that? You got eight minutes whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, give me a second. I set my lock. And okay. So uh, it was a good presentation and I do have a lot of questions and I do have uh, an argument to make. So, uh, Danny is right. Uh, a lot of ERVs are really, really useful and they do resemble uh, viral infections. So, that's a chicken uh, or egg problem. Uh, it can force a uh, beach uh, or uh, an infection from uh, a virus. And uh, here you need to bring uh, the evidence because in my presentation, I did bring up uh, some evidence for what, uh, for my story, let's say that. Uh, I'm personally, I did work uh, with uh, ERBs, not uh, really ERBs. I did work with uh, transposons uh, because I did create uh, GMOs when I was 18 years old, more or less. Uh, so I am familiar to the process. Of course, I was uh, in my high school years, uh, I was not a doctor. I'm not a doctor even now, so uh, I was very young, but I did those kind of things. Uh, and it's very important to see uh, what's the evidence for uh, an hypothesis. Uh, we do understand how uh, transposons, so ERBs works. We do understand so well this process that we can use it to our advantage um i don't know if you, you know but we can create uh, animals with uh, human organs uh, and things like that uh, plants with uh, in part bacteria that can kill a uh, infestant uh, just like that, they produce they, their own uh, poison to kill off insect and things like that. So we do understand uh, the process. 
uh, and we do have evidence for ERB's uh, insertion. I cited uh, corn, uh, but we have more example for it. Uh, for example, I did uh, talk uh, about this wheat potato plant a long time ago, I know. Uh, also, uh, the formation of uh, beneficial mutation on ERBs. I think that uh, the lizard example that uh, I used with Kent was a good one. We are observing the formation of a placenta. And it's quite relevant uh, because Donny was right. The placenta is fundamental for us. But what I, I want you to understand that not uh, every creature uh, needs one. And we are observing creatures uh, evolving uh, a placenta. And they have a placenta, they have not a placenta, they have something in between in the same species. So it's a process and we are observing it in real time. So uh, I want to focus uh, in my discussion over these things because it's important uh, when you have a hypothesis, it's important to bring evidence. And if I would, as if I put myself in the mind of a creationist, I will be thrilled uh, because I have a, an hypothesis. Uh, ERVs come from this uh, design uh, sequence. Good. I need to find the evidence for it. And if uh, young Earth creationist uh, view is right, we have uh, the means to uh, show that's true. Because if the flood was just 4,400 years ago, we can find the DNA of these people. It would be very, very devastating to my position to find uh, Noah's body or things like that. Just think about it. Uh, so I will wait for something like that. It will be very, very exciting. And if you are a creationist, I would advise you to put yourself on the line and go and find uh, evidence. Uh, go to the Middle East, maybe not now if the time it's not good we are uh, almost over with a pandemic but uh, it's not a good time to make travels but i will be very excited uh, if i will be a young earth creationist we have an hypothesis let's find the evidence i do not see that uh, for what i can tell the evidence is still uh, on my side. Uh, on cladistic, it's very important. Uh, Don is right. Um, we would expect some kind of uh, clades on uh, both uh, models, but a designer would not need to follow uh, evolutionary patterns. And that's my problem. If you look at ERBs, they give you a very uh, secular view. Uh, they follow uh, what evolution will be. And I think it's a problem. I can stop my rebuttal here. All right. Thanks, Luca. So, um, yeah, so Donnie, are you ready for a rebuttal? Oh, I'm ready. I'm All ready. right. Well, we got eight minutes sharp. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. All right, I'm going to start my timer now, and uh, I got a lot of visuals for this. 
and this is going to be good. So here we go. Uh, Luca started off. He talked a lot about the VIGE, which, stand, which stands for Variation Inducing Genetic Element Hypothesis, which is supported by the scientific data. I've got paper after paper demonstrating that these transposable elements can actually generate variation, novel variation, through the, their ability to retrotransposition to transpose throughout the genome, okay? So he finds it unconvincing, but uh, the hypothesis, the model is supported by the empirical scientific data. Problem is, Luca will have to show us how his position can explain the origin of retroviruses to begin with, since retroviruses require a host to replicate. It makes sense that they originated from within the genome of their host, of their respective host, since again, retroviruses require a host to replicate evolutionary scientists actually recognize this, which is why a lot of them, and I'll show slides on this, believe in what's called the escape hypothesis, that retroviruses have escaped from the cell rather than uh, originating from outside, okay? Luca talked about the uh, Koala retrovirus paper, which I'll get into as well. That is the one, uh, degradation and remobilization of endogenous retroviruses by recombination during the earliest stages of germ uh, line invasion. I wrote a lot about that in my book. Talked about uh, transposable elements in corn, and uh, it's no evidence for LUCA because, again, these transposable elements can be turned on, right? They're suppressed due to DNA methylation. They're turned back on, they move around, and they can lead to uh, variation. They can lead to uh, novel phenotypes. That information's built in, though, okay? A lot of these DNA elements, they're in latent form. They're waiting to be revealed and manifested outwardly. Uh, LUCA talked about function in intragenic... Um, in intragenic regions, implying that they don't aid in our health in any important way. Well, I'm going to need him to expand on that one because as I went over in uh, my opening statement, herb sequences, without them, we couldn't exist. That's pretty essential. Okay, they're involved in embryological development. Uh, they're involved in, obviously, the, the placenta, determining cell types, gene expression, uh, antiviral protectors cell stress responses, so on and so forth, okay? Some are harmful, yes, since mutations can take a good ERV sequence into something disease-causing. Some jumping genes can jump into the wrong place and that will um, result in disease. For example, if one of these uh, transposable elements were to jump inside a functional gene, that could, um, that could lead to, to harm, okay? So I do want to point out the... Um, argument from the koala, for example, because as we know, um, retroviral sequences, they have RNA as their uh, genetic material. And what they can do is they can reverse transcribe this uh, into DNA, okay, which is necessary for integration. And that's how they get in incorporated into the host genome. Some endogenous retroviruses can make copies of themselves and insert throughout the genome. All right, they can literally move around. And this capability of moving around the genome actually turns out, we read about this in um, specifically the paper that he mentioned in his opening statement, okay? This turns out that um, it can disrupt the incorporation of retroviral DNA into the genome. All right, this is a significant function because it can literally disrupt the endogenization process of retroviruses. This is also one of the numerous explanations for, again, why herb elements look the way they do. Their similarity to retroviral genetic material makes sense because of their functional mechanism. When it comes to the hierarchies, okay, yes, overall, we're going to expect more of these herb sequences or the transposable elements. Uh, between, if they're created units of DNA function, between humans and chimpanzees and between humans and, and a mouse. Just stand back, okay? You can see a relative hierarchy. As a matter of fact, you can see a relative hierarchy when it comes to uh, design modes of transportation. Sedans share more with SUVs than sedans do with, let's say, a, a tractor trailer or a bicycle, okay? These groups within groups within groups patterns are simply characteristic of of design, but you find inconsistency after inconsistency with the hierarchy. Okay, notice this paper, a Herv K provirus in chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas, but not in humans. These observations provide very strong evidence that for some fraction of the genome, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas are more closely related to each other than they are to humans. So even when it comes to the, um, 
the hierarchies, there's inconsistencies. You could look to convergent evolution, again, the Y chromosome, incomplete lineage sorting, so on and so forth. So here we go. Jumping genes generating diversity. The ability of transposons to increase genetic diversity together with the ability of the genome to inhibit most TE activity results in a balance that makes transposable elements an important part of the genome. Here's an important part right here. I want to focus on this uh, part of the citation. If the accidental infection, and remember, there's no observable evidence for how this can could take place, okay? They'll oftentimes try and say that uh, the herb elements have contributed new genes, like the syncytin, which they say is a co-opted ENV protein. I mean, how sweet are the retrovirus, right? Hey, host, you know, you can borrow these genes, and with them, apparently now mammals can come about because notice if the accidental infection of a mammalian ancestor by an exogenous retrovirus had never occurred, the placenta and the mammals that produce it, including humans would have never existed. So Luca keeps saying there's no evidence. Here's evidence. What more do you want? Okay. Human endogenous retroviruses, herbs have recently been suggested as mediators of normal biological processes. There's a family of retrovirus known as Herv H and they strongly influence our growth, development, and our genetic code, okay? And um, they have a massive, these herb uh, sequences have massive impact on embryological development, gene expression, and co-option just isn't gonna cut it. Again, all I gotta say to this uh, rescue device of co-option or the herb elements, you know, um, lent us some of their um, functional sequences, to, to be highly beneficial in, in us, growth, development, so on and so forth. You know, a, a cool story, bro, because <laughs> I'm, I'm into empirical evidence. Retroviral promoters in the human genome. Scientists identify new beneficial function of endogenous retroviruses in immune response. Literally paper after paper. That's why I wrote a whole book on it. 200 papers or 200 pages with just dozens and dozens and dozens of papers all throughout, okay? Notice this, although TEs have in general been regarded as non-functional junk, so they'll admit that they've regarded these TEs as non-functional junk. Notice this, studies have revealed that TEs, transposable elements, have had a substantial and sometimes beneficial impact on host genomes in several ways. Overall, our results provide direct evidence for what? Retrotransposons in actively shaping cell type and species-specific chromatin architecture. And again, paper after paper, notice this one. Far from being junk DNA, the pervasive retrotransposons that populate the genome have a powerful uh, capacity to influence genes and chromatin. Um, LTRs uh, have functional roles. The, the shared mutations, we understand there's uh, mutational hotspots. If the genome is mostly functional, which we know the evidence suggests, then that means there's more hotspots in the genome that exist. Okay, so there's gonna be a lot of commonly affected areas between humans and chimpanzees since most of the genome reflects functionality and so yes within the herb sequence we would expect that even some of the mutations are shared but that brings me to my final point here as i come up to eight minutes okay the bigger question is what is the origin of genetic variation and genetic diversity evolution has looked to mutations we look to created nuclear heterozygosity which means that which the evolutionist points to as a shared quote unquote mutation may not actually be a mutation it may just reflect the functional requirements of the respective organisms herb sequences are not good evidence for common descent and that's eight minutes i yield Good. All right. Great job. So we are going to take a two minute break really quick. Uh, if you guys want to go get some water, do whatever that's going to do, whatever you want to do. Yes. So um, it will. <laughs> while you guys are doing that, I guess I'm going to sing to you. No, I'm not. I'm not going to sing to you. So um, so it looks like looks like John logical, plausible, probable is having an after show. You guys aren't going to want to miss that. Um, so if you guys don't mind, go ahead and hit that thumbs up if you haven't already and subscribe. If you are wondering how you can support the ministry uh, in the video description, there are a few options. Uh, but really, the best thing you can do is just by hitting that thumbs up button and, you know, share this video out, these uploads on social media. It really helps with the algorithms or after these uploads come back and leave a comment. So, um, yeah, so there's a few streams coming up. There's a debate between. Uh, T-Rock, who's who's awesome, and T-Jump. So that'll definitely be 
uh, something to watch. We have a debate coming up about Second Peter. What's the best exegesis of Second Peter, uh, chapter two twenty? There's a Bible translation debate, a King James verses debate. Uh, that's going to be coming up pretty soon. I think um, later on this week or next next week, we have another uh, another debate here with Kent Hoven coming up. What is the best evidence for evolution? And uh, another Bible translating debate coming up here also. And um, yeah, hopefully Professor McQueen won't be too long before he comes and there's another stream. You guys, there's playlists. There's tons of content, a lot of stuff in those playlists, uh, past debates. Uh, so, yeah, go check it out and, and share it out. If you want to help the channel grow, that's what we can do. So uh, with that said, it looks like we are into our 40-minute open discussion. You guys ready? You, you want me to pick a topic or are you just going to go for it? I think I think this Google brought up uh, a corn. And uh, Donnie, I think you said that was a corny line of evidence. <laughs> that was more than a corny joke. <laughs> yes, uh, I think that Go corn ahead. is a good one, uh, actually. There is a reason uh, because we think that we can demonstrate that those insertion really happened. Uh, first of all, we have uh, archaeology um, supporting that because we do know uh, what was the more ancient plant and that was the Teosinte. Uh, and it's important because uh, when we are talking about archaeology... Actually, Luca, let me just ask you a clarifying mm -hmm. question. Do you believe that my model on endogenous retroviruses suggests that there are no true events where exogenous retroviruses make their way into the germ cell and are passed on? Well, it's possible to have both, but if we are talking about uh, my model, we have uh, a mechanism to insert those. If we are looking to your... Um, well, in, your, in, in my uh, book, Luca, just for another clarification, I do talk, I have a whole section on uh, fixed herbs, versus unfixed herbs. So herbs mm -hmm. that are pre-existing and created versus herbs that are the result of um, the infection of, of an exogenous retrovirus that infected in the reproductive cell lines and was passed on. Do you remember what that prediction is? Yes, uh, that we will not observe uh, fixed ones. And that's my point. Uh, the one with the Teosinte was fixed. And we can demonstrate that was a real event because if you look to archaeology, we have a sequence and we are, do not know where are, are you saying are you saying the transposable element in the maze example was fixed and functional? It got fixed after it, the event. Okay, so it got fixed. Is it functional? Yeah. It was in yes, and and you watched it in real time get fixed in corn, right? No, we did observe the process through archaeology, because if we know where we start and we know where we get, we know that event takes place. Okay, but this um, jumping gene this transposable element in, in the maze, in the corn that led to variation, it mm -hmm. had a pre-existing function? It was not there. Because I, I, I read through the paper and it looked like the transposable element was silenced. Because remember, a lot of these transposons, they, through DNA methylation, they're silenced or turned off. But due to environmental trigger, or stressor, the appropriate stressor, they can be activated. They can, you know, a lot of these tra uh, retrotransposons have a, have a promoter in them. And so they can move around the genome from one chromosomal location to another, generating function, generating variation that can be passed on. Yes, but you need the, an infection to have that element. And we know that that take place. If you don't like uh, maize, we can talk about this with both the plant. In that case, we 
also know the kind of bacteria that infected the plant. Well, we know so well this process that we design uh, GMOs for meat. We I, 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 know I, the well, and, and for the audience sake, GMO stands for genetically modified yes. organisms. So, right, we have human intervention here, human manipulation. But I'm curious, how does this help the case for ape to man evolution for humans and chimpanzees sharing a common ancestor, right? How does this help the case since plants, as far as I know, <laughs> don't need functional DNA elements for embryological development. Plants oftentimes have a lot of uh, variation built in redundancy due to the environments that they exist in. There's a lot of silenced transposable elements that can be turned on for adaptive episodes. But when it comes to humans and chimpanzees supposedly sharing a common ancestor, okay, how does that help your case there? I mean, where do we see in real time? Well, I'm, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Don, I'm using the examples that I'm more familiar with because I work with GMOs and I was in a school uh, that was uh, teaching um, agriculture. So those are the example I'm more familiar with, but we do have example uh, of those even in uh, uh, mammals and things like that. Of course, plants are a good one because we can trace uh, the infection. In the case of the sweet potato plant, we also know the kind of bacteria, so we do know the process. And they are still eukaryotes, so they share a lot of process with us. So okay, it's so not that far-fetched example. Okay, so let me... Of course, we are... Same? Yes. I, I just don't find the um, example from, from Mays. I read the paper. It, it do, it's not convincing to me because, again, DNA methylation, okay, uh, the, the epigenome can essentially keep a lot of these pre-existing functional transposable elements silenced until they need to be called upon through environmental uh, stimuli and environmental stressors. But when it actually comes to, let's say, mammals like us or the chimpanzees, because typically the evolutionists want to say that chimpanzees and humans are undoubtedly related because of shared herb sequences or shared alu sequences or shared um, you know, these various classes of retrotransposons. So I'm very curious what your best example is over the last few months of you reading my book and studying. Okay. An example wow. like this, where these herbs, human endogenous retrovirus are playing important roles in what? Embryological development where notice this, if this supposed um, accidental infection of a mammalian ancestor by an exogenous retrovirus had not occurred, the placenta and the mammals that produce it, including humans, would have never existed. I want to see a real-time example. Okay, take the lab. I mean, you, you, you have mice. You know, subject mice retrotransposons to mutations or whatever it takes and, and show me a real-time example of one of these uh, endogenous retroviral-like sequences going from non-functional or just altering their pre-existing function to the point where now without them, we couldn't exist. Can you provide that and, and take your time, Luca? I know I said- Yes, the lizard one. Uh, we are observing uh, a lizard developing a, a placenta. So it's a very relevant example. Wait, 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 wait. Um, it, 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 I'm talking about endogenous retroviruses or other classes of retrotransposons. Yes, uh, we are talking about that because uh, the sequence is very similar to that, uh, the Sintichin uh, one. So yes, we are doing this kind of discussion and we are observing that kind of change in real time because those uh, lizards, uh, as I said to Kent, they are well, they're not evolving the placentas due to endogenous retroviruses, though. Yes. And so we are. can observe how they got integrated. We do know the process so well. We can use it 
Is, is it your position that an endogenous retrovirus integrated into the lizard genome and became functional in the embryo and in placental development? I cannot remember position? the exact uh, uh, event, but I remember that was... Right, because well, I, I've read through all those papers, and what it looks like is within. And here's the th I don't want to spend too much time on it because, again, it's not endogenous retroviruses that are involved in these adaptive episodes, but it looks like I believe it's these uh, variety of skink species. And within the, the skink species, depending on their environment, they actually have a dual reproductive system where they can hatch eggs or they have function in terms of, of, of a placenta. And depending on what environment they are in, that will determine what reproductive system is, is manifest. It's kind of like how GM builds their cars with both a heater and an air conditioner. So if I'm driving a GM vehicle in Alaska, well, I'm probably going to have the heater on predominantly, right? Dominantly. But if I go to the deserts of Australia, then I'm probably going to use the air conditioner because cars are built with dual temperature control systems. So once I turn on the air conditioner in another environment, the evolution is going to say, look, this vehicle is evolving the ability to have an air conditioner. No, it was already there. It was just turned off. And now it's being turned on in the appropriate environment. And that's what we see with these so-called um, skink examples of a placenta and you can yeah. respond to that but again it, it's yeah. not anything to do with endogenous retroviruses so i do want to make sure that yeah, you're yeah, the case why we can we do have an uh, example in the middle with a partial placenta because we also have that well because <laughs> here's a, if a certain skink species is predominantly using one reproductive mode well, what happens over time is the other reproductive mode is, is suppressed to the point where they can even lose it. So you're saying this is something in the middle when, it, in fact, it's, it's an example of loss. So you, you know how they say if you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> so just like if you have a vehicle that you're just um, mostly in Alaska or some really cold conditions, you're using the heater all the time. You're not using the air conditioner. And over time, that air conditioner due to underuse might actually break down it's, it's already there but either one can be revealed more or to the point where one can even be lost so um but it, it you know and we can agree to disagree there but i really really uh luca just want to see an example of an herb element that is I, I guess a basic question and take as long as you need i know i'm trying to because i'm trying to get as many clarifying questions as, as i can Okay, an herb sequence today, you, you can go in the lab or observe it in real time, doesn't matter, you know, you even use um, mice. I wanna see an herb element, okay, an exogenous retrovirus that is integrated in the germ cell line. It's been passed on. What the evolutionists typically say, as you know, um, Luca, is over millions of years after these, these infections occur and they're integrated, these sequences will be cleaned up through mutations and then the infectious part of the retrovirus will be eliminated, right? And oftentimes they'll say, like in the case of syncytin, that the herb elements will contribute new genes that can be utilized by the host for functional purposes. I get it, it's a nice story. I talk a lot about it in, in my book, but show me a real time example. Show me empirical evidence of this actually happening of, a, of an herb sequence going from non-functional or altering its function or donating its, its pre-existing uh, properties to function in the embryo, to function in determining cell types, to function in the immune system. So that's all I'm, I'm asking for, Luca, and take as much time as you need to, to answer that. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, if you want a nice example of an experiment, we can have any GMOs because the process is that process basically you get uh, an element of course you modify it to pick up uh, the sequence uh, dna sequence you need but it's still this process and you put it in the organisms so the best one to do that are obviously plants but you can do it even with animals i I've seen uh, 
Are you it's saying not, it's been done in, in animals? They've genetically modified an animal to the point where a uh, pre-existing herb sequence became functional? Well, yeah. No, no, no. They put uh, a in, an entire sequence inside the pig and the pig changed and the change were inherited. So we know that process can work. Well, in and pigs, I just finished uh, a, a lecture series in virology where the lecturer from, I think, Columbian University, Columbia University, he pointed out that they're removing the existing herb sequences. I don't know if this is what you're talking about. I'm just trying to follow all of your arguments, Luca, so I address them all. They removed all the pre-existing herb sequences to see if they're there for a reason. And it actually turns out that, that yes, there is offspring, pig offspring, but they are in an unhealthier state than they were prior to the herb sequences being removed. Is, is that the no, example you're looking to? Yeah, about the... something different because what I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, pigs so uh, modified so much that they start uh, growing human organs inside them. So I've seen. Okay, so uh, is it your position uh, that through? through genetic modification, that there's a real-time yes, example. How, of yes, and how you do that, you insert a uh, ERV sequence into the pig, and okay. the pig will... Okay, well, I just want to follow you. So, so they, humans, insert an ERV sequence into a pig, into the pig genome, and then what happens? A transposons, more likely. Okay, so a transposable element, they integrate it, into the pig genome, and then what happens? Yes, they start growing uh, human organs inside them. And I've seen uh, evidence for it with my eyes. So we know that process can work because we do all the time. I, I don't see... A, do. Luca, I'm sorry, because we have limited time. I got to get slightly mm -hmm. aggressive. I don't see how this example of human intervention through genetic modification, apparently they're inserting, and I'd like you to send me the paper so I can read it myself, where they're inserting an endogenous retrovirus into the pig genome. And now mm -hmm. subsequent generations, we have pigs growing new organs is what you're saying? No, no, uh, different organs because yeah, what uh, they were designed for, they were designed to uh, supply uh, fresh organs to the nators. So you will grow pigs with organs. Uh, well, did you want to share screen and pull this up so I can see it? Uh, I cannot pull this up because I've seen it uh, with my eyes and it was quite a long ago. Uh, I do not have a paper right now. But I'd I like to see you that I've seen those things myself. Okay, so pigs already have um, the ability through their pre-existing retrotransposons, right, to produce a, a baby pig from zygote to, to baby, okay, ba based on their functional DNA elements. So if a scientist is now manipulating the, the pig genome for some kind of desired outcome, by inserting a, an herb sequence into it, which again, I wanna see the, this paper. Okay, well, I, I don't understand how this genetic um, modifying example helps your case. I mean, we see that the evolutionists are saying millions of years ago, okay, the accidental infection of an exogenous retrovirus that was infected in the right way to be passed on to subsequent generations. Okay, eventually mutations cl cleared out that uh, the infectious part of it, and then somehow adopted a novel function in the embryo to the point where we, we couldn't exist. This pig example, well, the pigs are already existing. So whatever happened through genetic modification is not creating anything new where now the pig needs to survive. And, and this is the example that I'm asking for. And mm -hmm. I've already heard from PhD scientists that these examples don't exist. We have to infer it right? Like saying, well, the endogenous retrovirus contributed new genes, like syncytin for, for the embryological development. So, you know, that, that that's all I'm asking for 
is a real time example of, a, of an endogenous retrovirus um, viral like sequence becoming functional to this extent, essential. Go ahead, Luca. Okay, as I said, uh, you cannot use a single example. It will be very unlikely to observe something like that in nature. What we can do, we can observe things happen in the past. I think that the sweet potato plant is one of the best examples for it because we do know what happened. We do know what was the uh, infector. Uh, sorry, maybe it's a wrong term. Uh, it was a. Uh, an but you just admitted that you never seen this transposable element integrate. You're inferring it from. Correct me if I'm wrong. You Let me finish, it. Donny. What I'm telling you, we can uh, observe this process in the past, and we do know enough of this process to replicate it today. And doing things like GMOs. That's how well we can understand it. Yeah, I'm just going to have to, um, we'll have to leave it up to the audience. I don't find an example of, of GMO, genetically modified organisms. That the, and again, we need to see the paper. I, I want to, uh, you know, look into it a little bit. Um, but even what, with what you're saying is true, that that's not um an answer to to the question that, that i'm asking it, it's not impressive that scientists i mean we see it with with the the phoenix uh virus experiment where through manipulation from scientists they were able to produce a a, a virus from from a deactivated virus okay well i mean yeah humans through, through human intervention we can do a whole lot of things that's not showing that it that it happened in nature it's also not showing how a non-functional endogenous retrovirus through a series of mutations can become something as, as important in determining cell types or embryological developments. So my question to you here, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this paper, inconsistencies with the hierarchy, a herv k provirus in chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas, but not in humans. So although there is a hierarchy generally, we do find certain DNA elements in their placement, the way that they followed into, where it looks like, apparently, according to this distribution or this family tree, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas. Okay, so, and um, these observations provide some very strong evidence that for some fraction of the genome, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas are more closely related to each other than they are to humans. But even though chimpanzees are supposedly our closest cousin. Uh, so, so there are some inconsistencies in the hierarchy. Uh, Luca, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I do, know, do not know the example, this example in particular. I do know uh, that time to time uh, we get those kind of things. Science is all about uh, finding new things. So we need to improve step by step. Uh, when we find a problem, we need to find a solution or a better hypothesis. I do not know what the explanation, the proposed uh, explanation for this inconsistency is. But for the most part, you will agree with me, uh, ERVs paint out uh, a picture that resembles a lot my uh, theory. No, so, because, again, no. no, because, as I've pointed out, without e uh, retroviruses here on my slide, we would not have placentas, and we would not be bearing live young. We would not exist. Herbs are expressed during human embryo uh, embryonic development. We understand that they're functional, again, in the immune system. If we didn't have endogenous retroviruses, the pre-existing ones, I mean, we see it in that koala example that we have new endogenous retroviruses and what the pre-existing endogenous retroviruses are doing is they are through retrotransposition and, and recombination is, is they are disrupting the new endogen endogenous retroviruses and, and disabling them. So they're not harmful anymore. 
So we have, again, these pre-existing fixed herbs acting in the immune system, acting to prevent exogenous retroviruses from becoming endogenous. Or if they do become endogenous, then those pre-existing functional herbs are working to dis disrupt or disable them from um, causing harm. So therefore, if we find a relative hierarchy in, say, primates, that's no surprise. Because if they're created units of DNA function, of course, humans and chimpanzees are going to share some. But I just showed you a paper where although there is a relative hierarchy, there are inconsistencies to the hierarchy as well. And, and that's okay. the, the problem I have. Go ahead, Luca, take your time. Okay, so uh, I want to ask you a, que a relevant question on that. I do not know how much we have to end the discussion because I want to ask you one particular thing. Uh, yeah, because go ahead. Okay, first of all, um, so we do observe uh, novel insertion in koala. That's good. And they change uh, the sequence of those ERVs. Uh, you are familiar with uh, the structure uh, of proteins? Yes. OK. So uh, it's possible if you scramble uh, the information inside those uh, pieces of DNA to get a uh, protein with a different form. Can you repeat that last part, Luca? If uh, you are scrambling uh, those sequences as uh, written in the paper, you can get to a pseudogene or something like that with a different shape of a protein if you are scrambling the, ins the content of the string of DNA. If you're scrambling the string of DNA, you are going to... What, what, what's your question? If you can get a protein, uh, maybe a uh, less bigger one, but with a different shape. Uh, I was asking if you were uh, a variation of a familiar to, with the uh, structure of uh, the protein. Uh, you know, when you buy, build the protein, you have the sequence, then you have uh, the secondary structure, uh, alpha or beta sheet, and then you have um, bonds with sulfur i if i i right, but Luca, how, how does this help you uh, okay but, but what's the so relevance to this because again we have limited time and i really need to you're in the affirmative tonight are endogenous mm -hmm. retroviruses good evidence for evolution and you know yes it's relevant i don't, I don't see how it is because i don't see you addressing any of the differentiating lines of evidence here because so if you are point. scrambling those units of dna you will eventually get something that works maybe not every time not at all are, are you saying maybe can. through this process that you're talking about we'll get a pre-existing yes. endogenous retrovirus that that functions in a beneficial way yes well <laughs> it's a just so story what we see today is these pre-existing uh, endogenous retroviruses in the koala genome they have the functional ability to disrupt the process of retroviral invasion that's what we see pre-existing fixed herbs disrupting the endogenization process of infectious retroviruses in the koala genome so again, we have the fixed pre-existing ones that are functional and beneficial and the ones that are um, newly endogenized or just exogenous retroviruses that are infecting. It's the pre-existing ones that, that are working to fight them off. I, I don't see yeah. how that uh, helps your case. Yeah, you ahead. still have an insertion because you still have that insertion. I've admitted there is If you disrupt those sequence, you will no longer have func functioning... Uh, viral proteins uh, from that but you still have the insertion right <laughs> but it's it's disabled so the assertion the insertion is going to be there but it's not going to be of harm to the organism that's the point the pre-existing irv sequences are acting in fighting off the harmful effects of infectious retroviruses 
So when they disable them, yes, now they're disabled. They're no longer harmful. And probably over time, selection will remove this junk. And, and that's another problem I have with your model is in my opening statement, I covered uh, the fact that there's significant evidence for genome-wide activity, let's say between 60 and 80%. But your side, and I'm not sure, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Luca, but uh, from engaging your side, you guys want to say, well, most of that activity is just noise or it's spurious. But why in the world over millions of years of selection, why would evolutionary processes keep all of that junk around if it's just noise? Because all it's going to do is muck up cellular systems. It's just going to be wasteful of energy and resources. Uh, what's your position on that, Luca? To be fair, I just think that scientists time to time just have a very bad sense of humor to call <laughs> that DNA junk and that was uh, not the right call. I just think that scientists are, are blissfully unaware of this discussion. So they do very peculiar stuff like calling uh, some uh, chromosome Eve or uh, things like that, they just don't care. So how much would you and, say then? So are, are, are you saying that this activity, this biochemical activity, all of this evidence for um, you know function in these non-coding regions of, of the genome in terms of regulation expression, are, are, is it your position that this is useful activity and not just spurious and noise? I think that if you keep uh, that unit of DNA, something must do. Of course, you will have dangerous part of uh, DNA or things like that. But if you are functioning, you need to put uh, that DNA to some use because you need energy to replicate that DNA and things right. like that. So, well, and, 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 and that's the problem with those that want to say that this is mostly just noise. And it sounds like from your position, you're saying that it's probably not just noise because again, um, a, a, the energy requirements, a lot of energy is, is, is required. It's an intensive process to, you know, build that RNA chain. And so it, it wouldn't really make, but plus there should be evolutionary mechanisms that are, that are suppressing all of this junk. Mm -hmm. But, if, it, but if, if it's your position that it is mostly active and there for a reason, then don't you see I how that contradicts your model? Yeah, go ahead. A, a couple of things. First yeah. of all, yeah, uh, but I think that organisms like mammals and us are have a more refined genome because we are we do have a lot of mechanisms to prevent some errors and things like that but if you look to a genome of an amoeba you will find a very huge genome for a very small animal now i want to ask you a thing because i think we are almost at the end of this yeah i was just gonna hold don't lose your thought i was just gonna say we have about just just under um eight minutes left so if you guys wanted to stay yeah. on topic or try something i want to then. ask you a particular yeah. thing um sure, about region about so uh, you were telling me that we do have evidence for beaches because i did not say anywhere that uh, to be clear, uh, if we look at genome from humans uh, near the flood, we would see those pre-viral elements. We do have an example for that. So you're saying at the time of the flood with the ARC archetypes that would have been more heterozygous, more heterozygous at that time, than today, since there's been shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity, a loss in some of these functional DNA elements. Are you asking for evidence for organisms in the past having more of these ERV sequences? No, uh, it's a different thing. Uh, if you read the paper, it was telling that in the past, in theory, um, of course, it's not a theory, it's an hypothesis, but let me slide that. Uh, we would uh, see those elements, pre-viral elements that 
originated uh, viruses afterwards. So we do have evidence for these elements not degraded and evidence for a perfect, let's say that, genome, because if your view is correct, we would be able to find it because even pre-flood uh, humans, we are talking about an event uh, 4,000 and something years ago. So DNA, it would be not degraded at all. Okay, so we accumulate, in, in humans accumulate roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation. The mutation rate is quite fast in Y chromosome, mitochondrial DNA, um, you know, biparentally inherited DNA. Within our DNA is ERV sequences, and they're also subject to mutations. They're, they're subject to a lot of nearly neutral mutations. So even your ERV sequences that function in the embryo, for example, although that's essential, if they're hit with a, an effectively neutral mutation, it is harmful in the same way that, you know, rust on the engine of a car isn't just going to destroy the car right away. It builds up. So yeah, we do have mutations that are building up in the genome and building up in pre-existing ERV sequences. So the genomes we sequence today, the ERV sequences that we see today, they have been hit with a lot of mutations. So they are a lot more degraded than say 4,500 years ago. But I don't know how you expect me to show you the genetics of humans right after the flood where they have ERV sequences that have less mutations than today, where they're more in a pristine state. It sounds like you're asking me to show you an example of, of a, an original ERV sequence that was front loaded and therefore had no mutations. Is that what you're asking to see? Yes, I, and for what I can tell, it's quite easy. Find a corpse of someone really close to Noah or his uh, sons analyze his DNA and find the evidence for <laughs> yeah, but, his elements. Yeah, but look at the examples we have of ancient DNA exist in what? Denisovans, Neanderthals. Neanderthals, for example, were the most inbred people group that ever existed. They have these massive stretches of identical letters, which means they have these massive stretches of what's called homozygosity. They were 40% less fit than modern humans. They accumulated a lot of deleterious mutations because of their environment, because of inbreeding. And so if I'm going to show you uh, examples from ancient DNA, well, Neanderthals aren't going to help since they were highly inbred and mutated and degenerate. So I don't think we have any um, examples of ancient DNA from non-inbred groups like Neanderthals. But there is no reason to uh, such a findings to be impossible. Oh, yeah, we no, know uh, for sure that the son of Noah lived to be 300. So we should, it should be possible to find such a sample or not. Well, see, here's the thing. The ancient DNA that we're most likely to retrieve is going to be from some of these side branches that lived in the appropriate conditions that can preserve the DNA enough where it can even be reliable in terms of sequencing. And that seems to be the case with Neanderthals because all the genetic sequences that, that we have seem to nest within that Neanderthal group. But again, that Neanderthal group was highly uh, degenerated. So if we add an example of an early Neanderthal or we add an example of, let's say, uh, Heidelbergensis maybe, um, that may have been less degenerated, then we may be able to sequence that genome if we had it and determine, oh, you know, here's some ERV sequences that probably existed in them that don't exist today because we've lost a lot of diversity, right? Um, so it, 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 that is a good question. But before time runs out, if I could, Luke, I did want to ask you a question here that applies to the VIGE hypothesis, variation inducing genetic element hypothesis. So I have a number of um, articles and papers where the uh, secular community, for example, here, where did viruses come from? Let's talk science. Viruses might have come from broken pieces of genetic material inside early cells. The, uh, these pieces were able to escape their original organism and infect another cell. In this way, we evolved uh, into viruses. So essentially we have the escape hypothesis from the evolutionary community 
that's saying, yes, a lot of these viruses may have actually come from cells, may have actually come from the genome rather than from outside. So are you familiar with, with this uh, model? Are you, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Go ahead. Yes, uh, it's an hypothesis and it can be also true, uh, of course, but we need to remember that we can also get uh, things like protocells from experiments like the one uh, done by David Dreamer. So it's not the only hypothesis. It's possible to get that from pieces of cells. Yes, potentially, if you have a cell broken down, a virus is a very, really, really um, simple um, structure. Uh, it has an envelope well, and uh, well, Luca, if, if I could, DNA or DNA inside it. If I could, because you're you're criticizing the Vige hypothesis. I've seen other evolutionary biologists as well criticize the Vige hypothesis. But we have in the secular literature, right? Here's a paper: viral evolution. Um, primordial cellular origins and late adaptation to uh, parasitism. So we have these evolutionists on YouTube that are criticizing the Vige hypothesis, saying that that's crazy. But we actually have this uh, scene in, uh, in your own secular literature, and they're even pointing out, for example, here, here's a question I have for you. The virus first hypothesis states that viruses predated cells and contributed to the rise of cellular life. Okay, this is not a young earth creation source, of course. Contrastingly, all known viruses need a cellular host to replicate, thus necessitating the existence of cells be uh, before virus survival. That's exactly what we're saying in terms of our model, right? Obviously, there's some differences because I would look to the uh, pre-existing fixed functional herbs as being created units of DNA function, and then the unfixed herbs that are uh, harmful, disease-causing, and non-functional, I'd, I'd see those as uh, exogenous retroviruses that actually did uh, integrate, okay, th through vertical transmission. But my question to you is, how do you address the problems that are put forth in these uh, secular papers that say yes? The best case scenario or a good case scenario is that retroviruses came from within the genome since retroviruses require a host to replicate in the first place. So how, how do you address the, the, that issue? Oh, so there hold is on, a hold difference. on, Luca, be, before you answer mm -hmm. that, I just want to let you guys know that we are out of time. Um, it doesn't matter to me. I don't know how punctual you want to be. So, of course, Luca, you'll, you'll be able to answer that. And then if you guys okay. want to be... Just wrap it up in a few more minutes. So uh, let's be quick. Uh, those are two hypotheses. First of all, it's quite different from the Vige uh, hypothesis. And I said that the Vige hypothesis could be good if you bring evidence for it. I was not criticizing that much. I have other problems with the paper, but I do not think we have. Well, Lucas, some of the, and I just want you to answer this question as time runs out. One of the best lines of evidence is the same observation that the secular papers are pointing out that retroviruses require a host to replicate. And therefore the question is what came first, the host or the retrovirus? Well, obviously the host, this fits our model. God front loads the original created kinds with pre-existing functional DNA differences, genetic diversity, and uh, variation-inducing genetic elements. And from herbs, lines, signs, okay, we get um, RNA viruses that essentially are bad, harmful. And then eventually, I mean, they can move around the genome, causing harm, or then they can cross species, and bam, you got a fully infectious retrovirus. So, so one of the best lines of evidence is that fact. So if, if you want to reject the Vige hypothesis, how do you address that basic question? The basic question is, how can retroviruses originate from outside if retroviruses require a host to replicate in the first place? So just that question, I want to hear you answer. Yes, as I said, we did uh, observe in experiment from David Dreamer, the formation of protocells with gene expression. So it's not the only possibility. We can have a form of life without a cell and we can have an adaptation after that or okay so are, are you assuming have... that 
are you assuming that this proto cell mm -hmm. through further adaptive episodes mm -hmm. over time, you'll get a retrovirus? Yeah, it will be possible. <laughs> Why not? You know, Luca, <laughs> and, and I mean this in all, uh, in all fun. I just want to put this full screen. <laughs> this, I find every answer that you've given tonight is just a lot of story time, you know, and mm -hmm. because here's the thing, tr truth is important. And the evolutionary community and the YouTube atheists, they just want to keep saying Irv sequences, the best evidence for evolution. But yet after debate, after debate, after debate, and you've even got, you know, PhD scientists admitting no. You know, we have to assume over millions of years through maybe proto cells, we get retroviruses or somehow co-option takes place. And now an IRV sequence without it, we couldn't exist. I mean, I don't personally see why you find that to be convincing. It's just a lot of story time to me. And I don't mean that to be insulting. I just believe truth is important. And these IRV sequences function in so many incredible ways we didn't even touch on a fraction of their amazing functional roles for example their their role in tumor suppression where through viral mimicry which requires their sequence similarity to exogenous retroviruses they can be turned on and the immune system can target that cell with more destruction and, and kill a tumor essentially through the help of what's called the P53 protein, which is the guardian of, of the cell. It's this relationship where they work together. I mean, that, like, this is some amazing, you keep asking for evidence and it's like, I don't know what, what, what more evidence are, are you looking for? Uh, Luca, take your time, uh, thoughts on that. Okay, as I said, we uh, know uh, that we can get to very simple. They are not organism because protocells are not that but with abiogenesis we you will not start from a cell you will start from something simpler so either either is possible we can have a very simple organism evolving at the same time some adapting to be uh, viruses other to be cells or we can actually have what you said but they are both hypotheses are not facts but you cannot rule out one of the two and luca i want to be respectful we'll give you the last word on on the discussion and if it's okay with our uh, awesome moderator and host Tonight, Sam, we can get into some closing statements. Luca, I do want to thank you for engaging in this important discussion. I also appreciate the prep that you've done also for reading my book, bringing some good questions for us to discuss. Of course, it gets passionate at times, but, you know, you and I are good friends. And yes. uh, again, I thank you for your presence in, in the debate community. So never any hard feelings, my good man. Very, very enjoyable discussion. None taken. Don't worry about it. It was a pleasure to be here, so I'm more than happy for this debate. Let's get to the questions. All uh, right. I think five-minute closing statements. Luca, you can go first. Uh, oh, minute. sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's very late from here. So uh, I think that Donnie did a very good debate. It, point out a lot of interesting things, but I'm still convinced uh, about my positions. I think that we, I have very important questions without answer. The big one was a very important one uh, because if it's possible to find those units of not uh, degraded DNA will be great and will be a very important evidence for this kind of things. And for your model, it's possible. And I want to see more research on that. And I cannot understand why we do not see that. Or maybe I can. 
So, uh, very good debate. I will have to study a lot on these things. I did uh, get uh, pushed around, so I did not have uh, any citation, uh, any quotes for what I said tonight, and it's a problem for a scientist. I hope to get uh, that soon and I can stop there. All right. So thanks a lot, Luca. I just want to remind everyone to hit that thumbs up. It really helps with the algorithm. And uh, Donnie, brother, are you ready? Yes. Let me uh, let me start the timer. All right. Um, all right, here we go. I, you know, I could talk about this topic all day. I just put out a, a two plus hour video presentation from a few days ago, just talking nonstop on herbs. I mean, it's herbs turn out to be some of the best evidence for separate ancestry and independent origins. And I find it hilarious because the evolutionists that want to, um, you know, prop up shared herb sequences as the best evidence for evolution turns out to be some of the best evidence for separate ancestry. And the ones making the videos, for some reason, shy away from debate. Stated clearly, Pelogia or Pelogia, Vice Rhino. I mean, bring it on. Because these guys understand that they can't address the amazing functionality of these herb sequences. I mean, some of these herb sequences like Herb H also appear to have a responsibility in influencing heart cell development. And Herb K helps embryos develop a built-in immune system that keeps them secure, okay, while the, uh, the, the growing baby doesn't really have any antibodies to protect against pathogens from the outside world. So again, like these are not just basic functions that you can just snip out and the organism uh, still exists. No, like literally without them, we couldn't exist in the evolutionist. And, you know, I appreciate Luca engaging in this debate because it's nothing against him. It's not his fault that, you know, he can't show us an example of a non-functional endogenous retroviral like element going from non-functional to functional or altering its function to the point where it's now essential and critical for life to exist. Uh, because PhD evolutionary biologists, the most militant ones, the most militant ones who I don't even have to name, Admit, no, we don't We don't have that example. They have to infer, and then they have to downplay it. They have to say, well, no, it, it's not about the function. And the reason why they got to say that is because they can't address the function. You know, they have a genetics problem. They like to say we have a heat problem. They have a genetics problem, okay? And so they want to point to the, you know, the so-called uh, mutational discrepancies within the Earth sequence and say, you know, that's what matters. And then still not understanding that if the genome really is mostly functional, that means there's more hot spots than they've assumed because they'll even admit, I've got paper after paper here where we have uh, non-random mutations and hot spots. Okay, we also find that these um, functions were unexpected because they'll like to say, well, these are expected functions. Oh, really? Because paper after paper says that they're unexpected. Anyways, unexpected findings on mutations. Okay, where we have these mutational hot spots. And in separate lineages, we have mutations accumulating that appear to reflect ancestry when, in fact, they were um, ex uh, experienced independently. Okay, so, you know, the evidence for biological noise doesn't exist. And so um, it doesn't work. So I'm glad that uh, Lucas seemed to acknowledge that, which a lot of evolutionists are going to disagree with that because they understand they need junk. They need junk, but junk DNA has been overturned. Transcribing a portion of the genome is a very energy intensive process. Every time a nucleotide is being added to a growing RNA chain, you are consuming a great deal of energy. These transcripts would just clutter up the interior of the cell if they were not playing any real operational role. We understand that a lot of these ERV sequences are only functional in certain developmental windows, and then they're turned off and they can maybe be called upon again during the life of the organism for adaptive purposes because DNA met met methylation keeps a lot of them <clears throat> silenced, kind of like in your car, you have a backup camera, you have airbags, you have you know lane control, 
you have these built-in mechanisms that are not all turned on. So to the evolutionists, they see the backup camera that's not turned on or being used as apparently junk. <laughs> it's just not being turned on until you need it. A lot of these herb sequences are not expressed or they're silenced until they need to be turned on. It doesn't mean they're junk. Okay, just like certain non-coding RNA genes like pseudogenes are only expressed under certain conditions. So a lot of these arguments are unsophisticated and I do thank uh, Luca for at least acknowledging this part. But unfortunately, acknowledging the fact that most of the genome activity really is useful, okay, also forces one to recognize the fact that there's more hot spots in the genome. So just like certain parts of a vehicle are prone to breaking down, okay, windshield and wiper blades, brake pads and rotors, battery, suspension, so on and so forth, more parts of our genome are susceptible to breaking down. So most of the genome's functional. There's more hot spots. The mutation rate is really, really fast, more fast than the evolutionists ever assumed. So yeah, we would expect similar mutational discrepancies between let's say humans and chimpanzees in the herb sequence. But again, we didn't even begin to flesh out my hypothesis that results in predictions in the book that I wrote here that talks about how a lot of these so-called mutations are not even mutations because it's the evolutionist that assumes that all DNA diversity and all DNA differences are the result of mutations. But we would suggest that the majority of DNA differences are the result of design diversity and a direct prediction of that model is DNA function. And we now have a trajectory that suggests genome-wide functionality. And this includes these ERV sequences because with the overturning of junk DNA comes the overturning of ERV sequences as evidence for common descent in IEO. All right, what a debate. Good job, guys. So, Donnie, brother, I got, um, when I booted myself out of the party, I lost the first uh, few comments that I placed in the private chat. So, if you don't mind grabbing those, yeah, I can't see yeah. those anymore. And um, um, yeah, I want to also thank everyone for the super chats. You guys are awesome. I got had a few super chats come in and, uh, and some gifts also, Doki. You're the man. Thank you very much. Okay, so am I just going to go to the... Okay, so here's the first couple of questions that came in. I'll put them here. Oh, there you go. You can start with that one. Yeah, all right. So Jay asks uh, for $20. He says, please ask Luca which vestigial organs evolved first. We have 10. The heart, lung, skin, intestinal linings, pancreas, kidneys, brain, liver, stomach. <clears throat> well... Wow. The first one was the digestive tract. Uh, an earth, uh, art, you don't need it uh, if you are small. Uh, you don't need a blood vessel to uh, just like uh, look at something like insect uh, insects. It, uh, the concept is uh, they are vital organs now. But if you look into more um, primitive uh, organisms, uh, more simple uh, organisms, you will find that there is a progression, a progression uh, with that. So you will have first a uh, digestive tract. Uh, you will breathe uh, through basically atmosphere because you are so little and then you will start to have blood, uh, but you don't need blood vessel because you are small, so you just need liquid going around and then you need blood vessel because you are bigger and then uh, something to pump that uh, blood through the vessel. So uh, an earth, uh, earth, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, so I guess my explanation is yes, I do find this to be a problem. Since the topic is herbs, I'll um, give a response in the context of herbs. And how this applies is the fact that <clears throat> many of these herb sequences right now, a lot of them are redundant. And a lot of them, we just have solo LTRs, which just represent functional stretches of DNA. Okay. And so, yeah, we do have uh, a, a 
a set uh, redundancy in terms of the herb. So it, even if they were snipped out, okay, you know, I, I can be born with both my hands missing. That doesn't really affect my fitness because I could still have kids, right? It's, it's better if I have both my hands, but again, a lot of these herb sequences could essentially be knocked out and the organism would still survive. Not ideal, but they could still survive. But many of them, especially the ones that are involved in embryological development, where if we didn't have them, we couldn't exist. These herb elements, or any of the functional ones for that matter, could not come about through slow evolutionary processes. That's why I say it's a lot of storytelling. That's why I like to respond to uh, you know, a lot of the evolutionists in terms of how they address the question about uh, herb function with you know, cool story, bro, because that's all it is, and therefore it's pseudoscience. But again, many of these herbs are critical to life, but they're critical through irreducibly complex associations, okay, with other processes that's going on in the cell because they're tightly controlled and they're integrated that without their specific design and the processes that allow them to function in, let's say, the embryo, again, this is a critical design that we couldn't exist without. So my point is, yeah, there is a um, irreducible complexity even in the herb elements because they couldn't be built up through slow and um, slow evolutionary processes. Just like here, when it comes to the organs, the hearts, the lungs, the skin, the intestine, you know, it all needs to be there. It, it all needs to be working from the start. Just like the Bible says, everything was created very good. And that's what we see with the human body. So go ahead. Man. Luca, um, question hey. for you? Yes. Um, I'm just adding that you can see those kind of things right now because we have um, organisms today with those characteristics. So maybe some does not have uh, earth, earth uh, some does not have uh, lungs or things like that. And you can get uh, progression from uh, existing uh, organism. So it's not a story. Uh, we can yeah, see that right now. All right. So we have another question from uh, SWE for $10. She says, Donnie, isn't it the case that about 65% of the human and chimp Ys are shared? This leaves about 10 MB of Y sequence that is unique to each species. 10 MB is about 0.33%. Um, okay. So good question. And I wonder in my second PowerPoint presentation with another 500 slides, I've got some stuff on the Y chromosome. But I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it in time. So, um, yeah, good question. Okay, so I'll answer it here, and I think I can find it in time. I will share screen, Y chromosome, dissimilarity, essentially. Okay, let's see here. Um, so when it comes to, let's see if I can get it, Y chromosome, within humans, there's an incredibly low variation. Every single male Y chromosome, nearly identical, right here. The human Y chromosome exhibits uh, surprisingly low levels of genetic diversity. Okay. Hold Humans on, can, you go full, can you go full screen if you're going to share that? Because the text yes. is small. Yeah, I'm looking for one. Okay, here it is. I'll go full screen okay. here. Um, okay. So when it comes to, and good question, when it comes to the separate ancestry model, we like to look to the uniparentally inherited DNA compartments because essentially they're non-recombining. They're less messy, okay, than your biparentally inherited DNA compartment, uh, your autosomal DNA. So we can build some really nice family trees. And again, there's, there's low genetic diversity, but yet humans, when compared to chimpanzees, notice this paper, Chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes are remarkably divergent in structure and gene content to the point where the human Y and the gorilla Y are more similar in overall uh, architecture, gene content, and size differences. If you actually consider size differences, since the Y is half the size between humans and chimpanzees, it's only about 35% the same. If you don't account for size differences, it's about 70%. Either way, it, it's, it's too far different because, again, the evolutionists will want to say, well, the Y chromosome is the most mutating, it's the fastest mutating chromosome. But wait a minute. If the Y chromo if the human Y chromosome is mutating fast, which it is, it's about three per generation, why do humans overall 
have such low va variation, 99.99% the same. We should find some di uh, highly divergent subpopulations if that's true. Because we do have geographically uh, specific Y chromosome. Because after the Tower of Babel, certain groups spread out. They start accumulating uh, mutations independently. But yet we're all still nearly identical. But then the chimpanzee, which is supposedly our closest cousin, is, is so vastly different. And then also um, so different from the gorilla, which again is just one line of evidence that suggests separate ancestry. Yeah, the reason why the Y chromosomes are so different is because humans are separate in terms of the phylogenetic tree of life than chimpanzees. We're, we're not related. And then they want to say, well, you know, it's the polygamous nature of chimpanzees. They're the odd man out, they'll say. You know, sperm competition has led to the chimpanzee's Y chromosome drastically changing and the gorilla and the human Y chromosome not changing as much. So it's the, the chimpanzee that's uh, the, the odd man out. But still, Again, story time, okay? Here is the implications. What are the implications of this new information? First, for the evolutionists, the Y chromosomes must be evolving much more quickly than anyone imagined previously. Okay, here's the last thing I want to say, is you can look to sperm competition, polygamous relationships in the chimpanzee, fast mutation rates, faster rates of gene conversion, whatever. You know, all these explanations they give in these papers, and which they admit are just hypotheses. They still need to be tested for, the, for, uh, you know, for there to be an empirical answer. This is what they're going to have to do. They are now going to have to apply mathematical models to try to demonstrate how a sequence can change extremely rapidly, including, notice this, wholesale rearrangements of significant parts and the evolution of entire gene families in a relatively short amount of time, yet stay homogeneous within a species. Because again, the human Y chromosome nearly identical worldwide. So, you know, that's the last thing I want to say is I get it. They have their stories. They have their hypotheses. They need to be tested. We need to see mathematical models. So I yield there. Okay. I, yeah, go uh, ahead, Luca. You want to respond yes. to that? I think I'll pass on that because I'm not knowledgeable enough to give a good, uh, good response to that. I do know that there is an hypothesis from uh, the secular side, but I do not know nearly enough to speak about that. All right, Johnny. No, that's good. Go. All right, that's good. Cool. Um, Throw up. So I've got a question. I'm not sure if you got this. Was this question lost too? Let me get it up here. Well, I'm not able to put them in the chat from uh, StreamYard anyway. Okay. So yeah, I believe that's right about where. So so Mark asks a question for for Donnie. So how do you explain that the genome of modern humans is one 1.5 percent, which is around 99 million base pairs longer than the Neanderthals and Denisovans? Right. So. Um, I did tell Mark that I would debate him on this. So I'm getting <laughs> all the uh, very thorough technical uh, questions, eh? Okay, so Neanderthals, essentially, why are Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes different than uh, the human genomes, human genetics? Because uh, phylogenetically, the, the way that the genetics are represented on a tree, the evolutionists want to say, well, you know, Neanderthals are a sister species, Okay. And um, firstly, I want to say when comparing the percentage uh, similarity, we're all 99.999% similar. If you bring in the Neanderthal, we're about 99.7% similar to the Neanderthal. So we're still pretty similar. But what explains the differences, including the size differences? Well, a few things. Okay. A few things that come to mind, and then I want to touch on uh, hypermutation being a reality. Neanderthals, we're the, the most inbred, we talked about this in the debate, they're the most inbred people group that ever exists on the planet. I got paper after paper in this slideshow. For sake of time, I won't pull them up. They were 40% less fit. They accumulated a lot of deleterious uh, alleles because they had a lot of recessive mutations that came to the forefront. Since they existed in isolated small populations, they were inbred, which leads to rapid fixation of deleterious alleles. Okay, this is the end stage Neanderthal we're looking at. But Neanderthals in general were closer to the flood. So even before they became highly inbred and therefore uh, had high levels of homozygosity versus heterozygosity, 
being close to the to the flood means they would have started off different. They would have started off with a different set of biodiversity. Okay. There's also a concept called patriarchal drive, where in the Y chromosome, you would be accumulating more mutations. Okay. Males would be accumulating more mutations essentially, because if they're living hundreds of years old, that's more time for mutations to accumulate in both the somatic cell lines, germ cell lines, and therefore more that are, that are passed on. And so um, you would have differences there because if Neanderthal was founded by an early biblical patriarch in his old age, he would start off with a whole bunch of mutations. And so on a, on a phylogenetic tree, a long branch, which is assumed by the evolutionists to be reflective of, of deep time, <laughs> could just reflect more mutations in the same amount of time. Okay, also because of the conditions they lived in, and we understand today, there's papers today where, um, notice this, two families had uh, genetic drivers of germline hypermutation. So real-time examples today of, of people groups that were hypermutating, with some of them being hypermutated because of environment, but other groups being hypermutated because of, notice this, our findings imply that defects in DNA repair genes can increase, what? germline mutation rates. So that means a DNA repair system, we have multiple over 10, DNA repair systems that are damaged and defected due to mutations result in more mutations accumulating from generation to generation. And in light of what we know about Neanderthals being the most inbred people group that ever lived, the environment that they lived in, I think it is very appropriate to extrapolate that to mean that Neanderthals had mutations in many of their important DNA repair enzymes, which means what? More mutations are accumulating, more mutations are becoming fixed, explaining exactly why Neanderthals are different to modern humans today. So that's about three hours worth of information in, in a few minute answer. So go ahead, Luca, if you had anything you wanted to add. Yes, uh, of course, I do not know. Uh what's making the difference uh, but we do have uh, dna from those uh, humanoids uh, from neanderthals Neanderthals, and us so i think we can get what happened here and if you did the question i think you know better than me uh, it's peculiar that uh, things like Neanderthal and the new ones are kept out uh, of the work of someone like uh, Jensen and I think that fascinating uh, I will see I would I would love to see uh, how uh, the last common ancestor uh, date will turn out if you do that but apart from that maybe it was some iterations maybe we are looking at uh, duplication or insertion of uh, other elements like transposon i do not know i guess i'll do a real quick final word sam i think you're on mute brother i just yeah, wanted to pull up some of these papers um inbred neanderthals left humans a genetic burden um so 40% less reproductively fit than modern humans. So they lost a lot of their genetic diversity. They, they would have started off with, with higher levels of genetic diversity being closer to the flood, the early Neanderthal, okay? Because the DNA we have today is of the end stage Neanderthal when they were at their, their worst genetically, um, so genotypically and phenotypically. We, we understand that they were cold adapted, right? So, so the way that they had uh, you know, prominent brow ridges above their eyes, dominated by uh, by a very big uh, wide nose um strong muscular bodies wide hips and shoulders they were adapted for the uh, cold eco glacial environments that they existed in but um over time due to their isolation their inbreeding they would have lost a lot of genetic diversity okay they would have accumulated a lot of harmful mutations and uh there's paper after paper in the secular literature on this Notice this, the genetic cost of Neanderthal introgression. Recent studies have shown that this Neanderthal DNA is depleted around functional genomic regions. This has been suggested to be a consequence of harmful epistatic interactions between human and Neanderthal 
uh, allele. So if anyone's interested, I did a, a three hour uh, presentation on Neanderthals a few months back where I back up everything I'm saying with the secular literature. So uh, you'll. All right. So next we have a question from Doki. He, he's asking you, Donnie, he said, is your closet full of nothing but blue shirts? <laughs> <laughs> if you open my closet, it's just a big lineup of SFT blue shirts. <laughs> One for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all the way. But Sunday, I'll dress up. Because by Sunday, my wife's sick of looking at me in this shirt, right? At least I can do. <laughs> all right. So next we have a, a problem, unless you wanted to respond to that, Luca. <laughs> and I have just a shirt, uh, so. All right. Looks good. No blue, yeah. All right, so we have a, a question from Obamacare. He says, question for Luca. So they're coming at you now. He says, uh, can you provide an example of a beneficial mutation, I guess, in the context of this discussion? Well, we are talking about uh, transposons, so maybe not mutation, but the one in maize, uh, corn, they were quite good. Uh, maize is a stronger, better plant. Uh, that's one. Uh, also, let me think uh, the mutation uh, we find in my uh, area that reduce the probability to die from uh, earth, earth attack. Sorry. I uh, Yes, that's two. Uh, Um, I, I can respond. Uh, so beneficial mutations. Um, I've got some slides here from my study into beneficial mutations. And here's, again, the mutation rate you can see here. Mutation and human exceptionalism or future genetic load, Michael Lynch. An average newborn contains more, uh, roughly 100 uh, new mutations per person per generation. And they admit that most of these mutations that accumulate are effectively neutral, meaning they're very slightly deleterious. Okay. So they accumulate, they're effectively neutral, which means they're slightly deleterious, like single rust molecules on a car or a single spelling mistake in a book the size of, of an encyclopedia. That means they're invisible to selection. Okay. Selection can't see neutral mutations, but what we know now, especially about the function of the genome is it's not appropriate or accurate to say neutral. It's more appropriate to say effectively neutral or low impact or nearly neutral. Because notice this, it seems unlikely that any mutation is truly neutral in the sense that it has no effect on fitness. All mutations must have some effect, even if that effect is vanishingly small. Okay, so here's the thing about uh, beneficial mutations then. Most beneficial mutations that we study on uh, a molecular level, okay, because oftentimes what we'll, we'll do is we'll look at the phenotype, you know, the new variation. But what we should be looking at is the genotype and seeing what's going on on a genotypic level. And what we'll find is a lot of these examples, they're reductive. It's, uh, it leaves the organism functionally compromised. It's, it's a reduction that's leading to a, a temporary advantage, like sickle cell anemia uh, leads to a type of resistance, but it's actually due to a reduction because it's due to a broken cell, broken protein, okay, a, a deformed hemoglobin protein, essentially. and um, that means there's no way to counterbalance the damage due to the influx of so many low impact deleterious mutations that are accumulating. We also have a lot of examples of the variation and phenotypic novelty based on epigenetic means. So we have a lot of latent information like these retrotransposons that are now manifested. They're pre-existing, they're manifested, they lead to change, novel change. But it's not the type of uh, change that large scale evolution needs because it's already built into the system. There's a lot of morphological adaptability built into the system. Even his example of the lizards. We understand that some of these lizard species have dual reproductive mode capabilities where depending on the environment, one mode is emphasized over the other. And if one mode is emphasized over the other for, for long enough periods of time, the other one will reduce and eventually it'll be lost. So we're not seeing the adding of any true novelty. We just see the expression of pre-existing variation that's already built into the system. And here's what I typically say. 
because I mean, we could talk about all day, uh, you know, so-called beneficial mutations, but they can have a hundred of them. They would need millions of truly beneficial mutations to counterbalance the damage done by the pouring in of so many uh, damaging mutations. So, you know, that that's my brief thoughts on beneficial mutations. Uh, Luca, you can have the last word. It was your question. Oh, I think you, Luca's muted. Mute, Luca. The example I gave in the debate uh, with Ken were quite good. Uh, we have uh, cows and a lot of people asked me uh, why it's uh, beneficial to the the cow. Yeah, be it's beneficial because it, that cow will be selected to reproduce. So it's more fit to survive uh, in that way. Le and it's adding things because you are producing more, you have more tissue, uh, you are more uh, blood vessel. Uh, maize, uh, it's a better plant, bigger plant, stronger plant. I do not see anything worse there. And also those were not deletion. Uh, we have also duplication and things like that. In us, for the most part, are uh, harmful. But when you got, got a good one, it will be selected. The quantity of uh, mutation does not mean anything if any bad mutation will eventually be selected out and the good ones will be kept. All right. So uh, the next question is from you or for, for you from Doki, Luca. He says, or he asks, did the RNA world give rise to the DNA and eventually ERVs? Hello. Uh, sorry, I, I'm that tired that I'm starting to talk in Italian. So, yeah, uh, the difference between the two uh, is uh, a sugar. Uh, I do not know the exact process, uh, but we uh, know for sure that RNA and DNA share almost the same uh, basis so i can see uh, a process where you can form dna from rna i do not know the details but you just need to have a nuclear uh, not uh, yes a nucleotide uh, and then to form uh, the chain and that could be helped by the rna I think that uh, RNA molecule was the first to be formed, and then DNA. Yeah, so you think the ERVs derived from them? No, 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 no. Uh, at that stage, you just have uh, RNA. I do not think you have uh, ERVs at that stage. stage. What do you think about um, that? Okay. Okay, so the question, the, did the RNA world give rise to DNA and eventually ERVs? So, I, again, I think especially when it comes to the chicken and egg problems with uh, abiogenesis um, and the fact that design diversity seems to better uh, explain variation in the biological world when it comes to retroviruses, I believe this, the scientific data is best supported by the fact that retroviruses, RNA viruses, would have originated from within the genome. And I think the VIGE hypothesis, although there's a lot of work to do, which is what I'm doing, and I'm going to be elaborating on it in my follow-up book, <clears throat> the findings of the new biology demonstrate that mainstream scientists are wrong regarding the idea. Because, you know, they want to say there's some kind of RNA world where maybe these uh, precursors to retroviruses came about and then eventually they adapted in a way where they are now um, required of a host to replicate <laughs> and and that's they understand that problem right they have multiple hypotheses but they understand that's a big issue since retroviruses require a host to replicate 
So it makes more sense since there's kind of a conundrum there, a chicken and egg problem, what came first, the host or the virus, that the viruses came from the host, okay? So those that wanna reject that model have some problems, some hurdles, and uh, stories aren't gonna cut it. So again, instead, RNA viruses originate from transposable elements that were designed as variation-inducing genetic elements, created units of DNA function, I like to call them, because they do so much more than just uh, create variation. They're functional in, in, in all the different ways we, ex we talked about in, in the uh, debate today. Due to the redundant character of um, these elements, their controlled regulation may have been readily deteriorated, and some of them may now merely cause uh, havoc. Again, um, Darwinists are wrong in promoting herbs as remnants of invasions of RNA viruses. It's the other way around. Uh, to date, no clear explanation. This is from the se secular source, or origin of viruses. There's a lot of a lot of problems, and then they readily admit it. No clear explanation for the origin of viruses exists. Viruses may have arisen. Honestly, <laughs> that's exactly what I've been putting forth. Viruses may have arisen from mobile genetic elements that gain the ability to move between cells. Exactly. Okay. The, the host was created by God, and then the host was front loaded with pre-existing diversity and many classes of functional DNA elements like. Uh, herbs and transposable elements and because of degeneration because of uh, recombination or errors in the packaging process retroviruses came about they can move between the cell or they can cross species and there you go fully infectious retrovirus last thing i'll say is it's, it's fascinating because you can look at the genes of these retroviruses their components and actually track back and that's some work that we're doing is track back to uh what the original host was that it came from. HIV did not come originate in humans, started off as SIV in chimpanzees, and I believe which came from some kind of rodent species, which may have been its original host, where it was not harmful. These become harmful when they cross species, and now the species that it's crossed into cannot regulate the invading retrovirus. And so it burns hot and fast, leads to disease. I mean, this to me is the only way to explain it. So uh, there we go, I yield. Yes, to uh, respond uh, a little bit more in detail. So, for what I can recall, DNA needs uh, an inorganic acid, uh, the same of RNA, a slightly uh, more complex uh, sugar, but we are talking about one uh, carbon more, uh, nothing more than that. And bases are basically the same uh, so i do not see at this moment a reason where it would be impossible to have both uh, i think that uh, the process to synthesize uh, dna was maybe uh, more late than uh, the rna one for what I, we can tell, but I see no reason to not have that compound. All right. So Howard asks, he says, Luca, another question for you. He says, how can ERVs being functional BD predict by your model? That also said prior that ERVs being junk was predicted. So you understand the question he's asking you how I would you say know? give me a source for that because if you have uh a ARVs, you will have something that usually uh synthesize proteins for the virus so it's quite simple to change something in that and get something else i will not say that was the case. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I'm waiting for the sources. So since this is the last question, I'll be really brief because we've hit the two and a half hour mark and I'm pretty much out of energy for this. So um, yeah, the evolutionary community, they expected, they didn't even really predict, they expected some function, some regulation in the non-coding areas, but they did not expect or predict just how much function we would discover this 60 to 80% evidence for activity, about 60% evidence for transcription, 
um, all this amazing evidence for function in pseudogenes, ERV sequences, ALU sequences, all these other classes of retrotransposons to the point where they're essential, they're critical. Without them, we wouldn't exist. No, they didn't predict any of that. So you'll see some of these guys, you know, these militant critics, like there's one, Tony Reed out there. He says, these creationists, they don't know what they're talking about. We never said that there'd be no function. Yeah, you might've expected some in the non-coding uh, regions, okay? But not nearly as much as we've discovered, which is why us as creationists, we've made some really fascinating future novel predictions, okay? That only future observations, testable predictions, the gold standard of science on uh, DNA function. I've made a number of them in, in my book here comparing fixed ERV sequences and unfixed. So I do recommend it. Book should be linked in the description box. And um, claiming that the majority of this activity is just noise or spurious, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for the numerous reasons that, that we've discussed tonight. So I yield. All right, well, I guess, oh, you wanna to respond to that, Luca? No, 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 it's fine. Yeah. All right. Well, then, uh, hey, I want to thank everyone for showing up and don't forget to hit that thumbs up. And again, there's uh, Luca, your channel, I'm sure, is in the description. Yes. And uh, yeah, I guess that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Sam, <laughs> we got we got to have you for more future debates, brother, because no you did a fantastic yeah. job. Yeah. And Luca, it's thank basically you. modeling uh, here. So I'm literally out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out too. Luca, I appreciate you doing this so late since we're on opposite time. Yes, I made you sweet uh, uh, and that's a good thing. That was a very good debate, I think. It was very good. It was very, very good. I, I look forward to rewatching or wa watching technically for the first time. Sam, two and a half hours, our debates kind of go long. So thanks that's for giving fine. us your time. John Maddox, the after show man himself. He says, after show will start right after debate ends. So I did promise... Even though, man, I need like a an IV of coffee right here. <laughs> I'm going to take probably 20 minutes off, get some food um, and a coffee, and then I'll, I'll join to battle it out with, with some of the <coughs> evolutions, I'm I sure. I so okay. sleep, but I think that I lurk a little over LPP. Sorry, uh, Maddox, I will not join tonight. Sorry, I'm too destroyed to do that. Next completely time. understand. Luca, we just debated the most technical topic <laughs> in the creation evolution debate for, for almost three hours. So anyways, Luca, thank you. Sam, you're the man with the plan. Thank you so much, brother. And um, to the audience, thanks for joining. Standing for Truth is out.